11. Skiff had every intention of beginning his campaign of sabotage that very night, but when he tried to get near the district where the homes of the great and powerful were, he found the watch was unaccountably active. There were patrols on nearly every street, and they weren't sauntering along either. Something had them alerted, and after the third time of having to take cover to avoid being stopped and questioned, he gave it up as hopeless and headed back to his room with an ill grace. He got some slight revenge, though. As he turned a corner, a party of well-dressed and very drunk young men came bursting out of a tavern, with a very angry innkeeper shouting curses right on their heels. They practically ran him over, but in the scuffle and ensuing confusion, he lifted not one but three purses. Making impotent threats and shouting curses of his own at them, which had all the more force because of his personal frustrations, he turned on his heel and stalked off in an entirely different direction. Once out of sight, he ducked into a shadow, emptied the purses of their coins into his own pouch, and left the purses where he dropped them, tucking his pouch into the breast of his tunic. Then he strolled away in still another direction. After a block or two, there was nothing to connect him with the men he'd robbed. That was a mistake that many pickpockets made. They hung on to the purses they lifted. Granted, such objects were often valuable in themselves, certainly the three he'd taken had been, but they also gave the law a direct link between robber and robbed. As he walked back toward his room, he managed to get himself back under control. Taking the purses had helped. It was a very small strike against the rich and arrogant bastards, but a strike nevertheless. Just wait till they get to a bawdy house and they've got to pay he thought, with grim satisfaction. They better hope their friends is willing to part with the glim. Skiff had seen the wrath of plenty of madams and whoremasters whose customers had declined to pay, and they didn't take the situation lightly, nor did they accept promissory notes. They also employed very large men to help enforce the house rules and tariffs. When young men came into a place in a group, no one was allowed to leave until everyone's score had been paid. Those who still had purses would find them emptied before the night was over. The thought improved his humor, and that restored his appetite. Now much fatter in the pocket than he had been this afternoon, he decided to follow his nose and see where it led him. It took him to a cookshop that stood on the very border of his neighborhood, halfway between the semi-respectable district of entertainers, artists, musicians— not bards, of course— peddlers and decorative craftsmen and their prentices— and his own less respectable part of town. I've earned a meal, he decided. Taking care not to expose how much he had, he fished out one of the larger coins from his loot and dropped the pouch back into his tunic. Best to get rid of the most incriminating of the coins. He eased on in. It was full but not overcrowded, and he soon found space at the counter to put in his order. With a bowl of soup and a chunk of bread in one hand and a mug of tea in the other, he made his way back outside to the benches in the open air, where there were others eating, talking, or playing at dice or cards. Hot as it was, there were more folk eating under the sky than under the roof. As was his habit, he took an out-of-the-way spot and kept his head down and his ears open. He was very soon rewarded. The place was abuzz with the rumor that someone had broken into the home of the wealthy merchant, trainer Severic, and had stolen most of his priceless collection of miniature silver figurines. Severic had literally come home in time to see the thief vanishing out the window. Hence the watch. Every man had been called out, the neighborhood had been sealed off, and anyone who couldn't account for himself was being arrested and taken off to jail. It seemed that one of those arrested was an acquaintance of several of those sitting near Skiff. Hard luck for poor Corwin! one of the artists said with a snicker. He couldn't say where he'd been, of course. His friends nearly choked on their meals. I told him that woman was trouble, said another, whose dusty beard and hair bedecked with stone chips proclaimed him to be a sculptor. Two sittings, and she's got me backed into a corner trying to undo my breeches. He shuddered, and the rest laughed. Patron of arts, she calls herself, my eye. Halo, we tried to warn you, so don't say we didn't, called a fellow with a loot case slung over his back. Corwin knew it, so he's only got himself to blame. 
That's what happens when you let greed decide your commissions for you, put in another, whose mouth looked like a miser's purse, and whose eyes gloated at a fellow artist's misfortune. I'd rather live on bread in a garret and serve the temples than feast on march pain and capon and— Your paintings are so stiff they wouldn't please anyone but a priest, so don't go all over pious on us, Penchel, Cat called the first artist. That set off an argument on artistic merit and morality that Skiff had no interest in. He applied himself to his soup and left the bowl and mug on the table, while the insults were still coming thick and fast, and rapidly building to the point where it would be fists, and not words, that would be flying. At least now he knew why the watch was up, and he wouldn't dare try anything for days, even a fortnight. Why would anyone bother to steal the collection of silver miniatures, anyway? They were unique and irreplaceable, yes, but you'd never be able to sell them anywhere. They were too recognizable, and you wouldn't get a fraction of their value if you melted them down. Oh, a thief could hold them for ransom, Skiff supposed, but he'd certainly be found out and caught. The only way the theft made sense was if someone had gotten a specific commission to take them. It was an interesting thought. Whoever had made the commission would have to be from outside Haven. What was the use of having something like that if you couldn't show it off? Anyone in Haven would know the collection as soon as it was displayed. The client could even be outside Voldemar altogether. So the thief, too, might be from outside Voldemar. Huh, that'd be something, he thought, keeping an eye out for trouble as he made his way back home. Have to be some kind of master thief, I guess. Somebody with all kinds of tricks. Wonder if they's prentices for that kind of work. He'd never heard of a master thief, much less one that took on protégés, but maybe that sort of thing happened outside of Valdemar. Like, maybe there's a whole guild for thieves. Wouldn't that be something? He amused himself with this notion as he worked his way homeward. He never, even when he had no reason to believe that he was being followed, went back home directly. He always doubled back, ducked down odd side passages, even cut over fences and across back gardens, though in the summer that could be hazardous. In his neighborhood, no one had a back garden for pleasure. People used every bit of open ground to grow food in, and often kept chickens, pigeons, or a pig as well. And they assumed anyone coming over the fence was there to steal some of that precious food. Those that didn't have yards but did have balconies grew their vegetables in pots. Those that had nothing more than a window had window boxes. Even Skiff had a window box where he grew beans, trailing them around his window on a frame made of pieces of string. It was just common sense to augment what you could buy with what you could grow, but that did make it a bit more difficult to take the roundabout path until after the growing season was over. It wasn't as late as he'd thought. Lots of people were still up and about, making it doubly hazardous to go jumping in and out of yards. The front steps of buildings held impromptu gatherings of folks back from their jobs, eating late dinners and exchanging gossip. Most of the inns and cookshops had put benches out onto the street so people could eat outside where it was cooler. It was annoying. Skiff couldn't take his usual shortcuts. On the other hand, so many people out here meant more opportunities to confuse a possible follower. With that in mind, he stopped at another cookshop for more tea and a fruit pie. More crust than fruit, be it added, but he didn't usually indulge in anything so frivolous, and the treat improved his temper a bit more. Not so much that he forgot his anger, and the burning need to find out who Jass's boss was, but enough so that he was able to look as though nothing in his life had changed in the last few candle marks. He paid close attention to those who sat down to eat after him but saw no one that had also been at the previous cookshop. That was a good sign, and he quickly finished his tea and took the shortest way home. Jass wasn't back yet. Neither were his girls, which meant that Jass probably wasn't going to set his fire tonight. Skiff watered his beans and stripped for bed, lighting a stub of candle long enough to actually count his takings. His eyes nearly popped out of his head, and he counted it twice more before he believed it. Gold. Five gold crowns, more than he'd ever had in his life. He'd thought the tiny coins were copper bits, not gold, 
and he'd paid for his meal and his treat with large silver royals, so as to get rid of two of the most conspicuous coins in his loot. He'd never dreamed the men could have been carrying gold. Gold. Gold meant everything. With gold he suddenly had the means to concentrate entirely on finding Basie's murderer. He wouldn't have to work the entire summer. With gold he had the means to offer the kind of bribe that would loosen even the most reluctant of tongues. With gold he could follow up on the only real clue he had that wasn't connected to Jas. My lord Ortholin gave you high recommendations. Gold could actually buy Skiff away into Ortholin's household. You didn't just turn up at a great lord's doorstep and expect to be hired. You had to grease palms before you got a place where you could expect to have privileges, maybe even collect tips for exemplary service. Gold would purchase forged letters of commendation. Very rarely did anyone ever bother to check on those, especially if they were from a household inconveniently deep into the countryside. Those letters could get Skiff into, say, a position as an undergroom or a footman, a place where he'd be in contact with Lord Ortholin's guests, friends, and associates, where he could hear their voices. This one encounter changed everything. Maybe. It was one plan. There were others that would allow Skiff to hang on to the unexpected windfall. Jass wouldn't have been paid for the job entirely in advance. He'd have to collect the rest, and maybe Skiff could catch him at it. There were other places where Skiff could go to listen for that familiar, smooth, and pitiless voice. But the idea of insinuating himself into a noble household was the kind of plan that the craggy-faced sellsword would not be able to anticipate. If he knew anything at all about Skiff, he'd know that in the normal course of things, pigs would fly before someone like Skiff would get his hands on enough money to buy his way into Lord Ortholin's household. So Skiff carefully folded the five gold coins into a strip of linen, and packed them with his larger silver coins in the money belt that never left his waist. Then he blew out his candle, laid himself down, and began his nightly vigil of listening for Jass and Jass's business. Because, while gold might add to his options, if Basie had taught him anything at all, it was to never, ever abandon an option just because a new one opened up. But Jas didn't come back that night, nor the next day. Skiff fell asleep waiting to hear his footsteps on the stairs, and woke the next morning to the unaccustomed sound of silence next door. He waited all day, wondering, with increasing urgency, what was keeping the man from his own rooms. By nightfall, though, he knew why. At dusk a three-man team of the watch came for Jass's two girls, escorting them off rather than taking them off under guard, so it wasn't that they were arrested or under suspicion. Skiff was at his window when they showed up, and he knew before they ever came in view that something was wrong, for the whole street went quiet. People whisked themselves indoors or around corners, anything to get out of sight, and even the littles went silent and shrank back against their buildings stopping dead in the middle of their games and staring with round eyes at the three men in their blue and grey tunics and trues. The watch never came to this part of town unless there was something wrong, or someone was in a lot of trouble. Skiff ducked back out of sight as soon as they came into view, and when he heard the unmistakable sound of boots on the staircase, huddled against the wall next to the door so that no one peering underneath it would see his feet. What are they here for? For me? Did that fella turn me in? Did someone figure I lifted them purses? His mind raced, reckoning the odds of getting out via his emergency route through the window if they'd come for him, wondering if that cell sword had somehow put the watch onto him. And if he had, why? The footsteps stopped at his landing, and his heart was in his mouth, his blood pounding in his ears, every muscle tensed to spring for the window. But it wasn't his door they knocked on, and they knocked politely rather than pounding on it and demanding entrance. It was the girl's door, and when one of them timidly answered, an embarrassed voice asked if Trana and Desi Farain would be so kind as to come down to the watch station and answer a few questions. Skiff sagged down onto the floor, limp with relief. Whatever it was, it had nothing to do with him.' 
Now everyone knew that if the watch had anything on you, they didn't come and politely invite you to the watch station. When someone came with that particular request, it meant that you weren't in trouble, though someone else probably was. But if you were asked to come answer questions and you refused, well, you could pretty much reckon that from then on you were marked. And any time one of the watch saw you, they'd be keeping a hard eye on you, and they'd be likely to arrest and fine you for the least little thing. So after a nervous-sounding, unintelligible twitter of a conversation among all four of the sisters, Trana and Desi emerged, and five sets of footsteps went back down the staircase. Now he had to see what was up. When Skiff peeked out around the edge of the window, he saw that two of the watch were carrying lit lanterns, making it very clear that the two girls weren't being manhandled or even touched. And he could see that the two girls had taken long enough to lace their bodices tight, pull up their blouses, and drop their skirts, where they were usually curdled up to show their ankles. They were definitely putting on a show of respectability, which only made sense. That was the last he saw of them until just before dark. They returned alone, but gabble in the street marked their arrival, waking Skiff from a partial doze. Their sisters must have been watching from the window. They flew down the stairs to meet them, and half the neighborhood converged on them. Skiff took his time going downstairs, and by then the block was abuzz with the news that Jass had been found dead in a warehouse that afternoon, and the girls had been brought in to identify the body. There was no question but that he was the victim of foul play. He'd been neatly garroted, and his body hidden under an empty crate. He might not even have been found, except that someone needed the crate and came to fetch it, uncovering this body. Damn! Skiff couldn't quite believe it, couldn't quite take it in. Dead, but... By the time Skiff drifted to the edge of the crowd to absorb the news, Trana and Desi were sobbing hysterically, though how much of their sorrow was genuine was anyone's guess. Skiff had the shrewd notion that they were carrying on more for effect than out of real feeling. Their sisters, with just as much reason to be upset, looked more disgruntled at all of the attention that Trana and Desi were getting than anything else. Skiff huddled on the edge of the crowd, trying to overhear the details. There weren't many. He felt numb as if he'd been hit by something but hadn't yet felt the blow. Before a quarter candle mark had passed, the landlord appeared. He had tools and his dim-witted helper. He pushed past the crowd and ran up the stair. The sounds of hammering showed he was securing the door of Jass's room with a large padlock and hasp. An entire parade, led by the girls, followed him up there where he was standing, lantern in one hand, snapping the padlock closed. There may be inquiries, he said officiously when Desi objected, claiming that she'd left personal belongings in Jass's rooms. If the watch or the guard wants to inspect this place, I'll be in trouble if I let anyone take anything out. There wouldn't be any inquiries, and they all knew it. This was just the landlord's way of securing anything of value in there for himself. But if they knew what I knew, Skiff thought, as he closed and bolted his own door and put his back to it, he began to shake. Of all the people who could have wanted Jass dead, the only one with the money to get the job done quietly was the smooth-voiced man in the cemetery. What had the sellsword said? You're in deeper waters than you can swim. Or something like that. Deep waters. His knees went weak at how close he'd come last night to joining Jass under that crate. If he'd been caught down in that crypt... Skiff sat down on his bedroll and went cold all over. There was at least one person in Haven who knew that there was a connection between Skiff and Jass. And that craggy-faced sellsword just might come looking for him to find out exactly what and how much Skiff knew. I got to get out of here. Now. The thought galvanized him. It didn't take him long to bundle up his few belongings. More and more people were showing up to hear the news directly from the girls, and the more people there were moving around, the better his odds were of getting away without anyone noticing. He watched for his chance and when a group of their fellow light skirts descended on Desi and Trana and carried them off to the nearest tavern, the better to console them, he used the swirl of girls and the clatter they generated to his advantage. 
he slipped out behind them, stayed with them as far as the tavern, and then got moving in the opposite direction as quickly as he could. He didn't really have any ideas of where he was going, but at the moment that was all to the good. If he didn't know where he was going, no one else would be able to predict it either. The first place that anyone would look for him would be here, of course, but as Skiff trudged down the street, looking as small and harmless as he could manage, he put his mind to work at figuring out a place where someone on his track was not likely to look. What was the most out of character for him? Well, a temple, but I don't think I'm going to go looking to take vows, was his automatic thought. But then suddenly that didn't seem so outlandish a notion. Not taking vows, of course, but... Abruptly he altered his path. This was going to be a long walk, but he had the notion that in the end it was going to be worth it. Skiff made his eyes as big and scared as he could, and twisted his cap in his hands as he waited for someone to answer his knock at the temple gate. This temple was not the one where his cousin Beale was now a full priest. It wasn't even devoted to the same god, much less the same order. This was the temple and priory of Thanoth, the lord of the beasts, and this order took it on themselves to succor and care for injured, sick, and aged animals, from sparrows and pigeons to broken-down cart horses. It existed on charity, and as such was one of the poorest temples in Haven, and one thing it could always use was willing hands. Not everyone who worked here in the service of Thanoth was a priest or a novice. Plenty of ordinary people volunteered a few candle marks in a week for the blessing of God. Now what Skiff was hoping was that he could hide here for the sake of his labor. He hoped he had a convincing enough story. The door creaked open, and a long-nosed priest in a patched and dusty brown robe looked down at him, lamp in one hand. If ye be seeking charity, lad... This beant the place for you, he said wearily, but not unkindly. You should try the— Not charity, sir, Skiff said, putting on his best country accent. I be an orphan, sir. My uncle took me out to the forum, and I come here to sit here looking for horsework, but I got no character. I be good with horses, sir, and donkeys and belike, but no mon give me work without no character. The priest opened the door a little wider and frowned thoughtfully. A character, is it? Would you bide in yon loft, tend the beasts, and eat with the brethren for, say, six moon, and we give you a good letter? Skiff bobbed his head eagerly. You'd give me a good character, then? Some I can take for to work for stable? He's taken it, he thought with exultation. If you've earned it. The priest opened the gate wide, and Skiff stepped into the dusty courtyard. Come try your paces. Enter freely and walk in peace. Skiff felt his fear slide off him and vanish. No one would look for him here, and even if they did, no one would dare the wrath of a god to try and take him out. So what if his story wasn't quite the truth? I don't mind a bit of hard work. God can't take exception to that. The priest closed the gate behind them and led Skiff into and through the very simple temple, out into another courtyard, and across to a stabling area. As he followed in the priest's wake, Skiff was struck forcibly by two things. The first was the incredible poverty of this place. The second was an aura of peace that descended on him the moment he crossed the threshold. It was so powerful, it seemed to smother every bad feeling he had. Suddenly he wasn't afraid at all. Not of the sellsword, not of the bastard that had arranged for Basie's building to burn. Somehow he knew, he knew, that nothing bad could come inside these walls. Somehow he knew that as long as he kept the peace here, he would not ever have to fear the outside world coming in to get him. That should have frightened him, and it didn't. But he didn't have any leisure to contemplate it either once they entered the stable. Skiff had ample cause now to be grateful for the time he'd spent living in that loft above the donkey stable, where he'd gotten acquainted with beast-tending, because it was quite clear that the order was badly short-handed. One poor old man was still tottering around by the light of several lamps, feeding and watering the motley assortment of hoofstock in this stable. 
Skiff didn't even hesitate for a moment. This, if ever, was the moment to prove his concocted story, and a real stable boy wouldn't have hesitated either. He dropped his bedroll and belongings just inside the stable door and went straight for the buckets, reckoning that water was going to be harder for the old fellow to carry than grain or hay. And after all, he'd had more than his share of water carrying when he'd been living with Basie. The old man cast him a look of such gratitude that Skiff almost felt ashamed of the ruse he was running on these people. Except that it wasn't exactly a ruse. He was going to do the work. He just wasn't planning on sticking around for the next six moons. And, of course, he was going to be doing some other things on the side that they would never know about. As he watered each animal in its stall, he took a cursory look at them. For the most part, the only thing wrong with them was that they were old. Not a bad thing, since it meant that none of them possessed enough energy or initiative to try more than a half-hearted weary nip at him, much less a kick. Poor old things, he thought, venturing to pat one ancient donkey who nuzzled him with something like tentative affection as he filled its watering trough. And these were the lucky ones, beasts whose owners felt they deserved an honorable retirement after years of endless labor. The unlucky ones became stew and meat pies in the cookshops and taverns that served Haven's poor. Bless you, my son, said the old priest gratefully as they passed one another. We be perilous short-handed for the hoofstock. Just in stable? Skiff asked, carefully keeping to his country accent. The priest nodded, patting a dusty rump as he moved to fill another manger. With the wee beasts, the hurt ones, there's healer trainees that come to help, and there's folks that don't mind turning a hand with cleaning and feeding. But this... Skiff laughed softly. I grant her this be work, eh? The old priest laughed himself. Struth, they say there's a pair of novices coming up, come winter, but until then... Till then, I'll be taking the heavy work, Granther. Skiff heard himself promise. When the last of the beasts were watered and fed, the old man showed him his place in the loft and left him with a lantern, trudging back to the chapter house. Like his last bed above a stable, this was in a gable end with a window supplied with storm shutters, piled high with hay, that looked out over the courtyard. He spread out his bedroll, stowed his few possessions in the rafters, blew out the lantern, and lay down to watch the moon rise over the roofs of Haven. This has been about the strangest day of my life, he thought, hands tucked behind his head. What was just about the strangest part of it was that he had literally gone from a state of fearing for his very life to this. There was such an aura of peace and serenity within these walls. What might have seemed foolish trust under any other circumstances, after all, he was just some stranger who'd shown up on their doorstep and at night yet, was perfectly understandable now that Skiff could see the poverty of the place himself. There literally was nothing to steal. If he didn't do the work he'd promised, he wouldn't be fed, and he'd be turned out. There was no reason for the brethren not to trust him. He should have been feeling very smug and very clever. He'd found the perfect hiding place, and it was well within striking distance of the manners of the high and mighty. Instead, all he could think was that, as work-worn and weary as both the priests had seemed, there had also been something about them that made his cleverness seem not quite as clever as he'd thought it was, as if they had seen through his ruse and didn't care, and that didn't make any sense at all. I've got to think this through, he told himself, fighting the soporific scent of cured hay the drowsy breathing of the animals in their stalls beneath him, and the physical and emotional exhaustion of the last day and night. It was a battle he was doomed to lose from the start. Before the moon rose more than a hand's breadth above the houses, he was as fast asleep as the animals below. Skiff started awake, both hands clutching hay, as a mellow bell rang out directly above his head. For a moment he was utterly confused. He couldn't remember where he was, much less why he'd been awakened by a bell in the pitch dark. Then it all came back, just as someone came across the courtyard bearing a lit lantern. Hellfires, he thought, a little crossly, yet a little amused. 
I should have known this lot would be up before dawn. Maybe I ain't been so smart after all. Hey, la, laddie, called the aged voice of last night from below. Be you awake? Oh, aye, Granther, Skiff replied, stifling a groan. I be uh, coming down. He brought last night's lantern down with him, and he and the old man made the morning rounds of the stable in an oddly companionable silence. The old man didn't ask his name, and didn't seem to care that Skiff didn't offer it. What he did do was give Skiff the name and history of every old horse, donkey, mule, and goat in the stable, treating each of them like the old friend it probably was. When they finished feeding and watering, the old man led Skiff into the chapter house, straight to a room where others of the order had stripped to the waist and were washing up. Not wanting to sit down to breakfast smelling of horse and goat, Skiff was perfectly willing to follow their example. From there they all went to breakfast, which was also eaten in silence. Oat porridge, bread, butter, and milk. Skiff was not the only person who wasn't wearing the robes of the order, but the other two secular helpers were almost as old as the priest who tended the stable. There were younger priests, but they all had some sort of deformity or injury that hadn't healed right. One and all, either through age or defect, they seemed to be outcasts, people for whom there was no comfortable niche in a family, nor a place in the society of other humans. Maybe that was why they came here and devoted themselves to animals. Yet they all seemed remarkably content, even happy. After breakfast it was back to the stable, where Skiff mucked out the stalls while the old priest groomed his charges. Even the goats were brushed until their coats shone, as much as the coat of an aged goat could. Then it was time for the noon meal, with more washing up first. Then the old man had him take the couple of horses that were still able to do a little work out to help carry a few loads about the compound. He and his charges hauled firewood to the kitchen, feed grains to bird coops, rubbish out to be sorted, muck to bins where muck collectors would come to buy it. The place was larger than he'd thought. There were mews for aging or permanently injured hawks and falcons, a loft for similarly injured doves and pigeons, kennels for dogs, a cattery, a chicken yard that supplied the order with eggs, a small dairy herd of goats, and a place for injured wildlife. It was here that Skiff caught sight of a couple of youngsters not much older than he, wearing robes of a pale green, and he realized, with a start, that these must be the healer trainees he'd heard about. It was, quite literally, the first time he had ever seen a healer of any rank or station, and he couldn't help but gawp at them like the country bumpkin he was pretending to be. Then it was time for the evening meal. All meals were very plain, with the noon and evening meal consisting of bread, eggs, cheese, and vegetables, with the addition of soup at the noon meal and fruit at the dinner meal. Then came the same feeding and watering chores he'd had last night, and with a start he realized that the entire day had flowed past him like a tranquil stream, and he hadn't given a single thought to anything outside the four walls of the order, and realized with an even greater start that he didn't care. Or at least, he hadn't up until that time. And he felt a very different sort of fear then. The place was changing him, and unless he started to fight it, there was a good chance that it wouldn't be long until no one recognized him, and possibly even more frightening. He had to wonder how long it would be before he wouldn't even recognize himself. Twelve Skiff decided that no matter how tired he was, he was not going to put off the start of his vendetta any longer, and he wasn't going to let the deep peace of this place wash away his anger either. When he finished watering the animals for the night, and the old priest tottered back to the chapter house, he blew out his lantern, but perched himself in the loft window to keep an eye on the rest of the priory. One by one, lights winked out across the courtyard. Skiff set his jaw as a drowsy peace settled over the scene and hovered heavily all around him. He knew what it was now. This was the peace of the god, and it kept everyone who set foot here happy and contented. Granted, that wasn't bad for those who lived here. There were no fights among the animals, and there was a cord among those who cared for them. But this place was a trap for Skiff. 
It would be all too easy to be lulled by it until he forgot the need for revenge, forgot what he was. He didn't want to forget what he was, and he didn't want to become what this place wanted him to be. When the last light winked out, he waited a little longer, marking the time by how far above the horizon a single bright star rose. And when he figured that everyone would surely be asleep, he moved. For someone like Skiff, there was no challenge in getting over the walls silently as any shadow. He knew where to go first, too. If he could not strike at his foe directly, he could at least strike at someone who was near to his real target. Serve the rich bastard right for trusting someone who would murder innocent people just because they were in his way. Besides, all those rich bastards were alike. Even if this one hadn't actually murdered poor folks, he probably wouldn't care that his friend had. And my lord Rovenar was oh so conveniently away on his family estate in the country. Lord Rovenar's roof was fashionably paved in slate. It was with great glee that Skiff proceeded to riddle the entire roof with cracks and gaps. The next time it rained, the roof would leak like a sieve. There was also a cistern up here, a modern convenience that permitted my lord and his family to enjoy the benefits of running water throughout the mansion. Skiff hastened the ruin of the upper reaches of the building by piercing the pipes leading downward, creating a slow leak that would empty the cistern directly into the attics, and from there into the rest of the house. Besides rainwater, the cistern could be filled by pumping water up from the mansion's own well. But by the time Skiff was finished, any water pumped up would only drain into the attics with the rest of it. So much for vandalism on the exterior— Skiff worked his way over to an attic window which wasn't locked. After all, the servants never expected anyone to be up on the roof, and certainly wouldn't expect that anyone who did get up on the roof would dangle himself over the edge, push open the shutters with his feet, and let himself inside. His night had only just begun. When he let himself out again, this time from a cellar window, his pockets were full of small, valuable objects, and the trail of ruin had continued, though most of it would take days and weeks before it was discovered. Skiff had left food in beds to attract insects and mice, and had ensured that those pests would invade by laying further trails of diluted honey and crumbs all over the house around the baseboards, where it was unlikely that the maids, slacking work in the master's absence, would notice. He left windows cracked open, left shutters ajar. Insects would soon be in the rooms, and starlings and pigeons colonizing the attic. The skeleton staff that had been left here would not discover any of this, for his depredations took place in rooms that had been closed up, the furnishings swathed in sheets. My lord would return to a house in shambles, and it would take a great deal of money and effort to make it livable again. He ghosted his way across the kitchen garden and over the wall, using a trellis as a ladder. But once on the other side he laid a trail of a different sort, all of those valuable trinkets he'd filled his pockets with. He scattered them in his wake, and trusted to greed to see to it that they never found their way back to their true owner again. He took nothing for himself, if for no other reason than that it would prevent anyone from connecting him with the trail of damage. He slipped easily back over the temple walls and got into his bed in the loft in plenty of time for a nap. When the bell sounded and woke him, if he wasn't fully rested, at least he didn't look so exhausted that anyone commented on it. Although the meals he'd shared with the brethren yesterday had been shared in silence, evidently there was no actual rule of silence, for the noon meal brought a flurry of gossip from the outside world. The master thief struck again last night said one of the younger priests to the rest of the table. The streets are full of talk. And it must be from somewhere outside Haven, so they say, added another with a shake of his head. Singularly careless he was. He left a trail of dropped objects behind him, I heard. I can vouch that there are so many people scouring the alleys for bits of treasure that some of the highborn have asked the guard to drive them back to the slums. I hope, said the prior with great dignity, that the guard declined. The alleys are public thoroughfares. They do not belong to the highborn. 
Neither is the god answerable to those with noble titles who are discomfited by the poor outside their walls. There cannot be any justification for such a request. Since there are still treasure hunters looking in every nook and cranny, I suspect they did decline, the young priest said cheerfully. He seemed highly amused, and Skiff wondered why. The prior shook his head sadly. I know that you have little sympathy when rich men are despoiled of their goods, Brother Halcom. If the gods choose the hand of a thief to chastise those who are themselves thieves, I find it ironic, but appropriate, sir. Brother Halcom replied evenly. This master thief has so far robbed two men who have greatly oppressed others. You know this to be true. Nevertheless, the thief himself commits a moral error and incurs harm to his soul with his actions, the prior chided him gently. You should spend less time gloating over the misfortune of the mighty and more in praying that this miscreant realizes his errors and repents. Brother Halcom made a wry face, but the prior didn't see it. Skiff did, however, and he noted when the young priest rose from the table that his leg ended in a dreadful club foot. The priest had spoken in the accents of someone who was highly educated, and Skiff had to wonder how much Brother Halcom knew personally about the two who had officially been robbed, and whether he knew anything about the one that Skiff had despoiled. For one moment he wondered if the young man had really meant what he said. He had sounded sympathetic. Fah! You'll have no time for the likes of me, no doubt, he thought, hardening his heart. Well, look who's stuck mucking out the stalls, and who's playing with the broke-winged birds. Push comes to shove, money and rank stands together against the rest of us, what always does the dirty work any road. He finished his meal and went back out to clean kennels. With the master thief out last night, and everybody and his dog hunting for the goodies that Skiff had let fall, the last thing Skiff was going to do was to go out again tonight. No, things would have to cool down a bit before he ran the rooftops again. It gave him a great deal of pleasure, though, to lie back in the sweet-smelling hay and contemplate last night's work. The only thing that spoiled his pleasure was the thought that this unknown master thief was going to get all of the credit for his work. On the other hand, it would probably anger the master thief to be saddled with the eventual blame for all of the vandalizing Skiff had done. And at the moment, no one would be looking for a mere boy. They'd be trying to catch a man. This master thief was proving rather useful to Skiff's campaign. I suppose I ought to be grateful to him, Skiff thought. But he didn't feel grateful. In fact, after a while, he realized that he wasn't as satisfied with last night's work as he thought he should be. It just wasn't enough, somehow. He was thrashing around at random, blindly trying to hit the one he truly wanted to hurt, and hoping that somehow in the chaos he'd connect with a blow. And even then, how did putting holes in someone's roof measure up to burning down a building and committing cold-blooded murder in the process? It didn't and that was that. I want him, Skiff thought angrily. I want the bastard what ordered it. Nothing more, but nothing less, and right now he was settling for less. Still, that brother Halcom had a point, too. He'd seemed to think that the two high-born nobles that had been robbed had pretty much deserved it, and probably Lord Rovenar had done a dirty deed or two in his life, and Skiff had been nothing more than the instrument of payback. That wasn't a bad thought. Brother Halcom knew the highborn. Brother Halcom might know enough to give Skiff a clue or two to the identity of the one highborn that Skiff really wanted. So maybe Skiff ought to see if he could get Brother Halcom to talk. Finding someone to hurt that he knew deserved it might feel better than this random lashing out. And maybe, just maybe, Brother Halcom would know who the smooth-voiced highborn was. Skiff watched Brother Halcom from a distance for a full week before making a tentative approach. He learned two things in that time. Brother Halcom was from a highborn family, and he was here because he wanted to be. Not that his family hadn't tried to get their deformed offspring out of sight, but they'd chosen a much more comfortable and secluded temple for him to enter. 
Halcombe had stood up to them and threatened to make a scene if he wasn't allowed his choice. That gave Skiff a bit more respect for the man, and Halcombe's value rose again in his eyes when he realized that Halcombe didn't shirk the dirty work after all. He just did the small things rather than the large. He did his share of cleaning, usually cleaning up after the healer trainees when they'd finished treating a sick or injured animal. When there was a beast that needed to be tended all night, it was Halcombe, like as not, who stood the vigil. And when an animal was dying, it was Halcombe who stayed with it, comforting it as best he could. Finally, Skiff found a moment to make a cautious overture to the young priest. Halcombe had hobbled out to the stable to assist, not a healer trainee, but a farrier who often donated his time and experience, and Skiff was also called on to help. The injury was a split and overgrown hoof on a lamed cart horse. Halcombe was asked to hold the horse's head, since he, more than anyone else, was able to keep animals calm during treatment. And Skiff was there to hold the hoof while the farrier trimmed it and fastened a special shoe to help the hoof heal. When the farrier had left and Skiff had taken the horse back to its stall, Halcombe seemed disinclined to leave. You've been doing good work here, friend, Halcombe said, looking around at the rest of the stable without getting up from the hay bale he was sitting on. I'm glad you came here. Poor old brother Absol just isn't up to the heavy work any more. Thank you, sir, Skiff said, keeping to his persona of country bumpkin and bobbing his head subserviently. Would you might to be a-giving of me a character, too? That be what I'm here for. I could probably do better than that, if what you want is stable work, Halcombe admitted, but with a raised eyebrow. I've no doubt I could recommend you to several people for that. Is that what you want? Oh, I, sir, Skiff replied, feigning eagerness. Balderdash, Halcombe countered, startling Skiff. You're better than that. You don't really want to be a lowly stable hand for the rest of your life, do you? His eyes gleamed with speculation. You're much too intelligent for that. What are you aiming at? Master of horse? Chief coachman? Ah, uh, Skiff stammered before he got his wits together. But I've no training, sir. Dunno much but birth and beasts and never learnt to drive. Halcombe waved that aside as of no consequence. Nor have most boys your age when they go into service. As small as you are, though. Learning to handle the reins could be problematic. I'm not sure you could control a team. I be stronger nor I look, sir, Skiff said, stung. Halcombe laughed, but it didn't have that sly, mean sound to it that Skiff had half expected. Oh, you'd make a fine, smart little footman sitting up beside your master on a fashionable chariot. But I'll tell you the truth, lad. There is not a single high-born, or man of means and fashion, that I'd feel comfortable sending you to in that capacity. The good men have all the loyal footmen they need, and the others... He shook his head. I won't send you to a bad master. You might tell me who they be, sir? Skiff offered tentatively. If I didn't know it, I might take a place I was offered. So you can avoid them? Halcombe nodded thoughtfully. That's no bad idea. Clever of you to think of it. And he proceeded with forthright candor to outline the character of every man he thought Skiff ought not to take service with. He was so candid that Skiff was, frankly, shocked. Not at the litany of faults and even vices. His upbringing in the worst part of Haven had exposed him to far worse than Halcombe revealed. No, it was that Halcombe was not at all reticent about unrolling the listing of faults of his own kind. As Halcombe spoke, Skiff found himself at war within himself. He wanted to trust Halcombe, and he had sworn never to trust anyone. More than that, he wanted to like Halcombe. It seemed to him that Halcombe could easily become a friend. And he did not want any more friends. That leaves plenty of good masters to take service with, mind, Halcombe pointed out when he was finished, and smiled. And for all my differences with my own family, I can quite cheerfully recommend you to take service with them. They're quite good to those who serve them well. Huh, it's only their own flesh and blood that they muck about with, eh? Skiff thought. Guess you and me have more in common than I thought. 
It was your own uncle that turned you out, wasn't it? Halcombe said suddenly, startling Skiff again with his knowledge of Skiff's background. Halcombe laughed at his expression wryly. I suppose we have more in common than either of us would have suspected. Twas your uncle that sent you off? Skiff ventured. Halcombe nodded and his face shadowed. My existence was an embarrassment, he admitted sourly. My uncle feared that my presence in his household would cast a shadow over some pending betrothal arrangements he was negotiating. My father, his younger brother, has no backbone to speak of, and agreed that I ought to be persuaded to a vacation. What? Skiff asked indignantly. They figure you'd scare the bride? My uncle suggested that the prospective bride's father might rethink his offer if he thought that deformity ran in my family. Halcombe said bluntly, his mouth twisting in a frown. Since my parents are dependent on his generosity for a place, I suppose I can't blame them. He sighed deeply, and his expression lightened. In the end, really, I'm rather glad it happened. I had very little to do with myself. I'm really not much of a scholar, and, well, needless to say, I'm not cut out for court life either. I've always loved animals and neither they nor my fellow brothers care about this wretched leg of mine. And I did manage to shame my uncle into making a generous donation when he dumped me here. Skiff nodded his head, concealing as best he could that he was racked by an internal struggle. He really truly wanted to be Halcombe's friend, and he really truly did not want to make another friend that he knew he would only lose. I ain't staying here forever he told himself sternly. It wouldn't be so nice if he knew what I was. Hellfires, he'd turn me straight over to the watch if he knew what I was. But he could almost hear the place whispering to him. It wanted him to stay. He could have a friend again. No one here would care what he had been, only what he was now, and what he might become. Oh, he'd never be rich, but he'd never starve either. He steeled himself against the seductive whispers of peace. Him? Bide in a place like this? Not when he had a debt to repay. Not when there was someone out there that was so ruthless he would do anything to anyone who stood in his way. Besides, this place would put him to sleep in a season. He'd turn into a sheep inside of a year. And if there was one thing that Skiff had no desire to become, it was a sheep. Well, I imagine you've heard more than enough to send you to sleep about me, Halcombe said, hauling himself to his feet again. And I still have my charges to attend to. I won't keep you from your own duties any more, lad. But do remember what I've told you, and that if you want a second letter of commendation to go with the priors when you leave, I will be happy to write one for you. That last, said as Halcombe turned to go, had the sound of a formal dismissal. Superior to inferior. There, you see, he taunted that seductive whisper. I ain't a friend to the likes of a highborn, even if his people did cast him off. A mouse might as well ask a hawk to be his friend. Hawk might even say yes, till he got hungry. Another week passed, and the city was struck with a heat wave that was so oppressive, people and animals actually began dying. The queen closed the court and sent everyone but her privy council out of the city. But there was nowhere for the poor and the working classes to go, and even if there had been, how could ordinary people just pack up and leave? How would they make a living, pay their bills, feed their children? Life in Haven went on as best it could. As many folk as could changed their hours, rising before dawn, working until the heat grew intolerable enduring as best they could until late afternoon, then taking up their tasks again in the evening. The prior knew a clever trick or two, though, and the brethren began going through the poorer neighborhoods, teaching people what the prior had taught them. For although it was the lord of the beasts that the brethren served, nevertheless man was brother to the beasts. Water-soaked pads of straw in windows somehow cooled the air that blew through them, so long as there was a breeze. And if there wasn't, the cheapest, more porous terracotta jars filled with water and placed about a room also helped to cool the air as the water evaporated from them. Stretching a piece of heavy paper over a frame, 
Then, fastening that frame by one side to the ceiling and attaching a cord to a corner, created a huge fan that would create a breeze when the winds themselves didn't oblige. There were always children to pull the cord, and they didn't mind doing so when the breeze cooled them as well. And the same cheap terracotta that was used for those jars could be made into tiles to be soaked with water and laid on the floor, also cooling a room or the overheated person who lay down on them. It helped. All of it helped. People were encouraged to sleep on flat rooftops or in their gardens or even in parks by night, and in cellars by day. But there was always someone greedy enough to want to make a profit from the misfortune of others. Suddenly the dank and dark basement rooms that had been the cheapest to rent became the most expensive. Not all landlords raised the rents on their cellars, but many did, and if it hadn't been so stiflingly hot, there might have been altercations over it. But it was just too hot. No one could seem to get the energy even to protest. Skiff was terribly frustrated. It was nearly impossible to move around the city by night without being seen. And yet, with all of the wealthy and highborn gone, it should have been child's play to continue his vendetta. Why, the huge manors and mansions were so deserted that the master thief must have been looting them with impunity knowing that no one would discover his depredations until the heat wave broke and people returned to Haven. Hellfires, Skiff thought grumblingly as he returned from an errand to the market, through streets that the noon heat had left deserted. It'd be easier to make a rum by day than by— Then it hit him. Of course. Why not make his raids by day? He was supposed to be resting like everyone and everything during the heat of the day. No one would miss him at the priory, and there would be no one around to see him in the deserted mansions, not with the skeleton staffs spending their time in the cool of the wine cellars, most of them asleep if they had any sense. That's probably what the master thief's doing, he thought with glee. He was delighted to have thought of it, and enjoyed a moment of mental preening over his own cleverness. Well, he certainly would not be wearing his black sneak suit for these jobs. His best bet was to look perfectly ordinary. The fact was he probably wouldn't even need to get in via the rooftops. The doors and windows would all be unlocked. After all, who would ever expect a thief to walk in the kitchen door in broad daylight? He brought the bag of flour and the basket of other sundries he'd been sent for to the kitchen and left it on the table. The brother who acted as cook had changed the routine because of the heat. A great many things were being served cold boiled eggs, cheese, vegetables, and so forth. Actual cooking was done at night and in ovens and on brick stoves erected in the kitchen courtyard. The biggest meal of the day was now breakfast. The noon meal was no longer a meal, but consisted of whatever anyone was able to eat, given the heat which killed appetites, picked up as one got hungry in the kitchen. Big bowls of cleaned sliced vegetables submerged in water lined the counters. Loaves of bread resided under cheesecloth, boiled eggs in a smaller bowl beside them. There was butter and cheese in the cold larder if anyone wanted it, which hardly anyone did. Skiff helped himself to carrot strips and celery and a piece of bread. He ate the bread plain, because he couldn't bear the thought of butter either. The place might just as well have been deserted. The only sign that there had been anyone in the kitchen was the lumps of bread dough left to rise under cloths along their shelf. Skiff wasn't all that hungry either, but he ate and drank deeply of the cooled water from yet another terracotta jar. Then he went straight back out, as if he had been sent on a second errand, not that there was anyone about to notice. He sauntered along the streets, watching the heat haze hovering above the pavement, keeping to the shade, and noting that there still were a few folk out. They paid no attention to him, and he gave them no more than a cursory glance. There was not so much as a hint of the watch. No surprise there. What was there for them to do? There would be no fights, and it was too hot for petty theft, even if there was anything open at noon to steal from. Where to hit? That was the question. He had no clear target in mind and he wasn't as familiar with who belonged to which great mansion as he would have liked. Finally he decided, for lack of any other ideas, to bestow his attentions on one Tomlin Vell Carrican, 
a charming fellow who had amassed a great deal of wealth by squeezing his poor tenants and giving them as little in the way of decent housing as he could get away with. He was one of the landlords who had responded to the current heat wave by evicting tenants from the newly desirable basement rooms and charging a premium rate for them, sending the evicted to live in the attics. It seemed as good a reason as any to wreak as much havoc as humanly possible on him. If he hadn't burned his own buildings to avoid having to make repairs, it was only because he had balked at actually destroying anything he owned. So Skiff's steps took him in the direction of the great homes of those who aspired to be counted among the highborn, not those who had actually gotten to that position. There was still no sign of watch, guards, or anyone else. He strolled along the street, not the alley, and nothing met his interested gaze but shuttered and curtained windows behind the gates. These houses, while imposing, did not boast the grounds and gardens of those of the true nobility. Land was at a premium within the second set of city walls. There were three sets of walls, in fact, four if you counted the ones surrounding the palace and the three collegia. Each time that the city of Haven had outgrown its walls, a new set had been built. When that happened, land within the previous walls became highly desirable. Now, between the first set and the palace walls, only the highborn, those with old titles, had their mansions, and indeed manors, which had enormous gardens and landscaped grounds. Between the second and first, those who had newer titles, most less than a generation old, and the wealthy but not ennobled kept their state. Lesser dwellings had been bought up and raised to make way for these newer mansions. There were gardens, but they were a fraction of the size of those of the great lords of state. But there were parks here, places where one could ride or stroll and be observed. Between the third walls and the second lived most of the rest of the city, although the populace had already begun to spill outside the walls, and many of those whose wealth was very recent had taken to building mansions that aped those of the great lords of state, but outside the walls altogether, where land was cheaper. Eventually, Skiff supposed, another set of walls would be built and then it would be his neighborhood that would be raised to make way for the mansions of the wealthy. Skiff passed one of the parks, and decided to take a rest near a lily-covered pond. It was deserted, the air shimmering with heat above the scorched lawns between the trees. His target was on the other side of this park, and it occurred to him that it wouldn't be a bad idea to observe it from the comfort of the park while he cooled off a little. Even though he had sauntered along in slothful fashion, he was still sweating. He pulled his linen shirt away from his body and threw himself down in the shade of a huge oak tree beside the pond. The ground was marginally cooler than the air or his body, but there were no signs that anyone was actually sleeping here at night, despite the suggestions of the authorities. Skiff wasn't surprised. The watch probably was discouraging the poor from moving into the parks in this section of the city, even though there were more of them here than between the second and third walls. The watch was answerable directly to the wealthy folk living here, as opposed to the guard which was answerable to the crown. Even though they were not here to witness the poor camping out of a night in their park, not one of the moneyed lot who lived around here even wanted to consider the prospect. The local watch probably had orders to clear out campers as fast as they arrived. Skiff turned his head to peer between bushes nearby, thinking he heard something. Some zealous watchman, perhaps? If so, he'd better be prepared with a story about why he was here. He had heard something, but it wasn't a member of the watch. There was a horse wandering loose around the park, taking nibbles out of the grass, sampling the flowers. It was a handsome creature, white as snow, and still wore a saddle and bridle. Reins dangled from the bridle. No, it was a bitless hackamore, he saw. No one would leave reins dangling like that. Your horse could all too easily catch a leg in them, stumble, fall, and perhaps break a leg. But if you didn't tie the reins off properly when you left a horse waiting, the horse could jerk them loose and wander off, leaving them dangling just like these were. For one wild moment, Skiff thought, Is that a companion? But no. If it had been a companion, there would certainly be a herald somewhere about. 
and besides, the saddle and hackamore were old, very plain, well-worn. Everyone knew that companions went about in elaborate blue and silver tack, with silver bridle bells and embroidered barding. There were plenty of white horses around that weren't companions. It was something of an affectation in some fashionable sets to ride white horses, or have a carriage drawn by matched teams of them. No, some idiot hadn't tied his horse properly. Or, far more likely, given the worn state of the tack, some groom had taken his master's mare out for some exercise, and had combined the chore with some errand of his own. He hadn't tied the horse up, and she'd pulled her reins loose and wandered away. That groom would be in a lot of trouble. But since there wasn't anyone combing the park looking for this beast, evidently he hadn't missed her yet. Well, his loss was Skiff's gain. Working at the Priory had given him a lot more familiarity with horses than he'd had before. He'd even learned to ride, and faced with this opportunity for profit on four legs, he grinned broadly. You're mine, he told the grazing mare. Let's see, horse fare's running over on the east side, or I can take her out of the walls altogether and sell her, or I can take her to Priory and collect the reward when she shows up missing. The last option wasn't a bad notion, though the first was the real money-maker. The horse moved around the bushes and out of his sight. Knowing that she was probably some high-strung, well-bred beast, he got up slowly and began to stalk her. If he, a stranger, was going to catch her rather than spooking her, he'd have to catch her by surprise. When she actually moved between two thick, untrimmed hedges, he could hardly believe his good luck. She couldn't have gotten into a better situation for him to corner her. Knowing that a horse is averse to backing up, he ran around to the front of the hedges and struck. Making a dash out of cover, he grabbed for the reins and the saddle in the same movement, hauling himself into the saddle before she had time to do more than snort. And somehow, before he realized it, he was in the saddle and in control. For just about a heartbeat. Because in the next moment the horse tossed her head, jerking the reins out of his hand, and set off at a gallop, and all he could do was cling desperately to the pommel of the saddle. Thirteen. All Skiff could do was hold on, with every aching finger, with knees and thighs, wrists and ankles. If he could have held on with his teeth, he would have. If he could have tied his hair to the saddle, he would have. He'd lost the stirrups almost at once, shortly after he lost the reins. That didn't give him a lot of options, either cling on like a burr or try to jump off. But the mare was going so fast he knew if he'd jumped he'd get hurt. Badly, badly hurt. And that was if he was lucky. He'd seen someone who'd been thrown from a galloping horse once. The poor fool had his back broken. Healers could fix that, he'd been told, if the healer got to you quickly enough, if you were important enough to see a healer. He'd seen countless people thrown from runaway wagons, and they always ended up with broken arms and legs. That was bad enough. She was at the gallop, head down, charging along as if she'd gone mad, pounding down the paved streets, the occasional bystander gawking at them as they tore past. No one tried to stop the runaway horse, and all that Skiff could do was hang on tight and trust to the fact that as hot as it was, she'd tire soon. She'd have to tire soon. She was only a horse, just a fancy horse. She couldn't run forever. He closed his eyes and crouched over the saddle, gripping her with his thighs and holding on to the pommel of the saddle with all his might. Her mane whipped at his face. It was like being beaten with a fly whisk, and he gasped with every driving blow of her hooves that drove the pommel into his gut. She'd be slowing any moment now. Any moment now. Oh, please. He cracked his eye open and closed it again. She wasn't slowing. If anything, she was running faster. People, shops, pavement blurred past so fast he was getting sick. His eyes watered as some of her mane lashed across them. How was that possible? Hellfires. I stole a racehorse. Of all the stupid idiot things to have done. He opened his eyes again, just in time to see a wagon pull across the street in front of them and stop. She's got to stop now. She raised her head a little, 
and her ears cocked forward. She's not gonna stop. The driver stared at them, then abruptly dove off the seat. The mare increased her pace. He felt her muscles bunch up under his legs. She's gonna jump it. She shoved off, her forequarters rising. He clawed desperately at the saddle as his weight shifted backward. He screamed in terror, knowing he was going to fall. Then the wagon bed was underneath him. She landed. He was flung forward, his nose and right eye slamming into her neck. He saw stars and his head exploded with pain. Somehow, someway, he managed to hang on. The thought of falling off terrified him more than staying on. She didn't even break stride as she continued her run and careened around a corner. Sweat flew off her, and she didn't even seem to notice. She was off around another corner, pounding through a half-empty market, then toward the last of the city walls. No. But she wasn't listening to what he wanted. She plunged into the tunnel beneath the walls, and for a moment her hooves echoed in the darkness, sounding like an entire herd of horses was in here with him. There were guards on the wall. Surely, surely they would stop her. Then she was out with no sign of a guardsman. Skiff dared another glance out of the eye that wasn't swelling. Through his tears all he could see was a road stretching ahead of them, the road leading away from Haven. He couldn't even tell which road. All he knew for certain was that they were flying down a roadway, and people were scattering out of their way, shouting curses after them. The mare wove her way in and out of the traffic with the agility of a dancer. He actually felt the touch on his ankle as they brushed by other riders, the whip-like cut of a horse's tail as it shied out of the way. And somehow, she was getting faster. He knew if he tried to throw himself off now, he'd die. It was just that simple. No one, not even an experienced rider, could slip off a horse at speeds like this and live. He wouldn't just break bones. He'd break his neck or his skull and die instantly. All he could do was what he had been doing. Hang on, try not to get thrown, and hope that when she stopped he'd be able to get off of her without her killing him. He gritted his teeth together, hissing with the pain of his eye and nose, so full of fear there was no room in his head for anything else. The sounds of shouting and cursing were gone. He dared another glance. There were no more buildings beside the road now, nothing but fields with tiny farmhouses off in the distance. The road still had plenty of traffic, though, and the mare wove her way in and out of it with a nonchalance that made the hair on the back of his head stand up. People weren't shouting and cursing at them because they were too busy trying to get out of the way. He had never been so terrified in his entire life. He squeezed his eyes shut again, and for the first time in his life began to pray. Skiff was limp with exhaustion, dripping with sweat, and aching so much that he wasn't sure he even cared what happened to him now. He also had no idea where he was. The mare had gotten off the main road and was still running, though not at the headlong pace she'd held through the city. This was a normal gallop, if anything this mare did was normal. This was a country road, rutted dirt with trees on both sides that met over his head, forming a tunnel of green. If his eye and nose hadn't hurt so much, and if he hadn't been so terrified, he'd never been anywhere like this before in his life. He had no idea how far they were from Haven. A long way, that was about all he could tell. So, in addition to the rest of it, he was hopelessly lost, and completely outside familiar territory. And the sun was setting. He wanted to cry. He did cry tears leaking silently out from the corners of his eyes. His nose felt as if it was the size of a cabbage, and it throbbed. The mare suddenly changed direction again, darting into a mere break in the trees, down a path so seldom used that there weren't even any cart tracks in it. She slowed again to a trot. Now he could hear what was going on around him. Birds, the wind in the trees, the dull thud of the mare's hooves on the turf. So this was what people meant by peaceful countryside? Well, they could have it. He'd have given an arm for his loft room right now. He could probably have gotten off her back at this point. But for what? He didn't even know where he was. 
Here they were in the middle of a complete wilderness, with no shelter, nothing to eat, and no people, so where would he go? Somehow he had to convince this devil beast to get him back home. Now she slowed to a walk, and all he could do was slump over her neck, as the light coming through the trees took on an amber cast. She was sweating, but no more than one of the horses he was familiar with would have been after a moderately hard job. She should have been foaming with sweat. Foaming? She should be collapsed on the ground by now. Head bobbing with each step, she ambled down the path, and then, with no more warning than when she'd started this run, she stopped. Skiff looked up, through eyes blurring with exhaustion and tears of frustration and fear. Now what? They stood in a tiny clearing in front of the smallest building he had ever seen. They were completely surrounded by trees, and the only other object in the clearing was a pump next to the building with a big stone trough beneath it. He couldn't hear anything but birds and the wind. If there were any humans anywhere around, there was no sign of them. For the first time in his life, Skiff was completely alone. He'd have given anything to see a single human being, even a watchman, if the watch had showed up, he'd have flung himself into their arms and begged them to take him to jail. Every muscle, every bone, every inch of Skiff's body was in pain. His nose and eye hurt worst, but everything hurt. He sat in the saddle blinking, his bad eye watering, and choked back a sob. Then he slowly pried his fingers, one at a time, away from the pommel of the saddle. He looked down at the ground, which seemed furlongs away, and realized that he couldn't dismount. It wasn't that he didn't want to, it was that he couldn't. He couldn't make his cramped legs move, and even if he could, he was afraid to fall. Then the mare solved his problem by abruptly shying sideways. He didn't so much slide off the saddle as it was that the horse and her saddle slid out from underneath him. He made a grab for the pommel again, but it was too late. He tumbled to the ground and just barely managed to catch himself so that he landed on his rump instead of his face, in a huge pile of drifted leaves. It hurt. Not as badly as, say, hitting hard pavement would have, but it still hurt. And it knocked whatever was left of his breath out of him for a moment, and made him see stars again. When his eyes cleared, he looked around. He sat in the middle of the pile of old damp leaves, dazed and bewildered at finding himself on the ground again. Ow, he said, after a moment of consideration. The mare turned, stepping lightly and carefully, and shoved him with her nose in the middle of his chest. He shoved back, finally roused to some sensation other than confusion. You get away from me, you, he said angrily. If it wasn't for you, I... She shoved at him again, and without meaning to, he looked straight into her eyes. They were blue, and deep as the sky, and he fell into them. Hello, Skiff, he heard, from somewhere far, far away. My name is Simri, and I choose you. And he dropped into a place where he would never be alone or friendless again. When he came back to himself, the first thing he did was stagger to his feet and back away from the companion. Never mind the wonderful dream he'd been in. It was a dream. It couldn't be real. Something was terribly wrong. His companion Simri looked at him, and he felt her amusement. His companion. And that was just not possible. Are you out of your mind? He croaked, staring at her. No she said, and shook her head. I choose you. You're a herald. Well, you will be after you go through the collegium and get your whites. Right now you're just a trainee. Like hell, he retorted feelingly. You are crazy, or I am. It occurred to him then that all this might just be some horrible dream. Maybe when he'd jumped onto the horse it had thrown him, and he was lying on his back in that park, knocked out cold and hallucinating. Maybe he hadn't even seen the horse. The heat had knocked him over and he was raving. None of this was happening. That must be it. Don't be stupid, 
Simri replied, shoving at him with her nose. Be sensible. Do you ever have black eyes and a broken nose in a dream? It's not a dream. You're not unconscious, and you are chosen. And you're going to be a herald. I don't bloody well think so, he said, trying to back further away from her and coming up against the wall of the little building. If you think I am, you're crazy. Don't you know what I am? How could this be happening? He didn't want to be a herald. Oh, even Basie had spoken about them with admiration, but no heralds were ever plucked out of a gutter, not even in a tail. Of course I do, she replied calmly. You're a thief, a rather good one for your age, too. Well, then I can't be a herald, can I? He groped for words to try and convince her how mad, how impossible this was even though deep inside something cried out that he didn't want it to be impossible. Heralds are, well, they're all noble and high-born. She snorted with amusement at his ignorance. No, they aren't. Not more than a quarter of them at most, anyway. Heralds are just ordinary people. Farmers, craftsmen, fisherfolk. Ordinary people. Well, they're heroes. And none of them started out that way, she countered. Most of them started out as ordinary younglings, being chosen by a companion. There wasn't anything special about them until then, not visibly anyway. They're good! She considered that for a moment, head to one side. That rather depends on your definition of good, actually. Granted they are supposed to uphold the law, she continued thoughtfully. But in the course of their duties, plenty of them break the law as much as they uphold it if you want to be technical about it. But, but, he spluttered, as the last light pierced through the tree trunks and turned everything a rosy red, including Simri. But heralds are, they do, heralds are what they have to be. They do what the queen and the country need, Simri said, supremely calm and confident. We choose those who are best suited to do those things and supply those needs. And what makes you think that the queen and country might not need the skills of a thief? Well, there was just no possible answer to that. And even though his mouth opened and closed several times, he couldn't make any sounds come out of it. She paced close to him, and once again he was caught, though not nearly so deeply, in those sparkling sapphire eyes. Now look, I'm tired and hungry and sweaty, so are you. But they were in the middle of nowhere. Where was he? How was he? This is a way station, and as a herald trainee, don't argue. You're entitled to anything in it. She wickered softly. I promise there's food and bedding and just about anything you might need in there. There's also a bucket of water inside to prime the pump with. I suggest that before it gets too horribly dark. You pump up some water, clean both of us up, and get both of us some of the food that's waiting. You are hungry, aren't you? You can eat and rest here for the night, and we can talk about all of this. She cocked both of her ears at him and added, And while you're at it, it wouldn't hurt to make a poultice for that black eye you're getting. It's becoming rather spectacular. Harold Alberich, weapons master to Harold's Collegium and sometime intelligence agent for Queen Selene, put down the brush he'd been using on Cantor's mane and stared at his companion in complete and utter shock. Companions didn't lie, but what Cantor had just told him was impossible. You must be joking, he said aloud in his native tongue. Cantor turned his head to look at his chosen. As you well know, he said with mock solemnity. I have no sense of humor. In a pig's eye, Alberich muttered, thinking of all of the tricks his companion had authored over the years, including the one of smuggling himself past the Carsite border to choose and abduct one Captain Alberich of the Carsite army. But I assure you I am not joking. Simri has managed to choose that young scamp you've caught eavesdropping on you over the past couple of months. He is a thief, and she'll probably be delivering him to the Collegium sometime tomorrow. So I suggest you prepare your fellow heralds. He promises to make things interesting around here. Cantor arched his neck. 
But before you do that, you might take that brush along my crest. It still itches. What in the name of Vacandis Sunlord are we supposed to do with a thief? Alberich demanded, not obliging Cantor with the brush. What you always do with the newly chosen. You'll train him, of course. Cantor turned his head again and regarded his chosen with a very blue eye. Hasn't it occurred to you that a skilled thief would be extremely useful in the current situation that you and the Queen have found yourselves in? Scratch a thief, you'll find a spy. Set a thief to take a thief, and you've been losing state secrets. Well, uh, of course it has. All you have to do is appeal to the lad's better instincts and bring them to the fore. I assure you, he has plenty of better instincts. After all, he's been chosen, and we don't make mistakes about the characters of those we choose, do we? Cantor didn't have any eyebrows to arch, but the sidelong look he bestowed on Alberich was certainly very similar. Well, so there you are. About that brush in your hand? Belatedly, Alberich brought the brush up and began vigorously using it along Cantor's crest. The companion sighed in blissful pleasure and closed his eyes. And Alberich began to consider just how he was going to break the news about this newest trainee to Dean Elkarth and the rest. Assuming, of course, they weren't already having similar conversations with their companions. It was a good thing that Basie had taught him how to cook. Yes, there was food here, but it wasn't the sort of thing the ordinary city-bred boy would have recognized as such. I'd have told you what to do. Simri said, her head sticking in the door, watching him as he baked currant-filled oat cakes on a stone on the hearth. He'd also put together a nice bean soup from the dried beans and spices he'd found, but he didn't think it would be done any time soon, and he was hungry now. I wouldn't let you starve. I'm perfectly capable of telling you how to use just about anything in this way station. Somehow I ain't surprised, he replied, turning the cakes deftly once one side was brown. Is there anything you can't do? I'm a bit handicapped by the lack of hands, she admitted cheerfully. She and he were both much cleaner at this point. Beside the pump there had been a generous trough, easily filled and easily emptied. After she'd drunk her fill, and he had washed and brushed her down as she asked, he'd had a bath in it. Then he emptied it out and refilled it for her drinking. The cold bath had felt wonderful. It was the first time in a week that he'd been able to cool down. He'd also washed up his clothing. It was hanging on a bush just outside. It was a lot more comfortable to sit around in his singlet, since there wasn't anyone but Simri to see him anyway. She'd told him which herbs to make into a poultice that did a lot to ease the ache of his eye and nose, and more to make into a tea that did something about his throbbing head. She already knew, evidently, that he could cook, and had left him alone while he readied his dinner over the tiny hearth and the way station. Now he couldn't imagine why he hadn't figured out she was a companion immediately. Unless it was just that the idea of a companion wandering around in an old worn set of tack was so preposterous, and the idea of a companion deciding to make a herald out of a thief was still more so. I told them to tack me up in the oldest kit in the stables that would fit me, she offered and he scooped the oatcakes off their stone and juggled one from hand to hand, waiting for it to cool enough to eat. He gave her a curious stare. You... you kidnapped me! he accused. Well, would you have come with me if I'd walked up to you and chosen you? she asked, her head cocked to one side. I am sorry about your nose, but that was an accident. But I've known for several weeks that you were my chosen she said, as if it was so matter-of-fact that he shouldn't even be considering any other possibility. I've just been waiting for the opportunity to get you alone, where I could explain things to you. But you've already lost this argument, you know, she pointed out. Three times, in fact. He gave up. Besides, the cake was cool enough to eat, and he was hungry enough by this point to eat the oats raw, much less in the cakes he'd just made. He put a second poultice on his eye and nose, and lay back in the box bed that filled most of the way station. It had a thick layer of fresh hay in it, covered over with a coarse canvas sheet. 
It was just as comfortable as his bed in the priory, and although he wasn't sleepy yet, he didn't really want to venture out into the alien environment outside his door. He heard things out there. All manner of unfamiliar sounds enlivened the darkness, and he didn't care much for them. There were wild animals out there. Owls and bats, and who knew what else. There could be bears. You don't for one moment think that I would let anything hurt you, do you? The unexpected fierceness of that question made him open his good eye and turn his head to look at her, where she lay half in, half out of the doorway. I don't know anything about you, he admitted slowly. Nothing at all about companions. Will, I wouldn't, she sighed. And you're about to learn a great deal about companions. No, I ain't. They're going to take one look at me and throw me out, he replied stubbornly. No, they aren't. They already know who you are, what you are, and that I'm bringing you in tomorrow. What? he yelped, sitting up straight, keeping the poultice clapped to his eye with one hand. Well, not everybody, just the people who need to. The dean of the collegium, that's the herald who's in charge of the whole of Harold's collegium, Harold Alberich, the weapons master, the queen's own and the queen, a couple of the other teachers. They all know, and they aren't going to throw you out. She was so matter-of-fact about it, as if it shouldn't even occur to him to doubt her. As to how they know, I told them, of course. Actually, I told them through their companions, but it amounts to the same thing. He flopped back down in the bed, head spinning. This was all going much too fast for him. Much, much too fast. Now what am I going to do? He moaned, mostly to himself. I can't ever go back. The war should have me, for I took a step. You couldn't go back anyway, Simri replied. But, Skiff, do you really, really want me to leave you? The voice in his mind was no more than a whisper, but it was a whisper that woke the echoes of that unforgettable moment when he felt an empty place inside him fill with something he had wanted for so long, so very, very long. No, he whispered back and to his profound embarrassment felt his throat swelling with a sob at the very thought. I didn't think so, because I couldn't bear to lose you. Her thoughts took on a firmer tone. And I won't. No one tries to separate a companion and her chosen. That would be unthinkable. He lay in the firelit darkness for a long time, listening to the strange night sounds in the woods outside the beating of his own heart and his own thoughts. Then he sighed heavily. I guess I got to be a herald, he said reluctantly. But I still think there's going to be trouble. Then we'll face it together, because I am never, ever going to let anyone separate us. In the morning, gingerly probing of his nose and the area around his eye, and the fact that he could actually open that eye again proved that the poultice had done its work. He cleaned himself up in the cold water and donned his shirt and trues, wrinkled and a little damp, but they'd have to do. They both ate. He cleaned the things he'd used and shut the way station up again. He'd been stiff and sore when he woke up, but he knew from experience that only moving around would make that kind of soreness go away. Besides, at the moment... He couldn't wait to get back to the city where he belonged. Whatever people saw in the country was invisible to him. The silence alone would drive him crazy in a day. There was just one problem, of course, and that was that he wasn't going home. He was going to this collegium place. As he mounted Simri's well-worn saddle, with a great deal more decorum this time, he shook his head slightly. I still think there's going to be trouble, he predicted glumly. Skiff, there will always be trouble where you are, she replied mischievously. We'll just have to try to keep it from getting out of hand. Without a backward glance, she started up the forest trail, going in a few paces from a walk to a trot to an easy lope. It was very strange riding her, now that he knew what she was. For one thing, 
She wasn't a horse. He didn't have control over her, and that was the way it was supposed to be, not an accident. But as they moved out of the woods and onto roads that had a bit of morning traffic, he began to notice something else. Now that they weren't charging down the road in a manner threatening to life and limb, people paid attention to Simri. They clearly knew what she was, and they looked at her, and by extension her rider, with respect. Or at least they did until they saw his black eye. But even then they looked at him with respect only leavened with sympathy. And since they weren't galloping at a headlong pace, but rather moving in and out of the traffic at a respectable but easy trot, some people actually began to call greetings to him and her. "'New chosen, I lad,' said a farmer, perched so high on the seat of his wagon that he was eye to eye with Skiff, and without waiting for an answer added, "'Here, catch!' and tossed him a ripe pear. Startled, he caught it neatly and the second one that the same man tossed to him, before Simri found another opening in the traffic and moved smoothly ahead. If he'd cut that up into quarters, I'd like some. He was only too pleased to oblige, since he had the feeling that was what the farmer intended anyway. The little eating knife he always kept in his belt was accessible enough, and since he didn't have to use the reins, he didn't have to try and cut the pears up one-handed. She reached around and took each quarter daintily from his hand as he leaned over her neck to hand it to her. Everywhere he looked, he met smiles and nods. It was a remarkable sensation, not only to be noticed, but to elicit that reaction in total strangers. He did feel rather naked, though. He wasn't at all comfortable with all of this noticing. Don't worry. You'll blend in once you're in your greys. You'll be just another trainee. He was getting used to her talking in his head. Mind speech, she called it, and he was starting to get vague pictures and other associations along with the words. When she talked about being in his greys, he knew at once that what she meant was the uniform of the heraldic trainees, modeled after the herald's own uniforms, but grey in color. That's so people don't expect you to know what you're doing yet she told him, looking back over her shoulder at him with one eye. And by the way, you don't have to actually talk to me for me to hear and understand you. So she knew what he was thinking. That wasn't exactly a comforting thought. A man liked to have a little privacy. And when you're a man, I'll give it to you. Hey, he said, staring at her ears indignantly, and garnering the curious glances of a couple driving a donkey cart next to him. Oh, don't be so oversensitive. I won't eavesdrop. You'll just have to learn not to shout all your thoughts. Great. Now he would have to watch not only what he did and said, but what he thought. This herald business was getting more unpleasant all the time. It's not like that, Skiff, she said coaxingly. Really, it isn't. I was just teasing you. He found a smile starting no matter how he tried to fight it down. How could he possibly stay angry with her? How could he even get angry with her? And maybe that was the point. He wasn't sure how long it had taken them to get from the park where he'd found her to the way station where they stopped, but it took them most of the morning to get back to Haven. The guards on the walls paid absolutely no attention to him, although they had to have seen him careening down the road yesterday. Simri didn't volunteer any information as he craned his neck up to look at them, then bestowed a measuring glance at the two on either side of the passage beneath the wall. He wondered what they were thinking, and what they might have said or done yesterday. They sure didn't try to stop us anyway. Not that it was likely that they'd have had much luck, not with only two guards on the ground and Simri able to leap a farm wagon without thinking about it. Maybe it was just as well they hadn't tried. He might have ended up with both eyes blackened. Once they got inside the city walls, though, people stopped paying as much attention to them. Well, that wasn't such a surprise. People saw heralds coming and going all the time in Haven. On the whole, he felt a bit more comfortable without so many eyes on him. Their progress took him through some areas he wasn't at all familiar with, as they wound their way toward the palace and the Collegia.
He didn't exactly have a lot to do with craftsmen and shopkeepers. His forte was roof-walking and the lift and lay, not taking things from shops. That had always seemed vaguely wrong to him anyway. Those people worked hard to make or get their goods, and taking anything from them was taking bread off their tables. Helping himself to the property of those who already had so much they couldn't keep track of it, now that was one thing, but taking a pair of shoes from a cobbler who'd worked hard to make them just because he took a fancy to them was something else again. Once they got in among the homes of the wealthy, though, it was a different story. He eyed some of those places, all close kept behind their shuttered windows with a knowing gaze. At one point or another he had checked out a great many of them, and he knew some of them very, very well indeed. The owner of that one had not one, but two mistresses that his wife knew nothing about, and they didn't know about each other. He treated them all well, though, so to Skiff's mind none of them should have much to complain about. Sometimes he wondered, however, where the man was getting all the money he spent on them. He's honest enough, but there are others, Simri put in. You see what I mean by needing your skills? He furrowed his brow and concentrated on thinking what he wanted to say, instead of saying it out loud. I suppose, he said dubiously. But they were soon past the second wall, out of the homes of the merely wealthy, and in among the manses of the great and Skiff had to snicker a little as they passed Lord Orthollan's imposing estate. It was the first time he'd come at it from the front, but he couldn't mistake those pale stone walls for any other. How many times had he feasted at my lord's table, and him all unaware? They passed Lord Orthollan's home, passed others that Skiff had not dared approach, so guarded around were they by the owner's own retainers. And finally there was nothing on his right but the final wall blank and forbidding, that marked the palace itself. His apprehension returned, and he unconsciously hunched his head down, trying to appear inconspicuous, even though there was no one to see him. No, there was someone. The next turning brought them within sight of a single guardsman in dark blue, who manned a small gate. Simri trotted up to him quite as if she passed in and out of that gate all the time and the man nodded as if he recognized her. "'This would be Simri,' he said aloud, casting a jaundiced eye up at Skiff, who shrank within himself. "'They're expecting you,' he continued, opening the gate for them to pass through, although he didn't say who they were. Simri walked through, all dignity, and began to climb the graveled road that led toward an entire complex of buildings. Skiff tensed. "'Now I'm in for it.' he thought, and felt his heart drop down into his boots. Fourteen. He sat in Simri's saddle like a sack of grain, and waited for doom to fall on him. She had taken him up the path, through what looked like a heavily wooded park, past one enormous wing of a building so huge it had to be the palace. Eventually they came to a long wooden building beside the river in the middle of a huge fenced field. He'd have called it a stable, except that there weren't any doors on the stalls. Then again, if this was where companions stayed, there wouldn't be any need for doors on the stalls, would there? It had a pounded dirt floor covered ankle-deep in clean straw, and there was a second door on the opposite side, also open. These gave the only light. Simri walked inside, quite at home. The building was oddly deserted, except... except for three people who were very clearly waiting for him just inside the door. One was an odd bird-like man, slight and trim, hardly taller than Skiff, with a cap of dark grey hair and an intelligent, though worried, expression. The second was taller, with a fairly friendly face, which at the moment also bore a distinctly worried expression. Both of them wore the white uniform only a herald was allowed to wear. His welcoming committee, evidently. He couldn't see the third one very well, since he was standing carefully back in the shadows. The third person wasn't wearing the white uniform, though. His clothing was dark enough to blend in with the shadows. Could be summit from the guard, he thought gloomily. Gonna haul me off to jail soon's the other two get done with me. He's not, and you're not going to jail, said Simri, 
but that was all she said. He couldn't find it in himself to feel less than uneasy about the shadowy lurker. She stopped a few paces away from the two men, and Skiff gingerly dismounted, turning to face them with his hands clasped behind his back. A moment later he dropped his eyes. Whatever was coming, he didn't want to meet their faces and see their disgust. So, said the smaller one, you seem to be the young person that Companion Simmery has chosen. Yes, sir, Skiff replied, gazing at his ill-shod toes. And we're given to understand that you, uh, your profession, you— The man fumbled for words, and Skiff decided to get the agony over with all at once. My thief, sir, he said half defiantly. That's what I do. He thought about adding any number of qualifying statements, that it had been a better choice than working for his uncle, that no one had offered him any other sort of employment and he had to eat, even that if Basie hadn't been around to take him in and train him, he'd probably be dead now and not chosen. But he kept all of those things to himself. For some reason, the clever retorts he had didn't seem all that clever at the moment. The shorter man sighed. I suppose you are expecting me to give you an ineffective and stuffy lecture about how you are supposed to be a new person and you can't go on doing that sort of thing any more now that you're a trainee. Skiff stopped looking at his toes and instead glanced up, startled at the speaker. Uh, you're not? You are not stupid, the man said, and smiled faintly, though his tone sounded weary. If you've already played over that particular lecture in your mind, then I will skip it and get to the point. I am Dean Elkarth. I am in charge of Harold's Collegium. The moment you entered the gate here, so far as we are concerned, whatever you were or did before you arrived here became irrelevant. You were chosen. The companions don't make mistakes. There must be the makings of a Harold in you. Therefore, you are welcome. But when you get in trouble, and you will, because sooner or later at least half of our trainees get in trouble, please remember that what you do reflects on the rest of us as well, and heralds are not universally beloved among a certain faction of the highborn. The others will give you the details as they see fit, but the sum of what I have to say to you is that you are supposed to be part of a solution— not part of a problem, and I hope we can show you why in such a way that you actually feel that in your deepest heart. During this rather remarkable speech, Skiff had felt his jaw sagging slowly. It was not what he had expected to hear. His shock must have been written clearly on his face because the dean smiled a little again. This is Harold Terran, he continued gesturing to the other man, who, although friendlier, was looking distinctly worried. He is technically in charge of you, since he is in charge of all of the newly chosen. You'll be getting your first lessons from him, and he will show you to your new quarters and help get you set up. Under normal circumstances, he would have picked out a mentor for you among the older students. But these are not normal circumstances— so, although one of the older students will be assigned as a mentor, in actuality you will have a very different, though altogether unofficial, mentor. That, said a grating voice that put chills up Skiff's back, myself would be. He knew that voice and that accent, though when he'd heard it before it hadn't been nearly so thick. And when the third figure stepped out of the shadows, arms folded over his chest, scar-seamed face smiling sardonically, he stepped back a pace without thinking about it. Skiff had never seen the hair before, stark black with thick streaks of white running through it, because it had been hidden under a hood or a hat. But there was no mistaking that saturnine face or those cold, agate gray eyes. This was the sellsword who'd spoken with, and spied on, Jass, who had threatened Skiff in the cemetery. You, he blurted. This is Harold Alberich, the Collegium Weapons Master, said the dean, and I will leave you with him and Taran. But you can't be, be, be a Harold, Skiff stammered. Where's your, your wife? 
Harold Alberich has special dispensation from Her Majesty herself not to wear the uniform of heraldic whites, Harold Terran interrupted, as Alberich's expression changed only in that he raised his right eyebrow slightly. And now, suddenly, an explanation for Skiff's own rather extraordinary behavior in the cemetery hit him, and he stared at the herald in the dark gray leather tunic and tight trues with something like accusation. You truth-spelled me! Now that he knew Alberich was a herald, there was no doubt in his mind why he had found himself telling the man what he knew that night in the cemetery. Everyone knew about heralds and their truth spell, though Skiff was the first person in his own circle of acquaintances who'd actually undergone it, much less seen it. The two heralds exchanged a glance. Elkarth's right, said Terran. He's very quick. Survive long, he would not, were he not, Alberich replied, and fastened his hawk-like eyes on Skiff, who shrank back just as he had that night. I did, because there was need. Think on this. Had you by any other been caught, it would not have been truth spell, but a knife. Skiff shivered convulsively, despite the baking heat. The man was right. He gulped. Alberich took another couple of steps forward so that Skiff was forced to look up at him. Now, since there is still need without truth spell, what you were about in following that scum you will tell me, and fully you will tell it. There was something very important going on here. He didn't have nearly enough information to know what or why, but it was a lot more than just the fact that Jass had been killed— though that surely had a part in it. But Skiff raised his chin, stiffened his spine, and glared back. To you. Not to him. I know you. I don't know him. The heralds exchanged another glance. Fair enough, Terran said easily. I'll be outside when you're ready for me to take him over. Harold Terran turned and strode out the door on the other side of the stable. Skiff didn't take his eyes off Alberich whose gaze, if anything, became more penetrating. Heard you have of the man Jass and his ending. It was a statement, not a question, but Skiff nodded anyway. And you followed him for moons. Why? He burned down the place where my mates lived. Skiff made it a flat statement in return, and kept his face absolutely dead of expression. They died. I heard him say exactly that with my own ears, and he didn't care. All he cared about was he didn't want to get caught. In fact, he said he got rid of some witnesses before he set the fire. Might even have been them. Alberich nodded. He was not nearly so free with me. Skiff tightened his jaw. Honest, I was in the cemetery by accident, but I was where I could hear real good. And I heard him, and that. Bastard what hired him talking about a new job and talking about the old one. I already figured I was going to take him down somehow, but only after I found out who it was what gave him the order. A swift intake of breath was all the reaction that Alberich showed, and a very slight nod. Which was why you followed him. A pause. It was more than that. More than just a petty arson maker. More even than a murderer as his master was, is, which was why I followed him. Skiff only shook his head. Alberich's concerns meant nothing to him, except... You know who he is, he shot out, feeling himself flush with anger. The boss you know! He held himself as still as a statue, although he would cheerfully have leaped on the man at that moment and tried to beat the knowledge out of him. But Alberich shook his head, and it was with a regret and a disappointment that went so deeply into the tragic that it froze Skiff where he stood. I do not, he admitted. Hope I had you did. At that moment, instead of simply glaring at him, Alberich actually looked at him, caught his eyes, and stared deeply into them, and Skiff felt a sensation like he had never before experienced. It was as if he literally stood on the edge of an abyss, staring down into it, and it wasn't that if he made a wrong move he'd fall, 
It was the sudden understanding that this was what Alberich had meant when he'd said that these were waters too deep for Skiff to swim in. There were deep matters swirling all around him that Skiff was only a very tiny part of, and yet he had the chance to be a pivotal part of it. If he dared, if he cared enough to see past his own loss and sorrows, and see greater tragedy and need, and be willing to lay himself on the line to fix it. Chosen, please, this is real. This is what I meant when I said that we needed you. He gazed into that abyss and thought back at Simri as hard as he could. Is that the only reason you chose me? Because if it was, if it was, and all of the love and belonging that had filled his heart and soul when he first looked into her eyes was a lie, a ruse to catch someone with his particular set of skills? Are you out of your mind? She snapped indignantly, shaken right out of her solemnity by the question. Can't you feel why I chose you? That answer, unrehearsed, unfeigned, reassured him as no speech could have, and something in him shifted, straining against a barrier he hadn't realized was there until that moment. But he still had questions that needed answering. And if you find this master, no matter how high-born he is, he asked slowly, you'll do what? Bring him to justice. Alberich replied instantly, and held up a hand to forego any interruptions. For murder, of your friends, if no other can be proved, although— There are others, Skiff asked, not in amazement, no, for if the bastard, whoever he was, had been cold-hearted enough to burn down a building full of people, he surely had other deaths on his conscience. Now, for the first time, Alberich's face darkened with an anger Skiff was very glad was not aimed at him. Three of which I know, and perhaps more, and there is that which is worse than murder, which only kills the body, slaving for workers, but worse, to make pleasure slaves. Behind it he is, in small, in the selling of children, here even from the streets of Haven, and in large, very large, wherein whole families are reaved from their homes and sold out kingdom. Skiff heard himself gasp. There had always been rumors of that in the streets, and Basie had hinted at it, but even his uncle hadn't stooped that low. Worse than murder? Well, yes. He closed his eyes a moment and thought about those rumors a moment. If the rumors were more than that, and the children, orphans or the unwanted, who vanished from Haven's streets ended up in the place where Basie had intimated they went, and if there really were entire villages full of people who were snatched up and sold out kingdom. Worse, he heard himself agreeing. And one answer there is for such evil. Alberich's stone-like expression gave away nothing, but Skiff wasn't looking for anything there. He already had his answer. Forget anything else. He and this iron-spined man had a common cause. And somewhere inside him, the barrier strained and broke. I'm in, was all he said. I'm with you. Alberich's eyes flickered briefly, then he nodded. More we will speak, and at length, now. There were a great many things Alberich could have said. If you want revenge, you'd better keep your nose clean, for instance. Or if you get yourself thrown out of here for messing up, neither one of us will get what he wants. Or you'll have to work hard at being respectable because it's going to take someone who looks respectable to trap this bastard. He said none of those things. He let another of those penetrating looks analyze Skiff and say something else. Something that had warning in it, but against danger and not mere misbehavior. Something that had acceptance in it as well, and an acknowledgment that Skiff had the right to be in this fight. And Skiff nodded, quite as if he had heard every bit of it in his words. Alberich smiled. It was the sort of smile that said, I see we understand one another. That was all, but that was all that was needed. A moment later, the sound of boots on the straw-covered floor marked Harold Terran's return. Later speech we will have, Alberich promised, as Terran reached them. For now, other things. <laughs>
The other things were not what Skiff had expected. Not that he'd really had any inkling of what to expect, but not even his vaguest intuitions measured up to his introduction to the Collegium and his first candle marks as a trainee. If you're all right, then, follow me, Harold Terran said and started off, quite as if he assumed Skiff would follow and not bolt. Which Skiff did, of course. It seemed that he was in for it after all, but not in the way he'd thought. His emotions were mixed, to say the least. On top of it all was excitement and some apprehension still. Just beneath that was a bewildered sort of wonder, and the certainty that at any moment they would realize they'd made a mistake, or that fearsome Alberich would call the guards. He'd lived with what he was for so long. Beneath that, though, was something still of the new image of the world and his place in it that he'd gotten during that encounter with Alberich. That, granted, the world stank and a lot of people in it were rotten and horrible things happened, but that he, little old skiff, petty thief, had a chance that wasn't given to many people, to help make things better. Not right. The job of making everything right was too big for one person, for a group of people like the Heralds even. But better. And under all of that, slowly and implacably filling in places he hadn't known were empty, was a feeling he couldn't even put a name to. It was big, that feeling, and it had been the thing that had broken through his barriers back there when Simri reaffirmed her bond with him. It was compounded of a lot of things. Release, relief, those were certainly in there. But with the release came a sense that he was now irrevocably bound to something, something good, and accepted by that something a feeling that he belonged at last to something he'd been searching for without ever realizing that he'd been looking. And there was an emotion connected with Simri in there that, if he had to put a name to it, he might have said, with some embarrassment, was love. It was scary having something that big sweep him up in itself. And if he had to think about it, he knew he'd be absolutely paralyzed. So he didn't think about it. He just let it do whatever it was going to do, turning a blind eye to it. But he couldn't help but feel a little more cheerful, a little more at ease here with every heartbeat that passed. And there was plenty to keep him distracted from anything going on inside him anyway. Terran led him away from the stable and toward a building that absolutely dwarfed every other structure he'd ever seen. And if he was impressed, he hated to think how all those farm boys and fisher folk Seamry had talked about must have felt when they first saw it. The building was huge, three and a half stories of gray stone with a four-story double tower at the joining of two of the walls just ahead of them. This is the Herald's Collegium and the Palace, Terran said, waving his hand in an arc that took in everything. You can't actually see the new palace part of the structure from here— it's blocked by this wing next to us, which is where all the kingdom's heralds have rooms. But most of them don't live here, at least not most of the time, Skiff stated, on a little firmer ground. Right? Terra nodded. That's right. The only heralds in permanent residence are the teachers at the Collegium, and the Lord Marshal's herald, the Seneschal's herald, and the Queen's own herald. Have you any idea who they are? Skiff shook his head, not particularly caring that he didn't know. This new feeling, whatever it was, had a very slightly intoxicating effect. Not a clue, he said. I figure you'll tell me in them lessons, right? Right, we'll leave that to basic orientation. It isn't something you need to understand this moment. Terran seemed relieved at his answer. Now, straight ahead of us is Herald's Collegium, which is attached to the residence wing— both for the convenience of the teachers and, he cast a jaundiced eye on Skiff, to try and keep the trainees out of mischief. Skiff laughed. It was very clear from Terran's tone and body language that he meant all trainees, not just Skiff. He couldn't help but cast an envious glance at the wing beside them, though. He couldn't help but think that, as a trainee, he'd probably be packed in among all the other trainees with very little privacy. Healer's Collegium and Bardic are also on the grounds, on the other side of Herald's, Terran continued, waving his hand at the three-and-a-half-story wing ahead of them. You'll share some of your classes with students from there. Healer trainees wear pale green, 
Bardic trainees wear a rust red rather than a true red. There will also be students who wear a pale blue, which is similar to but darker than the pages' uniforms. Those are a mixed bag. Some of them are highborn, whose parents choose to have them tutored here rather than have private teachers. But most are talented commoners who are going to be artificers. What's an artificer? Skiff wanted to know. People who build things. Bridges, buildings, contrivances that do work like mills, pumps, Terran said absently. People who dig mines and come up with the things that crush the ore. People who make machines, like clocks, printing presses, looms. It takes a lot of knowing how things work, and mathematics, which is why they're here. Keep that away from me, Skiff said with a shudder. Sums? I had just about enough of sums. Well, if you don't come up to a particular standard, you'll be getting more of them, I'm afraid, Terran said, and smiled at Skiff's crestfallen face. Don't worry. You won't be the only one who's less than thrilled about undertaking more lessons in reckoning. You'll need it. Some day, you may have to figure out how to rig a broken bridge or fix a wall. They entered in at a door right in the tower that stood at the angle where the herald's wing met the collegium. There was a spiraling staircase, paneled in dark wood there, lit by windows at each landing. Skiff expected them to go up, but instead they went down. First, housekeeping and stores, Terran informed him. The kitchen is down here, too. Now, besides taking lessons, you'll be assigned chores here in the collegium. All three collegia do this with their trainees. The only thing that the trainees don't do for themselves is the actual cooking and building repair work. Skiff made a face, but then something occurred to him. Highborn, too? he asked. Highborn, too, Terran confirmed. It makes everyone equal, and we never want a herald in the field to be anything other than self-sufficient. That means knowing how to clean and mend and cook if need be. That way, you don't owe anyone anything, because we don't want you to have anything going on that might be an outside influence on your judgment. Huh. By now they had reached the lowest landing and the half-cellar, which wasn't really a cellar as Skiff would have recognized one, since it wasn't at all damp, and just a little cooler than the staircase. Terran went straight through the door at the bottom of the staircase, and Skiff followed. They entered a narrow, whitewashed room containing only a desk and a middle-aged woman who didn't look much different from any ordinary craftsman's wife that Skiff had ever seen. She had pale brown hair, neatly braided and wrapped around her head, and wore a sober dark blue gown with a spotless white apron. "'New one, Gaither,' said Terran as she looked up. She gave him a different sort of penetrating look than Alberich had. This one looked at everything on the surface, and nothing underneath. "'You'll be at ten, I think,' she said, and stood up, pushing away from her desk. Exiting through a side doorway, she returned a moment later with a pile of neatly folded clothing, all in a silver-gray color, and a lumpy bag. "'Here's your uniforms. Now let me see your shoes.' When Skiff didn't move, she gestured impatiently. "'Go ahead, put your foot on the edge of the desk, there's a lad,' she said. With a shrug, Skiff did as he was told, and she tusked at his shoes. "'Well, those won't do.' Tear and measure him for boots, there's a dear, while I get some temporaries. She whisked back out again while Terran had Skiff pull off his shoes, made tracings of his feet, then measured each leg at ankle, calf, and knee, noting the measurements in the middle of the tracing of left or right. By the time he was finished, the housekeeper was back with a pair of boots and a pair of soft shoes. Both had laces and straps to turn an approximate fit into a slightly better one. These'll do until I get boots made that are fitted to you, she said briskly. Now, my lad, I want you to know that there are very strict rules about washing around here. This time, the look she gave him was the dagger-like glare of a woman who has seen too many pairs of washed hands and arms that were dirty down to the wrist bone. A full bath every night, and a thorough wash-up before meals, or before you help with the meal, if you're a server or a cook's helper. If you don't measure up, it's back to the bathing room until you do, even if all that's left to eat when you're done is dry crusts and water. Do you understand? Yes, am Skiff replied. 
He wasn't going to point out to this woman that a dirty thief is very soon a thief in the jail. That was just something she didn't need to know. Good. She took him at his word, for now. He had no doubt he'd be inspected at every meal until they figured out he knew what clean meant. Now, I don't suppose you have any experience at household chores. Laundry and mending is what I'd rather do. Dishes, floor washing and scrubbing is what I can do. But I'd rather have laundry and mending, he said immediately. Can boil an egg and cut bread and butter, but not else worth eating. Laundry and mending, the housekeeper's eyebrows rose. Well, if that's what you're good at. We have more boys here than girls, so we tend not to have as many hands as I'd like that are actually good at those chores. Her expression said quite clearly that she would very much like to know how it was that he was apt at those tasks. But she didn't ask, and Skiff was hardly likely to tell her. This boy is Skiff, chosen by Simri, Taryn said, as Gaitha got out a big piece of paper divided up into large squares, each square with several names in it. I've got you down for laundry and mending for the next five days, Gaitha said. Terran will schedule that around your classes and meals. We'll see how you do. Off we go, then, Terran said, and loaded Skiff's arms with his new possessions. Back up the steps they went, pausing just long enough at the first floor for Terran to open the door and Skiff to look through it. This is where the classrooms are, Terran told him, and he took a quick glance down the long hall lined with doors. We're on midsummer holiday right now, so all but two of the trainees are gone on visits home. It's just as well. With this heat, no one would be able to study. Do what they does in the city, Skiff advised, voice muffled behind the pile of clothing. They ain't getting no holidays. Work from dawn till it gets too hot, then go back to it when it's cooled off a bit. We're ahead of you there, Terran told him. It's already arranged. Follow me up to the second floor. Terran went on ahead and Skiff found him holding open the door on the next landing. He stepped into another corridor, this one lined with still more doors, but it ended in a wall and seemed less than half the length of the one on the first floor. It was a bit difficult to tell because the light here was very dim. There were openings above each door that presumably let the light from the room beyond pass through, and that was it for illumination. You won't be living on this side of the common room, Terran told him. This is the girls' side. The common room where you take all meals is between the boys' and girls' side. Come along and you'll see. He led the way down the corridor, opened a door, and Skiff preceded him into the common room. There were windows and fireplaces on both sides, and the place was full of long tables and benches, rather like an inn. Skiff made a quick reckoning and guessed it could hold seventy-five people at a time, a hundred if they squeezed in together. How many of them trainees you got? he asked, as Terran held the door in the opposite wall open for him. Forty-one. Twenty-six boys, fifteen girls. Terran turned to catch his grimace. That does make for some stiff competition among the ladies. Or are you not interested in girls yet? Never thought about it, he said truthfully. Where I come from? Where I come from, you don't get no girl unless you pays for her and I got better things to spend my glim on, he thought. But no point in shocking this man. He'd probably go white at the thought. And this is your room, Terran said, interrupting his thoughts, opening one of the doors. Eager now to put down his burdens, Skiff hurried through the door. He was very pleasantly surprised. There was a good bed, a desk and chair, a bookcase and a wardrobe. It had its own little fireplace. No hoping to get warmth from the back of someone else's chimney, and a window that stood open to whatever breeze might come in. All of it, from the wooden floor to the furniture to the walls, was clean and polished and in good condition, though obviously much used. When Skiff set his clothing down on the bed, he was startled to realize that it was a real mattress, properly made and stuffed with wool and goose down, not the canvas-covered straw he'd taken as a matter of course. He had never, not once, slept on a real mattress. He'd only seen such things in the homes of the wealthy that he'd robbed. 
Grab a uniform and I'll take you to the bathing room, Terran told him, before he could do more than marvel. You need to get cleaned up, and I'll take you down to the kitchen for something to eat. Then I'll take you to Dean Elkarth, and he can determine what classes you'll need to take. It didn't seem that Harold Terran had any intention of leaving Skiff alone. With a stifled sigh, Skiff picked out small clothes, a shirt, tunic, trues, and stockings, debated between the boots and the shoes, and finally decided on the latter as probably being more comfortable. With an eye long used to assessing fabric, he decided that the trues and tunic must be a linen canvas. The shirt was of a finer linen, the boots of a heavier canvas with leather soles and wooden heels. Interesting that the temporary boots were of canvas rather than leather. They'd be quicker to make up, and a lot more forgiving to feet that weren't used to boots. Or even shoes. Some of the farm boys who came into the markets went barefoot even in the city, right up until the snow fell. Trailing behind the herald, wondering if the man considered himself to be guide or guard, Skiff left his room. The bathing room was a shock. Copper boilers to heat the water, one with a fire under it already. Pumps to fill them, pipes carrying cold and hot water to enormous tubs and commodious basins, boxes of soft, sage-scented soap and piles of towels everywhere. Skiff forgot Terran's presence entirely. No matter how hot it was, he reveled in a bath like no one he knew had ever enjoyed. He soaked and soaked until the aches of that horrible ride with Simri were considerably eased, and he felt cleaner than he ever had in his whole life. In fact, it was only after he'd dried off, using a towel softer than any blanket he'd ever owned, and was half-dressed in the new clothing, that Terran spoke, waking him to the herald's presence. Mop up your drips with the towel you used and wipe out the tub, then drop the towel down that chute over there. Send your old clothing after it. Terran nodded toward a square opening in the wall between two basins, and Skiff finished dressing, then obeyed him. How long had he been there? Had he left while Skiff was filling the tub? It bothered him that he couldn't remember. I always know where people are. Am I losing my edge? Terran waited for him by the door, but held out a hand to stop him before he went back through it. Hold still a moment, would you? he asked, and put a single finger under Skiff's chin turning his face back into the light from the windows. I thought most of that was dirt, he said contritely. I beg your pardon, Skiff. Before I take you to Elkarth, I'd like you to see a healer for that nose and eye. Another moment of mixed reaction, a little resentment that the man would think he was so slovenly that he'd have that much dirt on his face, and small wonder that the housekeeper had been so abrupt. But that was mingled with more astonishment. A healer? For a broken nose? But within minutes, he found himself sitting across from a green-clad healer, a fairly nondescript fellow who examined him briskly, said, This will only hurt for a moment, and grabbed his nose and pulled. It certainly did hurt, quite as much as when he'd hit Simri's neck in the first place. It hurt badly enough he couldn't even gasp. But the healer had spoken the truth. It only hurt for a moment and in the very next moment it not only stopped hurting, it stopped hurting. He opened his eyes, and both of them opened properly now, and stared into the healer's grin. You'll still look like a masked ferret, the fellow said cheerfully, but you should be fine now. How did you do that, anyway? Terran asked, as they made their way back to Harold's collegium and Skiff's interview with Harold Elkarth. Simri jumped a wagon, and I hit a neck with my face, he replied ruefully, and found himself describing the entire wild ride in some detail as they walked. She made you think you'd stolen her, Terran said at last, smothering laughter. Forgive me, but, oh, it's pretty funny now, Skiff admitted, and I suppose it'll be funnier in a moon or a season, or a year. Last night, I can tell you, it weren't funny at all. I can well imagine. By this time they were back down the stairs into the half-basement in the collegium again. It'll be funnier still when you've got yourself on the outside of some lunch. Here's the kitchen. Terran opened a door identical to the one that led to the housekeeper's room, but this one opened onto an enormous kitchen, 
silent and empty. I haven't had anything since breakfast either. He gave Skiff a conspiratorial wink. Let's raid the pantry. Fifteen. Usually, our cook Marrow is down in the kitchen, Terran told him as they cleaned up what little mess they'd made. Now listen, I'm not telling you this because I think you're going to filch food. I'm telling you this because all boys your age are always hungry, and after the last couple of centuries running the Collegium, we've figured that out. When Marrow is here, you can ask him for whatever you want to eat, and if he isn't knee-deep in chaos, he'll be delighted to get it for you. When he's not here, and I know very well from my own experience how badly you can need a midnight snack, only take food from the pantry we just used. The reason for that is that Marrow plans his meals very carefully. He has to, with so many inexpert hands working with him, and if you take something he needs, it'll make difficulties for him. Skiff thought fleetingly of the number of times he'd taken food from Lord Ortholan's pantry, and hoped it hadn't made difficulties for that cook. Odd, he wouldn't have spared a thought for that yesterday. Now, healed, fed, and ready for Dean Elkarth? Terran didn't wait for an answer, but strode off heading for the stairs. This time they walked through the corridor that held all the classrooms. Again it was lit by means of windows over each classroom door. From the spacing... The rooms were probably twice the size of the one they'd given Skiff. Why so many and so much room? Maybe in case it was needed. Just because they only had forty-six trainees now didn't mean they couldn't have had more at some other time. And Terran had said that the classes were shared with Bardic and Healer trainees. And those others. That would be interesting. They passed through the double doors that marked the boundary between Collegium and Herald's Wing, and Terran turned immediately to a door on the left. This is where I'll leave you for now. I will see you tomorrow, and we'll start basic orientation, and a couple of the other introductory classes. That way, when everyone gets back and Collegium classes start again, you'll be able to join right up. He tapped on the door. A muffled sound answered, and Terran opened it and, putting a hand just between Skiff's shoulder blades, gently propelled Skiff inside before he got a chance to hesitate. The door shut behind him. Skiff found himself in a cluttered room, a very small room, but one that, from the open door to the side, must be part of a larger suite. There were four things in this room, besides Dean Elkarth, books, papers, chairs, and a desk. There were bookshelves built into the wall that were crammed full of books. Books and papers were piled on every available surface. Elkarth motioned to Skiff to come in and take the only chair that wasn't holding more books, one with a deep seat and leather padding that was cracked and crazed with age. He sat in it gingerly, since it didn't look either sturdy or comfortable. He should have known better. Nothing bad that he'd assumed about the Heralds ever turned out to be right. The chair proved to be both sturdy and comfortable, and it fit him as if it had been intended for him. Harold Elkarth folded his hands under his chin and regarded Skiff with a mild gaze. You, he said at last, are a puzzle. I must say that Misty and I have searched through every chronicle of the Collegium, and I cannot find a single instance of a thief being chosen. We've had several attempted suicides, three murderers, which I will grant were all self-defense, and one of them was Levan Firestorm, but nevertheless, they were murderers. We've had a carnival trickster, a horse sharper, and a girl who pretended to be a witch, told fortunes which turned out to be correct foresight, but also took money for curses she never performed, relying instead on the fact that she'd be long gone before anyone noticed that nothing bad had happened to the person she cursed. We've had a former assassin. We've even had a spy. But we've never had a thief. Skiff tried to read his expression, and didn't get any clues from it. Elkarth merely seemed interested. So I have to ask myself, Skiff, why you? What is it about you that is so different that a companion would choose you? He tilted his head to the side, looking even more bird-like. 
Alberich, by the way, has told me nothing of why he recognized you. In fact, he didn't say much at all about you, except that he knew who you were. But until Cantor told him, he had not known you were specifically a thief. Would you want to know? Skiff asked. The best way to limit the damage might be to get Elkarth to ask questions, so that he could carefully tailor his answers. More to the point, what do you want to tell me? Elkarth countered. Usually, not always, but usually, the Chosen sitting where you are start pouring out their life stories to me. Are you going to be any different? I ain't the kind to pour out my life story to anybody, Skiff replied, trying not to sound sullen, wondering just how much he was going to have to say to satisfy the Dean's curiosity. I don't know. I ain't never hurt nobody. I stick to the lifting lay and roof work. He hadn't given a second thought to whether Elkarth would understand the cant, but Elkarth nodded. Picking pockets and house theft, which explains why you were in that park in broad daylight, taking advantage of the fact that no one was about in the heat, hmm? Skiff blinked. How had your trail out of the city was shatteringly obvious, Elkarth pointed out. Not to mention hazardous. From the moment Simri left the park with you, there were witnesses— many of them members of the city guard. But that only tells me what you do, not what you are. And it's what you are that is what I need to know. At Skiff's silence, he prodded a little more. Your parents? Dead, he answered shortly. But try as he might, he couldn't stand firm in the face of Elkarth's gentle but ruthless and relentless questioning. Before very long, Elkarth knew something of his uncle Launder, of Beale, and of Basie and Basie's collection of boys, and he knew what had happened to all of them, especially Basie, and he knew about the fire. He managed to keep most of the details to himself, though. At least he thought he did. The last thing he wanted was to start unloading his rage on Elkarth. It was a handle to Skiff's character that Skiff didn't want the Dean to have but he didn't manage to keep back as much as he would have liked, though, and just talking about it made his chest go tight, his back tense, and his stomach churn with unspoken emotion. Part of him wanted to tell this gentleman everything, but that was the new part of him. The old part did not want him to be talking at all, and was going mad trying to keep him from opening his mouth any more than he had. Fortunately at that point, Elkarth changed the subject entirely, quizzing him on reading, figuring, writing, and other subjects. That was what he had expected, although he didn't care for it, and his stomach soon settled again. It took longer for the tension to leave his back and chest, but that was all right. The tension reminded him that he needed to be careful. Outside the office, the day moved on, and the heat wave hadn't broken. Thick as these stone walls were, the heat still got into Elkarth's office, and both of them were fanning themselves with stray papers before the interview was over. "'I think I can place you now,' Elkarth said by late afternoon. "'But I'm going to be putting you in one class you probably aren't going to appreciate.' "'Figuring,' Skiff groaned. "'Actually, no. Not immediately. I'm going to ask Gaitha to teach you how to speak properly.' Elkarth sat back and waited for Skiff's reaction. If he'd expected Skiff to show resentment, he got a surprise himself. Huh! <laughs> suppose I can see that. Though you should have heard, heard me afore, before. Basie got hold of me. Actually, he wasn't at all displeased. You didn't get to be a good thief by being unobservant. And Skiff had known very well that his speech patterns would mark him out in any crowd as coming from the bad part of town near Exile's Gate. If he was going to consort with the Highborn and be taken seriously, he'd better stop dropping his H's. Among other things. And he might as well start being careful about how he spoke now. Is that all you want with me? he asked, watching every syllable, adding as an afterthought, Sir? For now. Elkarth studied him, and Skiff forced himself not to squirm uncomfortably under that unwavering gaze. I hope eventually you'll feel freer to talk to me, Skiff. 
He looked for a moment as if he was about to say more, then changed his mind. I believe you have another interview before you— I— Skiff began, but a tap on the door interrupted him. Come, called Elkarth, and the door was opened by Harold Alberich, who was, of course, the very last person that Skiff wanted to see at this moment, when Elkarth had him feeling so unbalanced and unsettled. Alberich looked at him for a moment, but not with the gaze of a hawk with prey in sight, but with a more measuring, even stare. Come, I have to take our new one off, Elkarth he said simply. Companions Field, I think. Cooler it will be there. Well, I'm satisfied with him, so he's all yours, Elkarth replied, making Skiff wince a little. But Alberich smiled, ever so slightly. Your Simri is anxious to see the work of the healer, he said to Skiff. And it is that I have evaluation of my own to make. Please come. He reached out and beckoned with one hand, and Skiff got reluctantly to his feet. Unlike Terran, Alberich did not seem inclined to lead Skiff anywhere. Instead, he paced gravely beside Skiff, hands clasped behind his back, indicating direction with a jerk of his chin. They left the herald's wing by the same door through which they'd first entered the collegium. Skiff recognized the spot immediately. There were plenty of trees here and Skiff was glad of the shade, and glad of the light color of the trainee uniform. He hated to think what it would have been like if the outfit had been black. To the river bank, I think, Alberich said, with one of those chin jerks. You are puzzled by my accent. Well, I, Skiff admitted, never heard not like it, nor will you. It is from Carsey that I am. A captain I was in the service of Vikandis' sunlord. With a glance at Skiff's startled face, Alberich then turned his face up toward the cloudless sky. We have something in common, I think, or will have. The thief and the traitor, neither is to be trusted. Outside the heraldic circle, that is. Skiff swallowed hard. A carsite? A carsite officer? from the army of Valdemar's most implacable enemy. But why? That is what I, we, for Cantor suggested this, wish to be telling you, Alberich said gravely as they approached the river bank. His face cleared then as they rounded a section of topiary bushes and the river appeared, dazzling in the sun. Ah, there they are. Two companions waited for them, and Skiff knew Simri from the other immediately, though how he couldn't have said. He rushed to greet her, and as he touched her, he felt enveloped in that same wonderful feeling that had been creeping in all afternoon, past doubts, past fears, past every obstacle. He pulled her head down to his chest and ran his hands along her cheeks, while she breathed into his tunic and made little contented sounds. He could have stayed that way for the rest of the afternoon. But Alberich cleared his throat politely after a time, and Skiff pulled away from her with great reluctance. A grotto there is in the river bank, cool as a cellar in this heat, and our companions will enjoy it as well. Simri seemed to know exactly where they were going, so Skiff let her lead him. Skiff kept one hand on her neck and followed along. She led him down a steeply sloped grassy bank to the edge of the river itself, and there, partly out of sight from the lawn above, was a kind of ornamental cave carved into the bank, just as Alberich had said. It was just about tall enough to stand up inside, and held three curved stone benches at the back. Nicely paved, ceilinged, and walled with flagstone, it was wonderfully cool in there, and the two companions took up positions just inside, switching their tails idly, as Alberich and Skiff took seats on built-in benches at the back. This wasn't so bad. Without the herald looming over him, without actually having to look him in the eye, Skiff felt more comfortable. And in the dim coolness, the herald seemed a bit more relaxed. Alberich cleared his throat again as soon as they settled. So, it is you who have been telling tales for the most of today. Let someone else for a candle mark. Suits, Skiff said shortly and leaned back into the curved stone bench. Carsey.
Alberich began meditatively. I left my land, and to an extent my god. They call me traitor there. Think you, it is odd that I love them both still? I don't know, Skiff replied honestly. To know much about gods, and truth to tell, I never thought over much about anything like a whole country. Mostly didn't think much past my own streets. Alberich nodded a little, his gaze fixed on the river flowing outside the grotto. No reason there was why you should. Skiff shrugged. Oh, Basie, he didn't think much of Carsey, and I reckon he thought pretty well of Voldemar when it comes down to cases. At least... Skiff thought hard for a moment, back to those memories that he hadn't wanted to think about at all for a very long time now. Huh. When he lost his legs, it wasn't Carsey as saw him healed, nor the Tedrils. It was Voldemar, and he had some good things to say about Harold's. Tell me, Alberich urged mildly, and Skiff did. It was surprising when he came to think about it how much good Basie had said about Voldemar and its Harold's especially considering that he'd fought against both. Alberich sighed. I love my land and my god, he said when Skiff was through. But both have been, are being, ill-served, and that is neither the fault of the land nor the god. He told his story concisely, using as few words as possible, but Skiff got a vivid impression of what the younger Alberich must have been like and when he described being trapped in a building that was deliberately set afire to execute him, Skiff found himself transposing that horror to what Basie and the boys must have felt. But there had been no companion leaping through the flames to save them. There had been no happy ending for Basie. It was the King's Own and another herald who came at Cantor's call, Alberich said meditatively, which was for my sake a good thing. Few would question Talamir's word. Fewer dared to do so aloud. So I was healed, and I learned. Yes, he said after he glanced at Skiff. Oh, smile you may that into Grey's I went and back to schooling at that age. A sight I surely was. He shook his head. Why? Skiff asked. Why didn't you just tell him to make your herald straight off? And knowing nothing of heralds or Valdemar? Stubborn I am often, stupid never. Much I had to unlearn. More did others have to learn of me. Selene, after Talamir, was my friend and advocate. After them, others. More than enough work there was here, to keep me at the Collegium, replacing the aged weapons master. More than enough reason to stay, that others have me beneath their eye and so feel control over me in their hands. He smiled sardonically. Did they know what I learned for the Queen here? It is that they would send me out to the farthest border ere I could take breath thrice. Since Skiff had seen him at work, he snickered. Alberich bestowed a surprisingly mild glance on him. Now your turn it is for answering questions, he said, and Skiff steeled himself. But first of all, because I would know... Why choose to be a thief? An odd question, and as unexpected as one of Alberich's rare smiles. Skiff shrugged. Twas that, or slave from an Uncle Londa. Wasn't much else going, and Basie was all right. His heart contracted at that. All right. What a niggardly thing to say about a man who had been friend, teacher, and in no small part saviour. Yet, if he said more... He put his heart within reach of this herald, this Alberich, who had already said in so many words that he would use anything to safeguard Valdemar, the Queen, and the heralds. And that's bad how, whispered that new side of him. Shut up, replied the old. Skiff became aware that a moment of silence had lengthened into something that Alberich might use to put a question, so he filled it quickly. Basie was pretty good to us, actually, he paused. You gonna truth spell me again? Alberich shook his head. What I did was done in need and haste. Much there is I would learn of you, but most of it will wait. And what I would know, I think you will tell freely for the sake of your friends. So now, 
For a second time, Alberich asked questions about Jass and Jass's master, this time helping Skiff to pry out the least and littlest morsel of information in his memory. This time, though, the questions came thoughtfully, as slow as the heat-heavy air drifting above the river bank and cloaking it in shimmer, each question considered and answered with the same care. Alberich was right about this much. In this case, Alberich's goals and Skiff's were one and the two voices inside him were at peace with one another. The light had turned golden as they spoke, and the heat shimmer faded. There had been a long time since the last question, and Skiff slowly became aware that lunch was wearing thin. As his stomach growled, Alberich glanced over at him again with a half-smile. You know your way about, I think, the weapons master said. Tomorrow we will meet, and you will begin your training with me and with others. Then, with no other word of farewell, Alberich rose and stalked out, his companion falling in at his side like a well-trained drill partner. You've been mighty quiet, Skiff said to Simri in the silence. You are doing perfectly well without me, she replied, with a saucy switch of her tail. Well, here you are, left perfectly alone on the palace grounds. You can go and do whatever you want. No keeper, no guardian. You could go climb to the palace roof if you wanted to, bearing in mind the Queen's guard might catch you. Or hasn't that occurred to you yet? It hadn't, and the revelation hit him like a bucket of cold water. You sure? he gasped. As sure as I'm standing here. She switched her tail again, but this time with impatience. They trust you. Isn't it time you started to trust them? Just start, that's all. An odd, heavy feeling came into his throat. Once again the sense that something portentous had happened, something that he didn't understand, came over him. It was more than uncomfortable. It was unsettling, in the sense of feeling the world he knew suddenly shift into something he no longer recognized. I'm hungry! he announced, hastily shunting it all aside. And I reckon I saw some ham and bacon in that pantry. Simri wickered. It sounded like a chuckle. I reckon you saw more than that. Go on, come back and meet me here once you've stuffed yourself. Skiff got up, and now that he was moving again, he felt every single bruise and strain from yesterday's ride. Was it only yesterday? It felt like a lifetime ago. As he got up, he actually staggered a little with stiffness. Simri moved quickly to give him a shoulder to catch himself on, and after he'd steadied himself, he gave her a self-conscious little kiss on her forehead. Go on, she said playfully, giving him a shove with her nose. Just don't eat until you're sick. You didn't become a successful thief without learning the layout of a place on the first time through it. Nevertheless, Skiff couldn't help but feeling a little self-conscious as he made his way across the grass, overshadowed by the silent building. And he couldn't help looking for those who might be looking for him. But there were no watchers. Simri had been right. And when he left the heat of the outdoors for the cool of the great kitchen, he discovered it just as deserted as it had been when Terran brought him. He opened the pantry doors and stood amid the plenitude, gazing at the laden shelves and full of indecision. Bacon or ham? White bread or brown? It was too hot to eat anything cooked up fresh, besides being far too much trouble, but there was an abundance of good things that could be eaten cold. His mouth watered at the sight of a row of ceramic jars labeled pickled beets, but the discovery of a keg of large sour cucumber pickles made him change his mind about the beets. There were so many things here that he had only tasted once or twice, and so many more he'd seen but never tasted. But although Simri had warned him, playfully, about eating himself sick, he was mindful of that very consideration. Too many times he'd seen people in his own streets do just that, when encountering unexpected abundance. After all, none of this was going to disappear tomorrow, or even later tonight, unless he ate it, and he wasn't going to have his access to it removed either. When this cook gets back to work... Oh, there was a thought. If there was so much here ready for snacking, what wonderful things must the cook prepare every day? Visions of the kinds of things he'd seen in the best inns passed through his mind. 
minced meat pasties, stews with thick, rich gravy, egg pie, and oh, the sweets. Eventually he made his selections and put a plate together. He ate neatly and with great enjoyment, savoring every bite, finishing with a tart apple and a piece of sharp cheese. Then, as he had when he had eaten earlier with Terran, he cleaned up after himself and put everything away. A glance through the windows above the great sink as he was washing up showed him that the sky had gone to red as the sun set. There would be plenty of time to spend with Simri, and at that moment there was nothing in the world that he would rather have been doing. Back up and out he went, under a sky filled with red-edged purple clouds, passing trees just beginning to whisper in an evening breeze, through the quietude that seemed so strange to him after the constant noise of the city proper. Simri waited for him where he had last seen her, watching the sunset and turn the river to a flat ribbon of fire. He put an arm over her shoulder, and they watched it together. How many times had he watched the sun rise or set above the roofs of the city? Too many to count, certainly, but he'd never had as much time as he would have liked to enjoy the sight, even when it was a truly glorious one like tonight. Come to that? There had never been anyone with him who understood that it was a glorious sight until tonight. Basie would have, but Basie had spent most of his time in the cellar room, and there was never the time or leisure for his boys to bring him up for a sunset. They stood together until the last vestige of rose faded from the clouds, and only then did they realize that they were not alone. Behind them were another herald and companion, who must have come up behind them so quietly that not even Skiff's instincts were alerted. And that took some skill. Skiff didn't even know they were there until Simri reacted, with a sudden glance over her shoulder, a start and a little jump. Then he looked behind and saw the strangers. He turned quickly, sure that they were somewhere they shouldn't have been, but the tall elderly man standing with one arm around his companion's shoulders even as Skiff had stood with Simri, smiled and forestalled any apology. "'I beg your pardon, youngling, for startling you,' the man said, his voice surprisingly deep for one as thin as he was. "'We often come here to admire the sunset, and didn't see any reason to disturb your enjoyment. Roland tells me that you are Skiff and Simri.' The man's uniform was a touch above the ones that Harold Terran and Dean Elkarth had worn. There was a lot of silver embroidery on the white deerskin tunic, and Skiff would have been willing to bet anything he had that the trues and shirt this Harold wore were silk. The companion was something special as well. He was just a little glossier, just a little taller, and had just a touch more of an indefinable dignity than any of the others Skiff had seen thus far did. This is the Queen's own Harold, Talamir, and Roland, the Grove-born, Simri said hastily in his mind, in a tone that told Skiff, even though he had no idea what the titles meant, that these two were somehow very, very special, even by the standards of Harold's. Yes, sir, Harold Talamir, Skiff said, with an awkward bob of his head. It was a very odd thing. He had seen any number of highborn, and never felt any reason to respect them. He did respect the heralds he'd met so far, but this man, without doing more than simply stand there, somehow commanded respect. But at the same time, there was an aura of what Beale might have called mortality, and what others might have called fay that hung about him. The herald's smile widened. And I see that you and Simri mind speak. That is excellent, especially in so early a bond. Talamir stepped forward and extended his hand to Skiff, and when Skiff tentatively offered his own, took it, and shook it firmly but gently. Welcome, Skiff, was all he said, but the words were a true greeting and not a hollow courtesy. Thank you, sir, Skiff replied, feeling an unaccountable shyness, a shyness that evidently was shared by Simri who kept glancing at the other companion with mingled awe and admiration. Talamir seemed to expect something more from him, and he groped for something to say. This is all kind of new to me. So I'm told. Mild amusement no more. 
No sign that Talamir had been told anything of Skiff's antecedents. Well, if you feel overwhelmed, remember that when I first arrived here, I was straight out of a horse-trading family. I'd never spent a night in my life under anything but canvas, and the largest city I ever saw was a quarter the size of Haven. My first night in my room was unbearable. I thought I was going to smother, and I kept feeling the walls pressing in on me. Eventually I took my blankets outside and slept on the lawn. Very few of us are ready for this when we arrive here, and— He chuckled softly, the merest ghost of a laugh. Sometimes here is even less ready for us. But we adapt, the trainee to the collegium and the collegium to the trainee. Even if it means pitching a tent in the garden for a trainee to live in for the first six months. Skiff gaped totally unable to imagine this elegant gentleman living in a tent, but quickly shut his mouth. "'Yes, sir,' he replied, his usually quick wits failing him. He had no idea how to end this conversation, but the herald solved his dilemma for him. "'Have a good evening, youngling,' Talamir said, and he and his companion turned and drifted off through the dusk like a pair of spirits, making no sound whatsoever as they moved over the grass. The moon, three-quarters now, had just begun to rise, and its light silvered them with an eldritch glow. "'Is it just me?' Skiff asked, when he was pretty sure they were out of earshot. "'Or are they spooky?' "'They're spooky,' Simri affirmed, with an all-over shiver of her coat. "'Rolan is Talamir's second companion. Tever was killed in the Tedril Wars,' when Talamir and Jadis were trying to rescue the king. They say that everyone thought Talamir was going to follow Tavar and King Sendar until Roland came and pulled him back. Ever since then, Talamir's been otherworldly. Half his heart and soul are here, and half's in the havens, they say. Skiff shook his head. All this was too deep for him. Still, Simri continued, shaking off her mood, his mind is all here, and Talamir's mind is better than four of anyone else's. Would you like to see Companion's Field? I thought this was Companion's Field, Skiff replied confusedly. She made a chuckling sound. This is only the smallest corner of it. Most of it is across the river. Think you can get on my back without a boost? Please, I can pull myself up a gutter on the roof without using legs, he retorted. I ought to be able to get on your back. She stood rock still for him, and after a moment of awkwardness, he managed to clamber onto her bare back. Stepping out into the twilight at a brisk pace, she took him across the river on a little stone bridge, and they spent a candle mark or two exploring Companion's Field. Finally the long day caught up with him, and Skiff found himself yawning and nodding catching himself before he actually dozed off and fell off Simri's back. Simri brought him right back to the place where they'd met, and from there he stumbled up to his room. Someone had come along and lit the lanterns set up along the walls, so at least he wasn't stumbling because he couldn't see. When he got to the door of his room, he discovered that someone had also slipped a card into a holder there that had his name on it. A sound in the corridor made him turn. His eyes met the brilliant blue ones of an older boy, hair soaking wet and wrapped in a light sleeping robe on his way out of the bathing room. The other boy smiled tentatively. Hello, he greeted Skiff. I'm Chris. You must be the new one, Skiff. It's just been me and Jerry here over midsummer. Uh, hello, he eyed Chris carefully, definitely high-born with that accent and those manners but not one with his nose in the air. Jerry a girl or a boy? Girl. She'll be your year mate, got chosen six moons ago. Oh, I made sure I left enough hot water for a good bath. Thanks. That decided him. Maybe he'd already had one bath today, but he was still stiff and sore and another wouldn't hurt. Chris was still looking at him quizzically. I hope you don't mind my asking, but how did you get that black eye? It's a glory. If you haven't seen it, it's gone all green and purple around the edges, and black as black at your nose. Smacked it into Simri's neck, Skiff admitted ruefully. Ain't never jumped on a horse afore. 
Chris winced in sympathy. Ouch! Better go soak. Good night. Night, Skiff replied, and got a robe of his own to take the boy's advice. When he got back to his room and started putting his new belongings away to clear his bed so he could sleep, he found one last surprise. On the desk were all of his things. Every possible object he owned, except the most ragged of his clothing from both his room next to Jass's and the Priory, including his purse, with every groat still in it. Startled, he tried to think at his companion. Simri! he called her, hoping she'd answer. What do you need? she asked sleepily, and he explained what he'd found. Who did that, and how come? he finished. It worried him. Oh, that would be Alberich's doing, I expect, she replied. Usually they go send someone to tell families that the Chosen's arrived safely, and to get their belongings if they didn't bring anything with them. Don't you want your things? Well, of course he wanted his things. I just... The fact was he was worried. Who went there? What they'd said? And how they'd known where he came from? Cantor says it was all Alberich's doing, at least getting your things from your room. Well, that was one worry off his mind. Alberich would have gone as the sellsword and intimidated his way in. Good enough. He sent off the usual guardsman to the priory. They'll have told the priory you were chosen, and the guardsman would have brought someone hired to take your place. So the priory won't go short-handed. Cantor says Alberich didn't tell your old landlord anything. Is that all right? Since it was exactly what he would have wanted, had he been asked, he could only agree. Aye, that's fine, I reckon. In fact, he couldn't think of anything else he could possibly want. Get some sleep, she told him. It'll be a long day tomorrow. A longer one than today? With a sigh, he climbed into bed feeling very strange to be in such a bed, and even stranger not hearing the usual noises of the city beyond his walls. But not so strange that he was awake for much longer than it took to find a comfortable position and think about closing the curtains he'd left open to let in every bit of breeze. About the time he decided it didn't matter, he was asleep. 16. A scant week later, Skiff was just about ready to face all the returning trainees. He knew what the heralds of Valdemar were about now. At least he knew where they'd come from and what they did. And he was starting to get his mind wrapped around why they did it. If he didn't understand it, well, there were a great many things in the world that he didn't understand, and that didn't keep him from going on with his life. Something had happened to him over the course of that week and he didn't understand any of it. The things he had always thought were the only truths in the world weren't, not here anyway. He was going to have to watch these heralds carefully. They might be hiding something behind all this acceptance and welcome. But since a lot of what was going on with him had to do with feelings, he came to the unsatisfactory and vague conclusion that maybe it wasn't going to be possible to understand it. He was caught up like a leaf in the wind, and the leaf didn't have a lot of choice in where the wind took it. If it hadn't been that Simri was a big part of that wind... Well, she was, and despite everything he'd learned until this moment, he found himself thinking and feeling things that would have been completely unlike the boy he'd been a fortnight ago. Soft was what he would have called what he was becoming now, but what he was now knew that there was nothing soft about where he was tending. If anything, it was hard, as in difficult. And difficult were the things he was learning, and the things he was going to learn, though, truth to tell, it was no more work than he was used to setting himself. Physical exertion, the weapons work he was doing, the riding, none of it was as hard as roof-walking. Book learning? Ha! Huh, it was mostly reading and remembering, not like having to figure out a new lock. Even the figuring— the mathematics, they called it, wasn't that bad. Since he could already do his sums, this new stuff was a matter of logic, a lot like figuring out a lock. The real difference was that he was obeying someone else's schedule and someone else's orders. 
Yet he'd run to Basie's schedule and Basie's orders, and thought no worse of it, nor of himself. For every objection his old self came up with, the new one, or Simri, had a counter. And if there was one thing he was absolutely certain of, it was that he would not, could not do without Simri. She didn't so much fill an empty place in him as fill up every crack and crevice that life had ever put in his heart, and make it all whole again. To have Simri meant he would have to become a herald. So be it. It was worth it a thousand times over. And once again, just as when he'd been with Basie, he was happy. He hadn't known what happiness was until Basie took him in. Moments of pleasure, yes, and times of less misery than others, but never happiness. He'd learned that with Basie, and since the fire he hadn't had so much as a moment of real, unshadowed happiness. Now it was back. Not all the time, and there were still times when he thought about the fire and raged or wept or both. He wasn't going to turn his back on these people, not until he figured out what their angle was. But for the most part it was back like a gift, something he'd never thought to have back again. After that he knew he couldn't leave. Out there, without Simri, he'd go back to being alone against the world. In here, with her, there was one absolutely true thing he was certain of. Simri loved and needed him, and he loved and needed her. The rest? Well, he'd figure it all out as it came. But he woke every day with two persistent and immediate problems to solve. When his fingers itched to lift a kerchief or a purse, he wondered what would happen if he gave in to the urge. And when Chris and Jerry accepted him without question as one of themselves, he worried what would happen when they, and the rest of the trainees, learned he'd been a thief. Simri might be the center of his world, but he'd had friends before in Basie and the boys, and he liked having them. He didn't want to lose the ones he was getting now. He woke one morning, exactly six days after he had arrived, a day when he knew the rest of the trainees would begin coming back in, signaling the beginning of his real classes tomorrow although it would probably take two or three more days for all of them to make it back. It helped, of course, that they all had companions, and however long their journeys were, they would travel in a fraction of the time it took an ordinary horse to cross the same distance. He had met most of his teachers, and even begun lessons designed to allow him to fit into the classes with some of them. He had no idea how many of them, besides Alberich and Terran, knew his background either. And eventually it would come out. Secrets never stayed secret for long. Eventually someone would say something. He had worried over that like a terrier with a rat. In fact, he'd gone to bed that night thinking about it. And when he woke, it was with an answer at last. Whether it would be the right answer was another question entirely. But he knew who to consult on it. The Collegium Cook a moon-faced, eternally cheerful man called Marrow, had turned up three days ago. The collegium bells, signaling the proper order of the day, had resumed when Marrow returned. So now, when Skiff awoke at the first bell of the day, and went down to the kitchen at the bell that signaled breakfast, he would join Chris and the girl, Jerry, and some of the teachers around a table in the kitchen for a real cooked meal. With so few to cook for, Marrow declined help in cooking, but afterward they all pitched in to clean up. Some of Skiff's daydreams about food were coming to pass. Marrow even made homely oat porridge taste special. After breakfast came Skiff's first appointment of the day. It wasn't exactly a class, especially not this morning. And this morning he could hardly eat his breakfast for impatience to get out to the sal, where some of the weapons training was done. He cleared the table by himself so that he could leave quickly. He ran to the Sal, a building that stood apart from the rest of the Collegia, and for good reason, since it needed to be a safe distance from anywhere people might walk, accidentally or on purpose. The trainees from all three Collegia learned archery, and even some of the blues, the students who weren't trainees at all. And some of those archery students were, to be frank, not very good. Skiff, although he had never shot a bow in his life, had proved to be a natural at it somewhat to his own surprise. Seeing that, Alberich had tried him with something a bit more lethal and less obvious than an arrow. He'd tried him in knife-throwing.
Skiff had been terrifyingly accurate. Where his eye went, so did whatever was put in his hand. He had no idea where the skill had come from, but at least his ability to fight with a knife, or with the blunted practice swords, was no better than anyone else's. Alberich had promised something in the way of a surprise for him this morning, and Skiff was impatient to see what he meant, as well as impatient to speak with him. When Skiff arrived at the cell, Alberich was throwing a variety of weapons at a target set up on the other side of the room. Alberich was a hair more accurate than Skiff, but Alberich's skill came from training, not a natural talent. Nevertheless, Skiff watched with admiration as Alberich placed his weapons, knives, sharpened stakes, and small axes, in a neat pattern on the straw-padded target. He didn't interrupt the weapons master, and Alberich didn't stop until all the implements he'd lined up on a bench behind him were in the target. The sal, a long, low building with smooth, worn wooden floors, was lit from above by clear-story windows. This was because the walls were taken up with storage cabinets and a few full-length mirrors. For the rest there wasn't much, just a few benches, some training equipment, and the door to Alberich's office. For all Skiff knew, Alberich might even have quarters here, since he hardly ever saw the weapons master anywhere else. So you come in good time, Alberich said, as the last of his sharpened stakes slammed into the target. He turned toward Skiff, picking up something from the bench where his weapons had been. Come here, then. Let us see how these suit you. These proved to be little daggers in sheaths that Alberich strapped to Skiff's arms, with the daggers lying along the inside of his arms. Once on, they were hidden by Skiff's sleeves, and he flexed his arms experimentally. They weren't at all uncomfortable, and he suspected that with a little practice wearing them, he wouldn't even notice they were there. Of my students, only two are, I think, fit to use these, Alberich said. Jerry is one. It is you that is the other. Look you. He showed Skiff the catch that kept each dagger firmly in its sheath, and the near-invisible shake of the wrist that dropped it down into the hand, ready to throw, when the catch was undone. Skiff was thrilled with the new acquisition. What boy wouldn't be? But unlike most, if not all of the other trainees, he had seen men knifed and bleeding and dead. Men and a woman or two. Even before he left his uncle's tavern he'd seen death at its most violent, and he knew, bone-deep and blood-deep, that death was what these knives were for. Not target practice, not showing off for one's friends. Death, hidden in a sleeve, small and silent, waiting to be used. Death was a cold, still face, and blood pooling and clotting on the pavement. Death was floating bloated in the river. Death was ashes and bones in the burned-out hulk of a building. Death was someone you knew found still and cold, and never coming back. And these little toy daggers were death, not to be treated lightly or to be played with. But death was also being able to stop someone from making you dead. Can you kill a man? Alberich asked suddenly, as Skiff contemplated the dagger in his hand. Skiff looked up at the weapons master. As usual, his face was unreadable. Depends on the man, Skiff replied soberly. If you're talking in cold blood, I'd have took Jass down like a mad dog, just cause he killed my friends, and I'd have done it soon as I knew who his master was, in the dark, in the back, and if something happens, and his master won't come up on what's due him, Maybe I'd do him too. If you're talking in hot blood, if I was come at myself, someone wanting me dead, why, I'd kill him. Alberich nodded, as if that was expected. So, when are you going to display these to your friends? He prodded. It sounded casual, but it was prodding. Skiff shook his head. These? They're for serious work, not for showing off. Less you order me, Master Alberich, I ain't even gonna wear these, except to practice. That's like balancing a rock over a door to see who gets hit. I ain't got a hot temper, but I got a temper like anybody else. Losing temper makes people do stupid things. Death was a fight over nothing, and a lost temper and blood where a simple blow would have served the same purpose. 
over and over again, in the streets outside Exile's Gate. Death came when tempers worn thin by need or hurt, anger or drink, flared and blades came out. Alberich, in his guise of the cell sword, was one of the few in those taverns that Skiff had ever seen who went out of his way to avoid killing, to avoid even causing permanent harm. Alberich gave a brief nod of satisfaction, and went on to drill Skiff in the use of his new weapons. He said nothing more as the knives went into the target again and again. He was satisfied that Skiff was going to be sensible, and dismissed the question as answered. That was another thing that Skiff had come to realize about Alberich in the last week. Where other people, even a few heralds, were inclined to harp on a subject that worried them, Alberich examined the subject, asked his questions, made his statements, came to his decisions, and left it alone. If he trusted the person in question. And he trusted Skiff. That was a very, very strange realization. But when he had come to it last night, it had been the catalyst for his own decision this morning. Master Alberich, he said, when the knives had been taken off and wrapped up in an oiled cloth to keep the sheaths supple and catches rust-free, I got a thought. Sooner or later, someone's gonna let it slip what I was, and that's gonna cause some trouble. Alberich gave him one of those very penetrating glances, but said nothing. But I think that you want to keep at least part of what I can do real quiet. Now the weapons master nodded slightly. Have I not said it? Your skills could be more than useful. Skiff clasped his hands behind his back. So I had an idea. What if we go ahead and let part of it out? Just that I was on the lifting lay. Cause there's this. Ain't too many as does the roof work and the lifting lay. And if people know I've done the one, they won't look for t'other. He grinned. I can turn it into a kind of rary show trick. You can do the lift for laughs. I'd like, he continued with a laugh, to see on Chris's face when I give him his little silver horse back what he keeps in his pocket. Alberich raised one eyebrow. You have the itching fingers, he said, though without accusation. A bit, Skiff admitted. What do you think? I think that you have the right of it, Alberich replied, and Skiff's spirits lifted considerably. It is your skill in other things, and not as the picker of pockets that is of primary value, at least for now. And when you have your whites, the novelty of your past will have worn off. Those within the circle will not trouble to speak of it, and most outside the circle will never know of it. So if there is a thing to be taken amidst a crowd of strangers, you will likely not find eyes on you. That made perfect sense. One of the pickpockets Skiff knew had spent an entire year just establishing himself as a lame old beggar who was always stumbling into people. Then when no one even thought twice about him, he began deftly helping himself to their purses, and there wasn't a man jack of the ones that were robbed that even considered the lame old beggar was the culprit. Alberich's eyes looked elsewhere for a flicker of time, then returned to him. Those who need to know what you are about, he said, will know. The rest will see an imp of mischief. He leveled a long gaze at Skiff. Skiff shrugged. Won't keep nothing, he said quite truthfully. Never took more than I needed to live comfortable, or Basie did. That was Basie's way, start to take more, get greedy get caught. A wise man, your Basie, Alberich replied, with nothing weighting his tone. Skiff shrugged again. So I don't need nothing here, living better than I ever did, and you brought me my stuff. With the purse of money, left in the loft at the Priory. And when that money runs out, what then? If there is need for silver to loosen tongues, or even gold, the Queen's coffers will provide. Alberich said gravely, giving Skiff a sudden chill, for it seemed as if the weapons master read Skiff's mind before Skiff even finished the thought. And for the rest, for there are fairs and there are taverns, and perhaps there will be the giving and receiving of gifts among friends, there is the stipend. Stipend? Skiff asked. Stipend. Alberich smiled wryly. <laughs> 
Some of ours are highborn, used to pocket money, some used to lavish amounts of it. We could forbid the parents to supply it, but why inflict hardship on those who deserve it not? So, the stipend. All trainees receive it alike, pocket money for small things. Since you have money already, he paused, and I am not asking you where it came from, nor demanding that you give it back, said the look that followed the pause. Then you will have yours on the next quarter day with the others. Oh, uh, thank you. Skiff, for once, felt himself at a loss for words, blindsided, in fact. This wasn't something he had expected, another one of those unanticipated kindnesses. There was no earthly reason why the heralds should supply the trainees, him in particular, with pocket money. They already supplied food, clothing, wonderful housing, entertainment in the form of their own games, and the bardic collegium on the same grounds. Why were they doing these things? They didn't have to. Trainees that didn't have wealthy parents could just do without pocket money. But Alberich had already turned away. He brought out a longer knife and was preparing the sal for another lesson in street fighting. That Skiff could understand, and he set himself to the lesson at hand. It's a fool's bet, Harold trainee Nerissa cautioned a fascinated blue four weeks later. Don't take it. But the look in her eyes suggested that, although honesty had prompted the caution, Nerissa herself really, truly wanted to see Skiff in action again. Eight trainees, two from Bardic Collegium and six from Harold's, and three unaffiliated students, were gathered around Skiff, and a fourth blue, in the late afternoon sunshine on the training field. The group surrounding Skiff and the hapless blue were just as fascinated as Nerissa, and just as eager. Skiff himself shrugged and looked innocent. Not a big bet, he pointed out. Just to fix my window so the breeze can get in and them, those, moths can't. He says he can, says he has for himself and his friends, and I don't think it'd put him out too much. It seems fair enough to me, said Chris. Neither one of you is wagering anything he can't afford or can't do. He pointed at the blue. And you swore in the compass rose that Skiff could never pull his trick on you, because you in particular, and your plumb line set in general, were smarter than the heraldic trainees. The blue's eyes widened. How did you know that? he gasped. Chris just grinned. Sources, my lad, he said condescendingly, from the lofty position of a trainee in his final year. Sources. And I never reveal my sources. Are you going to take the bet or not? The blue's chin jutted belligerently. Damn right I am, he snapped. Witnessed, called four herald trainees and one bardic at once, just as Alberich came out to break the group up and set them at their archery practice. At the end of practice, once Alberich had gone back into the sow, virtually everyone lingered, and Skiff didn't disappoint them. He presented the astonished Blue with the good luck piece that had been the object of the bet, an ancient silver coin, so worn away that all that could be seen were the bare outlines of a head. The coin had been in a pocket that the Blue had fixed with a buttoned-down flap, an invention against pickpockets of his own devising that he was clearly very proud of. In a panic, the boy checked the pocket. It was buttoned. He undid it and felt inside. His face was a study in puzzlement. As he brought out his hand, there was a coin-shaped lead slug in it. Skiff flipped his luck piece at him, and he caught it amid the laughter of the rest of the group. He was good-natured about his failure, something Skiff had taken into consideration before making the bet, and joined in the laughter ruefully. All right, he said with a huge sigh. I'll fix your window. As the Blue walked off, consoled by two of his fellows, Harold trainee Korok slapped Skiff on the back with a laugh. I swear it's as good as having a conjurer about, the Lord Marshal's son said. Well done. How'd you think of slipping him that lead slug to take the place of his luck piece? Skiff flushed a little. He was coming to enjoy these little tests and bets. Picking pockets was something he did fairly well, but he didn't get any applause for it out in the street. The best he could expect was a heavy purse and no one putting the watch on him. This, however, 
He had an audience now, and he liked having an audience, especially an appreciative one. I figured I'd better have something when Chris told me that Hank had been a boasting over in the Compass Rose, and told me I had to uphold the Herald's side, Skiff replied with a nod to Chris. We've all seen that luck piece of his, so it wasn't no big thing to melt a bit of lead and make a slug to the right size. After that I just waited for him to say something I could move in on. But when did you get the coin? Korak wanted to know. I mean, Alberich broke us up right after he took the bet, and you didn't get anywhere near— Korak stopped talking, and his mouth made a little O oh when he realized what Skiff had done. You took it off him before the bet, he exclaimed. When there was all that joshing and shoving, sure, Skiff agreed. I knew he'd take the bet. After all that about his special pocket, he'd never have passed it up. He figured it'd be a secret I wouldn't reckon out, and I'd lose. But even if Chris hadn't told me, I'd have figured it anyway, he added. The button shows when you look right, and he ain't no seamstress. That buttonhole ain't half as tight as it could be. That last in a note of scorn from one who had long ago learned to make a fine buttonhole. Anyway, I had to have the slug, cause I knew once he took the bet he'd be a finger in that pocket to make sure his luck piece was there. It's a good thing you haven't shown up a gift other than moderate thought-sensing, Chris laughed, or he'd have been accusing you of fetching the thing. Skiff preened himself just a little under all the attention. If having Skiff around was entertaining for his fellow trainees, the admiration each time he pulled off something clever was very heady stuff for Skiff. He'd begun beautifully, a couple of days after full classes resumed, when Chris's best friend Dirk had asked innocently where he'd come from and what his parents did. He'd put on a pitiful act, telling a long, sad, and only slightly embellished story of his mother's death, the near slavery at his uncle's hands, his running away, and his tragic childhood in the slums near Exile's Gate. All the while, he was slowly emptying good-hearted Dirk's pockets. But how did you live? the young man exclaimed, full of pity for him. How did you manage to survive? By this time, of course, since everyone in the three Collegia loved a tale, he'd drawn a large and sympathetic audience. Oh, Skiff had said, taking Dirk's broad hand, turning it palm upwards, and depositing his belongings in it. I turned into a thief, of course. Poor Dirk's eyes had nearly bulged out of his head, and this cap to a well-told tale had surprised laughter out of everyone else. Word very quickly spread, but because of the prankish nature of Skiff's lifting, there wasn't a soul in Harold's collegium, and not more than one or two doubters in Bardic and Healers, that thought him anything other than a mischief-maker, and an entertaining one at that. Those few were generally thought of as sour-faced pessimists, and their comments ignored. Not, Skiff thought to himself somberly, as he accepted the accolades of his fellows with a self-effacing demeanor, but what they mightn't be right about me, except for Simri. Except for Simri. That pretty much summed it up. Everyone among the heraldic trainees was willing to accept Skiff as a harmless prankster because he'd been chosen because companions didn't choose bad people, and if anyone among the teachers thought differently, they were keeping their doubts to themselves. Time to get to the baths, Chris reminded them. Otherwise the hot water's going to be gone. That sent everyone but Skiff on a run for their quarters. Skiff lingered, not because he didn't care about getting a hot bath, but because Alberich had given him an interesting look that he thought was a signal. He made certain that no one was looking back at him, then sidled over to the sal entrance. Alberich was, as he had thought, waiting just inside. Working, and working well, is your plan of misdirection, the weapons master observed calmly. So far, Skiff waited for the rest. There had to be more. Alberich wasn't going to give him a look like that just to congratulate him on his cleverness. Would it be that you would know the voice of Jass's master? Heard you it again? Alberich asked. Skiff felt a little thrill run through him. So Alberich was going to use him. He wasn't just going to have to sit around while the weapons master prowled the slums in his sellsword guise. 
I think so, Skiff said after giving the question due consideration. But he'd have to be talking. Well, he'd have to be talking like he thought he was way above the person he was talking to. Condescending, Alberich nodded. That I believe I can arrange. There is to be a gathering of Lord Ortholan's particular friends tonight. Get you to that place without challenge I can do. It is for you to get yourself into a place of concealment, where you can hear and observe, but not be noticed. Oh, I can do that, Skiff promised recklessly. You just watch. I intend to, since it will be myself at this gathering as guard to Selene with Talamir, Alberich replied. I wish you at the door into the herald's wing at the dishwashing bell. He turned and retreated into the shadows of the sow, and Skiff whirled and ran for the collegium. He got his bath, lukewarm but he hardly noticed, and ate without tasting his supper in such haste that he came close to choking once. He was in place long before the bell rang, and Alberich, arriving early, smiled to see him there, and to see him in the uniform of a page, the pale blue and silver that all of Selene's pages wore. Come, was all he said, and he didn't ask where Skiff had gotten the uniform. As it happened, he hadn't stolen it. He'd won it fair and square. Another little bet. He'd had the feeling that he might need it at some point, and he was still small enough to pass for one of the pages without anyone lifting an eyebrow. Won't be able to pull that off much longer, though, he thought with regret. He'd learned a lot, impersonating a page in Lord Ortholan's service, and he hoped to learn more, slipping into the palace proper. I trust you know how to serve, Alberich muttered, as they walked together down the corridor, Servants whose duty it was to light the lamps passing by them without a second glance. Skiff just snorted. I should like to note, Alberich went on, as they made a turn into the second half of Harold's wing, that I specified you be in a place of concealment. Hide in plain sight, Skiff retorted. When does any highborn look at a page? Unless it is his own kin, a point you have made. Well, this may serve better than having you lurking in the rafters. Alberich nodded a greeting to a herald just emerging from his room. The other saluted him, but showed no sign of wanting to stop and talk. Can't see nobody's face from the rafters, Skiff pointed out. They made another turning, into a section that looked immensely old, much older than the collegium or the wing attached to it. Skiff looked about with avid curiosity. They must be in the old palace now, the square building upon which all later expansions had been founded. The old palace was rumored to date all the way back to the founding of Valdemar, and it was said that King Valdemar had used the old magics that were only in tales to help construct it. Certainly no one in these days would have attempted to build walls with blocks of granite the size of a cottage, and no one really had any idea how the massive blocks could have been set in place to the height of six stories. There were even rumors that the blocks were hollow and contained a warren of secret passages. Unlikely, Skiff thought, but it would be impossible to tell, unless you knew where a door was, because the outer walls were at least two L's thick, and you could tap on them until you were a greybeard and never get a hollow echo. Alberich stopped just outside a set of massive double doors. This the reception chamber is. The reception will be in slightly less than a candle mark. Your plan? Set and ready, Skiff said boldly. You go do whatever you're going to do and leave me here. Alberich nodded and continued on his way. Skiff checked the door of the chamber and found it, as he had expected, unlocked. He slipped inside. The walls were plastered over the stone, and the plaster painted with scenes out of legends Skiff didn't even begin to recognize. Candle sconces had been built onto the walls to provide light later and there was an enormous fireplace, truly large enough to roast an ox. There was no fire in it now, of course, but someone had placed an ox-sized basket of yellow, orange, and red roses between the andirons as a kind of clever fire substitute. The room looked out into the courtyard in the center of the old palace. Here the walls were not of the massive thickness of the outer walls, and the windows ran nearly floor to ceiling with a set of glass doors in the middle that could be opened onto the courtyard itself. 
There were sideboards along the wall, covered with snowy linen cloths set up to receive foodstuffs, though none were there yet except two baskets of fruit. Candles and lanterns waited on one of the tables, though none had been put in their sconces and holders, nor lit. Skiff took a tall wax taper and went out into the corridor, lighting it at one of the corridor lamps. He then went about the room setting up the lights, quite as if he'd been ordered to do so. There seemed to be too many lanterns for the room, so after consideration he took the extras out into the courtyard and hung them on the iron shepherd's crooks he found planted among the flowers for that purpose. Roughly a quarter candle mark later, a harried individual in royal livery stuck his head in the door and stared at him. What? Did I order you to light the lamps? he asked, sounding more than a bit startled. Skiff made his voice sound high and piping, more childlike than usual. Yes, my lord, he replied with a bob of his head. You did, my lord. The man muttered something under his breath about losing one's mind as the hair grayed, then said, Carry on, then, waving a hand vaguely at him. Skiff hid his grin and did just that. It was one of the things he'd learned impersonating a page at Lord Orthalan's. If a boy was doing a job, rather than standing about idly, people would assume he'd been set the task and leave him alone. Even if the person in charge didn't recall setting the task or seeing the boy, that person would take it for granted that it had just slipped his mind and leave the boy to carry on. When the upper servant appeared again, with a bevy of boys clad just as Skiff was in tow, Skiff was relieved to see that none of them were the boy he'd won his uniform from. That had been his one concern in all of this, and with that worry laid to rest, he paid dutiful attention to the servant's instructions. He actually paid more attention than the real pages, who fidgeted and poked each other. But then they were yawningly familiar with what their duties were, and he wasn't. The food arrived then, tidbits rather than a meal, something to provide a pleasant background to the reception. He managed to get himself, by virtue of his slightly taller stature, assigned to carry trays of wine glasses among the guests. That was a plus. He'd be able to move freely, where Alberich would be constrained to go where the queen did. When all was in readiness, the doors into the courtyard— now nicely lantern-lit thanks to Skiff's efforts, and the doors to the corridor were flung open, the page boys took their places, and the guests began to trickle by ones and twos into the room for the reception. 17. Alberich stood at Selene's right hand as she circulated among Lord Orthalan's guests. He wore his formal whites, something he did only on the rarest of occasions. He was not at all comfortable in what, for the first two decades of his life, had been the uniform not only of the enemy, but of the demon lovers. Only three people knew that reason, however. To tell anyone but Selene, Talamir, and Misty would have been to deliver a slap in the face to those who had rescued and cared for him, and taken them into their midst. Sometimes, though, he did wear the uniform, when the need to do so outweighed personal discomfort. In this case, he wore his whites because he would be far more conspicuous in his favored dark gray leather than in his heraldic uniform. Talamir stood at Selene's left, where he could murmur advice into her ear if she needed it. Alberich stood on her right, where his weapon hand was free. He watched every one and everything, his eyes flicking from one person to the next, and he never smiled. This evidently bothered some, though not all, of Lord Orthalan's guests, the ones who had never seen Alberich before and only knew of him by reputation. Those who frequented court functions were used to the way he looked at everyone as if he saw a potential assassin. He did, however. Everyone was a potential assassin. Of course the likelihood that any of them actually were assassins was fairly low, but he was the herald who had saved Selene from death at the hands of her own husband cutting the prince down with the prince's own sword. He saw treachery everywhere, or feigned that he did, and when he looked at someone he didn't know with suspicion in his eyes, that person tended to get very nervous. Sometimes he wished that he didn't have quite so formidable a reputation. Sometimes he wished that he could just look at someone and not have them flinch away. 
That was about as likely at this point as for him to turn as handsome as young trainee Chris. That was what Harold Chronicler Misty said, anyway, looking at him from behind those peculiar split-lensed spectacles of hers that forced her to pull her head back to peer down her nose when she was reading, and tilt her chin down to peer through the top half when she was looking at anything past the length of her arms. What do you expect? she'd ask him tartly. The man who'll cut down a prince wouldn't hesitate at putting a blade in the heart of a man of lesser rank. But for the God's sake, don't ever try smiling at them. You aren't any good at faking a smile, and when you try, you look as if you were about to jump on people and tear their throats out with your teeth. A pity Misty was perhaps the herald who was the most inept with weapons in the entire circle. He could do with a dose of her good sense here tonight. Not that she'd enjoy it, of course. She would far rather be where she could avoid all this interminable nonsense, in her quarters, either writing up the current chronicles or going over old ones, a glass of cold, sweet tea at her elbow. Where she would probably knock it over at least once tonight. Hopefully when she did, the glass would be empty. If it wasn't, well, at least the papers on her floor were discards, unlike the ones piled all over Elkarth's office. Alberich pulled his attention back to the reception. The heat wave had finally broken, though the thick stone walls of the old palace kept every room in it comfortably cool even during the worst of the heat. With the doors open, there was a pleasant scent coming from the roses in the courtyard. No one had gone out there, though, for Selene and Orthalan were in here. No matter how tired anyone's feet got, he wouldn't leave where the power was. If Alberich's gaze rested more often than usual on a particular page, circulating among the guests with a tray of wine glasses, probably no one was going to notice. It was a very ordinary-looking boy, small, dark, curly-haired. If he moved more gracefully than the usual lot, that wasn't likely to be noticed either. Alberich was pleased with the way he was looking up at the people he was serving. Not staring enough to make him seem insolent, just paying respectful attention. Very good. Very smooth. The boy must have done something like this before many times, though Alberich doubted it had been for any purpose other than to filch food from whatever noble household he had infiltrated. Lord Orthalan, on whose behalf this reception was being held, also circulated among the guests quite as if he was the one who was the host and not the queen. This particular festivity was a reward for those who had helped Orthalan to conclude a set of delicate negotiations that would ultimately benefit the crown substantially, according to Misty. Alberich was not at all clear on just what those negotiations were, only that they had involved a number of men, and a few women, of vastly disparate backgrounds, many of whom had personal differences with each other. One thing they all had in common, though, they were all very, very wealthy. That much showed in their costumes, rich with embroidery and of costly materials, and in their ornaments, heavy gold and silver and precious gems. The details didn't matter to Alberich, though Misty would have been studying them with the eye of one who would be recording every subtle detail later in her writings. That was the problem of living around a chronicler. He never knew just what detail, what secret that he assumed was just between them, would end up in one of her histories, to be goggled at by some other generation of heralds to come. Right now, he was in the unusual position of having part of his attention devoted to something other than Selene and her welfare. He watched that one small boy, not as a hunter watched prey, but as the prey watches a hunter— alive to every nuance in his behavior, waiting for the slightest sign that the boy recognized a voice he'd only heard once. When he told the boy that he could arrange for him to hear words spoken in tones of condescension, he had not been promising more than he could deliver. Although these people had worked together for Orthalan's cause, they had not forgotten rank and perceived rank and all of the tangle of quarrels that had made it so difficult to get them to work together. They had merely put those things aside for the moment. And although they were now basking in the unanticipated presence of royalty, those things still remained. Where the queen gazed, all was harmony. But the moment that she took her attention away, the claws were unsheathed, though subtly, 
subtly, with a care not only for the Queen's presence but for the watchful eye of her guardian, who might misinterpret what he saw. And in Alberich's case, well, no one wanted Alberich to misinterpret anything. So rather than bared claws and visible teeth, there were mere hints of rivalries and competitions, mostly carried out in tone and carefully chosen words. Oh, there would be condescension in plenty, among those able to read tone and words so exactly that they could choose to ignore what they heard or exaggerate the offense. Small wonder the crude bully Jass hadn't heard what the boy had read in his master's tone. The wonder was that the boy had read it so accurately. Well, every herald, every trainee is a wonder, small or great. It could be that this boy was, or would be, more of a wonder than most. There were still those, not heralds mostly, who doubted the wisdom of having a thief as a trainee. And the boy was not yet committed to becoming a herald. Alberich, so apt at reading the unspoken language of gesture and tone, knew that better than any. If it had been a case of trusting to the boy by himself to come around, to learn to trust, to understand what it was they were doing, Alberich would have been the first to say, No, he is a danger to us, and cannot be trusted past his own self-interest. But there was more than that. There was the companion. And so... Alberich was always the first, not the last, to say, Peace. He will be ours soon enough. The boy was good, very good. Alberich had no difficulty in imagining him moving through a crowd of just about any sort of folk, save perhaps the highest, and remaining completely unnoticed. He was, after all, a pickpocket. That was the way of the game. The unobtrusive prospered. The rest wound up in jail. Watching the boy was the only entertainment he had, though, and in the end the reception was, as such things generally were, deadly dull. These people were small. In the normal course of things, no matter how wealthy they were, they would never have seen Selene except from the back of the audience chamber, or at most stood before her for a few brief moments while she passed some judgment in their favor or against them. They would never have watched as she bent that cool, thoughtful gaze on each one alone, never have heard her inquiring as to the details of their lives. For that moment of reflected glory, they were content to be restrained and to keep their masks firmly in place, their smiles unwavering. And although the boy had shown a moment or two of hesitation, there was no sudden recognition. The reception came to its predictable end when Selene had had a private word with each and every one of Ortholan's guests and withdrew, along with Talamir and Alberich. And after that the guests would depart swiftly, there being nothing there to hold them. The boy's skiff would have to extricate himself from the toils of the page-master as best he could. And when he did, just as swiftly as Alberich had reckoned he would, he found Alberich waiting for him in his own room. Alberich had taken some thought to the needs of the boys, and had brought with him something other than the things, good though they were, that lay in Marrow's free pantry. He had gone down to the palace kitchen, and commanded some of the dainties that Selene's court feasted on. He calculated that having had such things paraded beneath his nose all night, the boy would not be emotionally satisfied with bread and cheese, however good those common viands were, and if he was anything like Alberich had judged him, he had not filled himself at dinner. So when Skiff pushed open his own door, there was Alberich, beneath a lit lantern mounted on the wall, sitting at ease in the boy's chair, the covered platter beside him on the desk. The boy started, but covered it well. Didn't think to see you afore the morrow, he said matter-of-factly as he sat down on his bed. Good service demands immediate reward, Alberich replied, and uncovered the platter then pulled out the two glasses and half-bottle of wine from beneath the chair. The boy gaped at him, then shut his mouth and looked at the wine. There was a brief flash of greed there, but thankfully no need. Good. That was one thing that Alberich had worried about. Trouble with drink started early among those who lived near Exile's Gate. Alberich had seen children as young as ten caught by the addiction of drink there. I didn't think we was allowed— Skiff began, though his nose twitched as Alberich uncorked it 
and he was young enough that his yearning showed a little more. He must be getting very weary of the spring water, fruit juice, ciders, teas, and milk that were all the trainees were ever offered. It is only half a bottle, and I intend to share it with you, Alberich replied, pouring the glasses full and handing him one. That is hardly enough for even an innocent to be drunk upon. I suspect you've had a deal stronger in your time already. The boy accepted the glass, and to his great credit took a mouthful and savored it, rather than draining the glass. So this is what all the fuss is about, he said, after he allowed the good vintage to slip down his throat. This is what the good stuff's like. It is, Alberich agreed. And now, I fear... It is spoiled you'll be for the goat piss that passes itself off as wine near Exile's Gate. To know how you drunk it, and that's for certain sure. I always did my drinking a little higher up the street, Skiff replied, putting his glass down and reaching for the nearest tidbit, a pasty stuffed with morels and duck breast. Of course, he didn't know that until he bit into it, and as it melted on his tongue, the boy's face was a study that very nearly made Alberich chuckle. He didn't, though. Children's dignity was a fragile thing, and this lad's rather more so than others. They've been passing these under my nose all night, and if I'd known how they tasted... Skiff shook his head. This is too much like reward weapons, Master. The plain fact is there were three men that sounded something like the one we want, and not one I'd be willing to finger. Reward is not exclusively earned by accomplishing a task. Alberich noted, pushing the platter toward the boy, but taking a pastry himself. He hadn't eaten any more than the boy had, though Selene had nibbled all evening, and he wanted something in his stomach to cushion the wine. Sometimes reward is earned just in the making of the attempt. Huh. Skiff chose a different dainty and washed it down with wine. Now what do we do? I will try and find another opportunity to put you where you can observe some of the ones I suspect, Alberich told him. If I do not, it is that you will go to hunt on your own, yes? Skiff shrugged, but Alberich read in the shrug that he had considered doing so, if he had not already made an attempt or two. I got cause, was all he said, and left it at that. Meanwhile, I hunt in a place you cannot, for no boy however disguised, would be permitted to the discourses of the great lords of state, Alberich continued. Skiff cocked his head to the side. Shut the pages out, do they? he asked shrewdly, and sighed. Not like I ain't busy. A most unchildlike child, Alberich reflected later, as he left the boy to finish his feast. But then most, if not all, of the children from that quarter were more or less unchildlike. They'd had their childhood robbed from them in various ways. Skiff's was by no means the most tragic. He'd had a loving mother, for however short a time he'd had her. He'd had a kind and caring guardian and mentor in the person of the thief trainer. That was more, much more, than many of his fellows had. And if Selene had even an inkling of the horrors in the twisted streets of her own capital, she would send out heralds and guard and all to scour the place clean there would be a grim forest of gallows springing up overnight. And her own people would speak her name with hate, and it would be all in vain, for half a candle mark after we'd gone, the scum would all be back again. This was the cost of welcoming any and all who sought shelter under Valdemar's banner. Sometimes what came in was not good. Not all, or even many, of the former Tedril mercenaries who had remained in Valdemar were of Basie's stamp. Alberich sought his quarters. He actually had quarters both with the other heralds and in the salle, but the latter was less convenient tonight. It was too late, or not late enough, for a visitor. His room was empty, and in a way he was relieved. It was not fit company tonight. There was too much of a mood on him. It was more of a relief to get himself out of the whites and into a sleeping robe, and then into bed. There had been a double reason for the wine this evening. It was not only to prove to the boy that Alberich considered him, in some things, to be an adult. It was to make certain that tonight, at least, he would not be slipping out to snoop and pry on his own. That Taltherian wine was strong stuff. 
Alberich might have made certain that the greater part of the bottle went inside him, but there was more than enough there to ensure that Skiff slept. For that matter, there was more than enough there to ensure that Alberich slept, he realized, as he went horizontal and found a moment of giddiness come over him. It came as something of a surprise, but one he was not going to have any choice but to accept. Then again, neither would Skiff, which thought was a safeguard of sorts. Skiff lay back against a bulwark of pillows propped up against the wall and headboard of his bed and stared out at the night sky beyond his open window. Not that he could see much, even with his lantern blown out. The lower half of the window was filled by a swath of cheesecloth stretched over a wooden frame that fit the open half of the window precisely. You couldn't slip a knife blade between the frame and the window frame. Trust a blue to be that fiddly. It worked, though. Not a sign of moth or midge or fly, and all the breeze he could want. He thought he might want to dye the cloth black, though, eventually, just to get that obtrusive white shape out of the way. The wine Alberich had brought had been a lovely thing, about as similar to the stuff Skiff had drunk in the better taverns as chalk was to cheese. He'd recognized the power with the first swallow, though, and he'd been disinclined to take chances with it. He'd stuffed his belly full of the fine foods Alberich had brought, which slowed the action of the wine considerably, which was good, because he wanted to think before he went to sleep. He put his hands behind his head and leaned into his rather luxurious support. Luxurious? Damn right it is. When the best my pillows have been till now was straw-filled bags. This place was pretty amazing when it came right down to it. Maybe for some people the uniforms were a bit of a come-down, but not even the worst of his was as mended and patched as the best of his old clothing. And for the first time in his life to have boots and shoes that actually fitted him. Didn't know your feet wasn't supposed to hurt like that before. His room had taken on the air of a place where someone lived, in no small part because of Skiff's little wagers. Mindful of the impression he was hoping to create, he always wagered for something he knew wouldn't put the person who was betting against him to any hardship. So in many cases, particularly early in the game, that wager had been a cushion against a small silver coin, which, of course, Skiff knew he wasn't going to lose. Skiff preferred sitting in his bed to study, unless he actually had to write something out, and any trainee could make as many cushions for himself as he cared to. Fabric and cleaned feathers by the bagful were at his disposal in the sewing room, as Skiff well knew. Palace and Collegia kitchens went through a lot of foul, most of which came into the complex still protesting. The palace seamstresses bespoke the goose down for feather beds, the swans down for trimming, and the tail feathers for hats. Wing feathers went off to the Fletchers and to be made into quill pens. That left the body feathers free for the claiming so there were always bags full of them for anyone who cared to take worn-out clothing and other scrap material to make a patchwork cushion or two. Skiff now had nearly twenty piled up behind him, and for those whose pockets ran to more than the stipend, some of the more top-lofty of the blues, he'd wagered against such things as a plush coverlet, a map to hang on his wall so he wouldn't need to be always running up to the library, and, oddly enough, books. The plush coverlet was folded up and waiting for winter to go on his bed. The map made a dark rectangle on one whitewashed wall, and the bookcase? The bookcase was no longer empty. He'd never disliked reading, but he'd also never had a lot of choice about what he read. It had never occurred to him that there might be other things to read than religious texts and dry histories. Then he discovered tales. Poetry books written to be read for pleasure. It wasn't the overwhelming addiction for him that it was with some of the trainees, who would have had their nose in a book every free moment if they could, but for him reading was as satisfying as a good meal in his opinion, and a book made a very, very useful thing to demand on a wager. It made him look a great deal more harmless in the eyes of those high-born blues. So now his bookshelves held two kinds of books his school books, and the growing collection of books he could open at any time to lose himself in some distant place or time. And the room now had personality that it hadn't shown before. 
But that was not what he wanted to think about. It was what had happened at that reception tonight. The whole thing had been good, in that it proved Weapons Master Alberich had every intention of using him. But it hadn't gotten them any results. And what could be done within the wall around the palace wasn't anything near enough, and he knew that Alberich knew that it wasn't enough. One end of the trail might be here, but the other was down near Exile's Gate. Here there was likely only one person, the man behind it all. There, well, there were a lot of people. There had to be, and plenty of them with loose tongues, if you could catch them right or get enough liquor into them. Now Alberich could go down there, fit in, and be talked to. He'd already proved that. But the question was not whether he'd be talked to. The question was, who would talk to him? Jass had spoken to him, sold him information. And now Jass was dead. Had anyone made that connection? Skiff didn't know, and it was certain sure that no one was going to tell Alberich if they had. Take it farther. If Alberich pressed too hard and in the wrong direction... Someone might decide he was too dangerous to let alone. Now, old Alberich wasn't very like to get himself in serious trouble, not with Cantor to come rescue him at need. But if a white horse came charging into Exile's Gate and carrying off a fellow who was hard-pressed in a fight, there weren't too many folks down there that couldn't put two and two together and come up with the right number. There was that, but there was more. The kinds of people that Alberich would talk to were the bully boys, other cell swords. If he was lucky, possibly the tavern keepers would talk to him. They wouldn't necessarily have the information he needed. There was, however, another set of people who might. The whores, the pawnbrokers, the people who bought and sold stolen goods. They all knew Skiff, and they knew things that the folks who practiced their trades in a more open fashion might not. Come to that, Skiff knew a few of the other thieves who might trade a word or two with him. You never knew what you were going to find yourself in possession of when you were a thief. It might could be that one of them would have run across something to put Skiff on the trail. Particularly intriguing was the thread of information that Alberich had let fall. How the trade in children stolen off the streets and the trade in slaves taken by bandits might be linked. It made a certain amount of sense that if you assumed that the slavers were all working together. Skiff hummed to himself tunelessly as he considered that. Who would know if anyone did? There were always rumors, but who would be able to give the scrap of foundation to the rumor? One by one, he ran down the list of his acquaintances, those who had always seemed to know where to start when you were looking for someone or something, most particularly those who had pointed him on the trail of Jazz and he dragged out all of the tag bits of information he'd been given that hadn't led him to Jass, but into other paths that had seemed at the time like dead ends. At the moment, he couldn't imagine anything more bizarre than that he, reclining at his ease in his own room of a wing attached to the palace itself, should be running down the lists of those who owed him favors, and those whose cooperation could be bought, in the most miserable quarter of Haven. Nevertheless, Albridge does it all the time, so I ain't the only one. None of the things he'd been told seemed to lead him to child-stealing, nor could he think of anyone he knew likely to really know anything other than just rumors. Reluctantly, he found himself thinking that if there was one black blot in the alleyways of Exile's Gate that might hide part of the answer, it was his own uncle, Launder. Launder Galco always skirted the fringe of the quasi-legal... Launder was not brave enough to dare the darkest deeds himself, but Skiff could tell even as a child that he yearned to. The older Launder got, the less he dared, but the more he yearned. Basie had hinted, more than once, that Launder would have sold Skiff in a heartbeat if Skiff hadn't already been registered on the city rolls. And even then, if he could have manufactured a believable story about Skiff running away— Skiff was not at all surprised now that half-witted Maisie had been illegally underage, perhaps not for the employment at the Hollybush, but certainly for the uses that his cousin Calchen had made of her. She hadn't looked underaged. What there was of her was woman-sized, but Launder had to have known. Skiff wouldn't be surprised now to learn that Launder himself had sampled Maisie's meager charms, 
before passing her on to his son. Launder had never given his sons anything he hadn't already used, Beale being the exception. But then the idea of Launder attempting the life of a priest was enough to make a cat laugh. And Launder didn't exactly have women lining up to keep him company. In the years since running off, Skiff had learned a lot about his uncle. And he'd learned that when it came to women, Launder had to pay for what he got. Since he'd already paid for Maisie, it followed that he'd probably seen no reason why he shouldn't have her first. Not that he'd shown any interest in anything too young to have breasts, but half-wits often matured early, and Launder probably wouldn't even think twice about her real age if he'd taken her. Launder had more than dubious friends, too, even by the standards of Exile's Gate. And after the raid on the Hollybush, well, he'd lost what few friends he had around there. Not only because of Maisie, but because he had laid all the blame on his own son, and left him to rot and eventually die in jail. Calchon had never recovered enough even to do the idiot's work of stone-picking, and Launder had done nothing to help him recover. Business was business, but blood was blood, and people didn't much care for a man who disclaimed responsibility for things that people knew he was responsible for because his unconscious son couldn't refute them. A good thing for Launder that his son never did wake to full sense and died within three moons. The case against Launder died with him, and Skiff could only wonder who Launder was friendly with now, given how many people that callousness had offended. Or had that just freed his uncle to edge a little nearer to those dark deeds he secretly admired? Given all of that, Launder probably didn't engage in child-snatching for his own puerile entertainment. But that didn't mean he didn't help it along, just because he got a thrill out of doing so. He probably had been frightened enough by his brush with the law not to do anything so dangerous for his own profit either. But it was increasingly likely, in Skiff's estimation, that he knew something about it. The Hollybush hadn't by any means been Launder's only property. He owned warehouses in places where there wasn't anyone around to notice odd things going on at night. So a very good place to start would be with his uncle. Skiff knew the ins and outs of Launder's house, for more than once he'd contemplated getting some of what he considered that he was owed out of his uncle. He'd eventually given up on the idea, for the fact was that anything Launder had of value was generally too big to be carried off easily. But because of that, Skiff knew the house, and he knew the twisty ways of Launder's mind almost as well as he knew the house. The best way to get information out of him would be to frighten it out. Launder was good at keeping his mouth shut, but not when he was startled, and not when he was genuinely frightened. So Skiff set himself to figuring out exactly how he could best terrify his uncle into telling Skiff everything he might know or guess about the child-stealing and the slavery ring. In his bed, in the dead of night, Skiff decided. Skiff was short, even for a boy his age, but a shadowy figure dressed in black, waking you up with a knife to your throat, was likely to seem a whole lot bigger than he actually was and a hoarse whisper didn't betray that he was too young for his voice to have broken yet. Alberich had brought the all-black night-walking suit when he'd collected Skiff's clothing. Skiff knew a way into Launder's house that not even Launder knew about. Good old Launder. Every window had a lock, every door had two, but he forgot completely about the trapdoor onto the roof. All Skiff had to do was get into the yard and shinny up the drain pipe from the gutters. Once on the roof, he was as good as inside. Right enough, if Launder knew anything, Skiff would have it out of him. But he needed a suitably convincing story for his black-clad terrorist to ask the questions he needed the answers to. I'll say I'm looking for my sister, he decided. That's a good story, and Launder will probably believe it. Now, getting from here to there. He'd be able to get out of his room easily enough. No one checked beds to see that people were in them around here. The trouble was, how was he to get out of, and more importantly, back inside, the palace walls? Me, of course, Simri replied in his head. He jumped, then smiled sheepishly. Nobody's going to stop a companion and her chosen. 
You don't mind? he asked hesitantly. After all, this wasn't precisely going to be a sanctioned excursion. Mind? he felt her scorn. You just try and do it without me. You wouldn't have a chance. Well, she was probably right. But what do I do with you while I'm sneaking around? he asked. She chuckled. I'll take care of that. Trust me, I can always insinuate myself into someone's nearby stable. But I'm not having you so far away that I can't come to your rescue if I have to. He was both touched and a trifle irritated. Did she think he couldn't take care of himself? He'd been taking care of himself for the past year and more. She hadn't been around then. Now she sounded contrite. Of course you can take care of yourself. I never doubted that. But your uncle might have guards. He laughed silently. Londa, old cheap Londa, not a chance. What he's got is dogs, but he's too cheap to get trained ones. So he just gets nasty ones and keeps them hungry to keep them mean. Which means... Simri knew. Bless her, she got it at once. They'll eat anything you throw in front of them. He grinned. And I'll know where to get plenty of poppy syrup. Put them right to sleep in a candle mark. Then I slip inside and give old uncle a surprise. Then what will you do? She asked soberly. When you leave, you aren't. I'm going to make him drink poppy himself, Skiff reassured her. No way I'm taking a chance on hitting him hard enough to make sure he stays knocked out. Besides, with that thick head of his, I'd probably break what I hit him with before I knocked him out. He felt her sigh gustily. Good. Then this will all work. And what then? Then? He closed his eyes, but couldn't yet see a direction for himself. It's early days to make any plans. I'll figure on what to do after I hear what old Londa has to say. And that would have to do for now. 18. Skiff looked down on the silent, darkened oblong that was his uncle's yard from the roof of his uncle's house. The roof-tree was not the most comfortable place he'd ever had to perch, but better to rest here than inside the house. Down there somewhere in the shadows were five lumps of sleeping canine that had been completely unable to resist juicy patties of chopped meat mixed with breadcrumbs soaked in poppy syrup. Poor miserable animals. Uncle Launder would probably be even harsher with them after their failure to stop him. This was the halfway point, and Skiff paused for a breather while he could take one. He'd gotten out of the collegium through his window, out of the complex openly on Simri's back, as if he was going out into the city for any perfectly ordinary reason. Well, perhaps not ordinary, since trainees as young as he was generally didn't go out to the city after dark. But he'd made sure to look serious, as if someone had sent for him, rather than overly cheerful, as if he expected to find himself in, say, the Virgin and Star's tavern that night. No one questioned him, and heraldic trainees, unlike the common-born blues or the bardic trainees, were not required to give a reason for leaving the complex at whatever hour, probably because it was generally assumed that their companions would not agree to anything that wasn't proper. Once in Haven, Simri found an unguarded stable near Uncle Launder's house, unguarded because it was completely empty and beginning to fall to pieces, symptom of a sudden change in someone's fortune. There he had changed into his black clothing, feeling distinctly odd as he did so. It seemed that the last time he'd worn this was a lifetime ago, not just a couple of moons. But where he was going, that uniform was a distinct handicap. He hadn't swathed his face and head, or blackened exposed flesh with charcoal just then. He'd still had to get the chopped meat, the bread and the poppy syrup, and not all in the same market square, just so no one would put him and the ingredients together if they were questioned later. That was why he'd left the collegium early. Markets stayed open late in the poorer parts of town, for the benefit of those whose own working hours were long. Skiff had no trouble in acquiring what he needed and he made his final preparations in that stable by the light of the moon overhead. Then, and only then, did he finish dressing, and with the treated meat stuffed into cleaned sausage bladders which he tied off and then put into a bag, he had slipped out alone into the darkness. <laughs>
The key to making sure that all five dogs got their doses was to send the bladders over the wall at long intervals. The first and strongest dog wolfed down his portion, then staggered about for a bit and fell asleep. When Skiff heard the staggering, he sent over the second bladder. By that time, the strongest dog was in no condition to contest the food, and the second strongest got it. It took a while, but Skiff was patient, and when he couldn't hear anything other than dog snores, he went over the wall and up the gutter to the roof. Now he sat on the roof tree with his back against one of the chimneys, using its bulk to conceal his silhouette, and took deep, slow breaths to calm himself. His gut was a tight knot, a good reason for not eating much tonight. And he was thirsty, but thirsty was better than being in the middle of a job and having to, well, this would be the first time he had ever entered a house with the intention of confronting someone. Normally that was the last thing he wanted to do, and it had him strung tighter than an ill-tuned harp. So he ran over what he needed to do in his mind until he thought he'd rehearsed it enough, and mind called Simri. I'm going in, he told her. You know what to do if you get in trouble, she replied, for they had already worked that out. Skiff would get outside, anywhere outside, and she would come for him. She swore she could even get into the yard if it was needful. How she was to get over that fence he had no notion, but that was her problem. Basie had taught him that once you put your confidence in a partner, you just trusted that he knew what he was doing, and went on with your part of the plan. Because once the plan was in motion, there was nothing you could do about what he was responsible for anyway, so there was no point in taking up some of the attention you should be paying to your part of the job by worrying about him. He slipped over the roof tree to the next chimney. The hatch into the crawl space was just on the other side of it. It wasn't locked. It hadn't been locked for the past five years that Skiff knew of. Even if it had been, it was one of those that had its hinges on the outside, and all he would have had to do would have been to knock the hinge pins out and he could have lifted it up from the hinge side. He left it open, just in case he had to make a quick exit and couldn't use the route out he'd planned. The space he slipped down into was more of a crawl space than an attic, too small to be practical to store anything. He crawled on his hands and knees, feeling his way along until he came to the hatch that led down into the hallway, separating all of the dozen garret rooms where Launder's servants slept, six on one side of the corridor and six on the other. Well, where the servants Launder had would have slept, if he'd had more than the three he kept. Like everything else Launder had, his servants were cheap because no one else would have them, and he worked them, screaming and cursing at them all the while, until they dropped. His man of all work was a drunkard, and so was his cook, and the overworked housemaid was another half-wit like Maisie. None of them was going to wake up short of Skiff falling on them, which obviously he didn't intend to do. Not that he was going to take any chances about it. He found the hatch, which had a cover meant to be pushed up and aside from the hallway below. He lifted it up and put it out of the way, then stuck his head down into the hall and took a quick look around. As he'd expected, it was deserted, not so dark as the crawl space, thanks to a tiny window on either end of the hall, and silent but for three sets of snoring. He actually had to stop and listen in fascination for a moment, for he'd never heard anything like it. There was a deep, basso rumbling, which was probably the handyman, whose pattern was a long, drawn-out sound, interrupted by three short, Snarks! Layered atop this was a second set, vaguely alto in pitch, of short, loud snorts in a rising tone that sounded like an entire stifle of pigs. And atop that was a soprano solo with snoring on the intake of breath and whistling on the exhalation. One was the housemaid and the other the cook, but which was which? The housemaid was younger, but fatter than the cook, so either could have had the soprano. All three were so loud that he could not imagine how they managed not to wake themselves up. It took everything he had to keep from laughing out loud, and he wished devoutly that he dared describe this to one of the bardic trainees. They'd have hysterics. At least now he knew for certain that the last thing he needed to worry about was making a noise up here. He grabbed the edge of the hatch and somersaulted over, slowly and deliberately, lowering himself down by the strength of his arms alone 
until his arms were extended full length. His feet still dangled above the floor, so he waited for the moment when the chorus of snores overlapped and let go, hoping the noise would cover the sound of his fall. He landed with flexed knees, caught his balance, bent over with his knuckles just touching the floor, and froze, waiting to see if there would be a reaction. Not a sound to indicate that anyone had heard him. Eh, not going to be odd figure in which rooms are empty. That had been a serious concern. He needed to find an empty room with a window, get into it, get the window unlocked and opened for his escape. Because now that he was inside, he knew that there was no way he was going to get out the way he came in. If there had been a ladder to let down from the crawl space, that would have been ideal. But there wasn't. By great good fortune, the room nearest the drain pipe he wanted to use was one of the empty ones. No thief could survive long who wasn't able to tell where he was inside a house in relation to the outside without ever being inside. Out of the breast of his tunic came one of his trusty bladders of oil, and he oiled the hinges to the dripping point by feel before he even tried to open the door. There was a faint creak, but it was entirely smothered in snores. The door opened onto a completely barren room, not a stick of furniture in it. Moonlight shone in through the dirty window, finally giving him something to see by. After the absolute dark of the crawl space and the relative dark of the hallway, it seemed as bright as day. Moving carefully with a care for creaking floorboards, he eased his way over to the window and out came the oil again. When catches, locks, and hinges were all thoroughly saturated, he got the window open wide, checked to make sure he could reach the drainage pipe from its sill, and left it that way. He did, however, close the door to the room most of the way, just in case one of the three snorers woke up and felt impelled to take a stroll. They were too dim-witted to think of an intruder, but they might take it into their heads to close the window, which would slow his retreat. The servant's stair lay at the end of the hallway, and it was just the narrow sort of arrangement that Skiff would have expected from the age of the house. In this part of the city, land was at a premium, so as little space as possible within a home was wasted on servants' amenities. But fortunately, whoever had built this stair had done so with an eye to silence in his servants, and had built it so sturdily that it probably wouldn't creak if a horse went down it. Not even Launder's neglect could undo work that solid, not in the few years that Launder had owned the house anyway. Down the stairs went Skiff and now he had to go on the memories of a very small child, augmented by as much study of the house from outside as he had been able to manage. Launder's bedroom, as he recalled, and as study of the house seemed to indicate, was on the next floor down, overlooking the street. A curious choice, given that street noise was going to be something of a disturbance, and would certainly be obtrusive early in the morning. But Launder wanted to see who was at his door before they were announced, and the other choice of master bedroom was over the kitchen and under the servants' rooms. Altogether a poor choice for someone who probably knew all about the snorer's chorus, and didn't want it resonating down into his bedroom. Nor would he want the aromas of the cook's latest accident permeating his bedroom and lingering in the hangings. He stifled another laugh as he felt his way down the stair tread by tread. He could only wonder what Launder had thought when he discovered the amazing snoring powers of all three of his servants. The stair should come out beside the room just over the kitchen that Launder used for his guests. Important guests, of course, not people like his sister and her young son. They'd lived in one of the garret rooms, though Skiff couldn't remember which one, since they hadn't lived there for long. When he reached the landing... Once again he stopped and listened. Aside from the now faint chorus from Snore Hall above, there was nothing. He took a precautionary sniff of the air, for a room that was occupied had a much different scent than one that had been shut up for a while. If Uncle had a guest that Skiff didn't know about, the guest became an unforeseen complication, a possible source of interference. But the scent that came to his nose was of a room that had lain unused for a very long time. A touch of mildew, a great deal of dust. And when he emerged from the stair, he found himself, as he had reckoned, in the dressing room to that unused guest suite. The dressing room led directly to the corridor, 
and probably the reason that the stair came out into it at all was the very sensible one of convenience for the original master and builder of the house, who probably would have chosen this suite for himself. Water for baths would have come straight up the stair from the kitchen in cans to be poured into the bath in the dressing room. If the master was hungry and rang for service, his snack would be brought up in moments freshly prepared. This corridor was short. It ran between the old master suite to two other sets of rooms. It extended the width of the house and had a window on either end, with the staircase leading downward for the family's use on Skiff's right. Three doors let out on it, besides the one that Skiff stood in. The one on Skiff's side led to a second bedroom separate from the master suite, probably intended for a superior personal maid or manservant. The two opposite were probably for guests or children in the original plan. One was now Launders, and heaven only knew what he did with the other. Skiff put his ear to the door nearest him on that side. It was definitely occupied, although the slumberer was no match for the trio upstairs. Just to be sure, Skiff eased down the corridor and checked the other. Silent, and as turning the door handle proved, locked as well. He returned to Launders' room took a steadying breath and took out another bladder of oil, because he did not want Launder to wake up until Skiff's knife was at his throat. Only when the hinges were saturated did Skiff ease the door open, wincing at the odor that rolled out. Well, the old man hasn't changed his bathing habits any. After the cleanliness of Basie's room, the priory, and the collegium, Skiff's nose wrinkled at the effluvia of unwashed clothing, unwashed sheets, unwashed body, rancid sweat, and bad breath. It wasn't bad enough to gag a goat, but it was close. If this wasn't so important, I'd leave now. It made his skin crawl to think of getting so close to that foul stench, but he didn't have much choice. Launder had his windows open to the night air, so at least he could see, and at least he wasn't going to smother in the stink. He took a deep breath, this time of cleaner air, and slipped inside. Launder didn't wake until the edge of the knife, the dull edge, did he but know it, was against his throat. Skiff had tried to time his entry, for when the moon was casting the most light on the streetward side of the house. In fact, moonlight streamed in through the windows, and Skiff could tell from the sheer terror on Launder's face that he was having no trouble seeing what there was to see of Skiff. Don't move, Skiff hissed, and don't shout. I won't, Launder whimpered. What do you want from me? Launder shivered with fear. Skiff had never seen anyone actually doing that, and to see Launder's fat jowls shaking like a jelly induced a profound disgust in him. You can start, hissed Skiff, by telling me what you did with my sister. Launder looked as if he was going to have a fit right there and then, and Skiff thought he might have hit gold. But it turned out that Launder had just gotten rough with one of his paid women, and he thought that Skiff was her brother. Not but that Skiff was averse to seeing him terrified over it, but that wasn't the street he wanted to hound his uncle down. So he quickly established that the apocryphal sister was one of the children snatched off the streets, and the interview continued on that basis. Skiff must have looked and sounded twice as intimidating as he thought, because Launder was reduced, in very short order, to a blubbering mound of terror and tears. Skiff would have been very glad to have the heraldic truth spell at his disposal, but he figured that fear was getting almost as much truth out of Launder as the spell would have. Unfortunately. There was very little to get. Launder knew some of what was going on, as Skiff had thought. He knew some of the men who were doing the actual snatches, what their method was for picking a victim, how they managed it without raising too much fuss, and where they went with the victims afterward, which, as Skiff had guessed, was one of Launder's own warehouses. But who the real powers behind the snatches were, he had no idea. His knowledge was all at street level. Even the warehouse had been hired by a go-between, which was disgusting enough. Launder whimpered and carried on, literally sweating buckets, trying to make out that the poor younglings grabbed by the gang were better off than they'd be on the street. Sheltered and fed, maybe, 
but better off. If they were incredibly lucky and not at all attractive, they'd find themselves working from dawn to dusk at some skinflint's farm, or knotting rugs, sewing shirts, making rope, or any one of a hundred tasks that needed hands but not much strength. If they were pretty, well, that was something Skiff didn't want to think about too hard. There had been a child brothel four streets over from the holly bush that had been shut down when he was still with Basie. There were things that even the denizens of Exile's Gate wouldn't put up with. But where there was one, there were probably more. The only reason why this one had been uncovered was because someone had been careless or someone had snitched. But by far and away, the single most important piece of information that Skiff got was that the man who was in charge of the entire ring always came to inspect the children when they were brought to the warehouse. It seemed he didn't trust the judgment of his underlings. If there was ever to be a time to catch him, that would be it. When Skiff had gotten everything he thought he could out of Launder, he took the knife away from the man's throat. Launder started to babble. An abrupt gesture with the knife shut him up again, and Skiff thrust a bottle made from a small gourd at him. Drink it, he ordered. Launder's eyes bulged. You wouldn't poison me. I'll get shot, Skiff snapped, exasperated. I'd be shamed to count you as a kill. Tis poppy, fool. I got no time to tie you up and gag you, even if I could stomach touching you. Now drink! Launder pulled the cork with his teeth and sucked down the contents of the bottle. Skiff made him open his mouth wide to be sure he actually had swallowed it and wasn't holding it. Then he sat back and waited, knowing that it was going to take longer for the drug to take effect on the man because of Launder's fear counteracting it. Meanwhile, his uncle just stared at him, occasionally venturing a timid question that Skiff did not deign to answer. If he really was someone out to discover the whereabouts of a young sister, he'd spent no more time on Launder than he had to, and tempting as it was to pay back everything he owed Launder in the way of misery, such torment would not have been in keeping with his assumed role. And it might give Launder a clue to his real identity. So he stayed quiet, focusing what he hoped was a menacing gaze on the man. Until at long, long last, Launder's eyelids drooped and dropped, his trembling stopped, all his muscles went slack, and the drug took him over. Only then did Skiff leave the room, taking the bottle with him. His exit via the garret room and the drain pipe was uneventful, as was his exchange of clothing in the stable and his escape from that part of town. It almost seemed as if there was a good spirit watching over him and smoothing his way. He said as much to Simri, once they were up in among the mansions of the great and powerful. I wish you'd gotten more information, then, she replied ruefully. I hate to think that much good luck was wasted on essentially trivial knowledge. Not as trivial as you might think, he replied thoughtfully, for a new plan was beginning to take shape in his mind. It was a plan that was fraught with risk, but it might be worth it and he was not going to carry out this one alone. "'Out late, aren't you, trainee?' said a voice at his stirrup, startling him. He looked down to discover that Simri had brought him to the little gate in the palace walls used by all the trainees on legitimate business, and the gate guard was looking up at him with a hint of suspicion. "'Tell him the truth, Loon,' Simri prompted, as he tried to think of something to say. He hadn't expected that Simri would try to take them in the same way they'd gone out. "'I had to see my uncle in Haven,' he said truthfully. "'He didn't think he was going to live. There was something I needed to hear from him.' "'Very good. He really didn't think you'd leave him alive, did he?' The guard's demeanour went from suspicious to sympathetic. "'I hope his fears weren't justified.' Skiff stopped himself from snorting. I think he was more scared than anything else, he replied. When I left, he was sleeping off a dose of poppy, and I bet he'll be fine in the morning. Lovely, absolute truth, all of it. Evidently the guard either had relatives who were overly convinced of their own mortality, or knew people who were, because he laughed. Oh, I, I understand, 
Well, I'm sorry you're going to have your sleep cut short. Breakfast bell is going to ring mighty early for you. Skiff groaned. Don't remind me, he said, as the guard waved him through without even taking his name. Good night to you. He unsaddled Simri and turned her loose, and slipped into his room again via the window, thus avoiding any potentially awkward questions in the hall. He'd had the wit to clean himself up thoroughly at that stable, so at least he needed to do nothing more than strip himself down and drop into bed, which he did, knowing all too well just how right that guard had been. Tomorrow, though, he had to arrange an interview with the weapons master. The sooner the better. All during his classes the next day, he had only half his mind on what was going on. The other half was engaged in putting together his plan, and, as importantly, his argument. Harold Alberich wasn't going to like this plan. It was going to be very dangerous for Skiff, and Skiff knew for certain that Alberich would object to that. During weapons class, Skiff managed to give Alberich an unspoken signal that he hoped would clue Alberich to the fact that he needed to talk privately. Either he was very quick on the uptake, or else Simri had some inkling of what was going on inside Skiff's head and had put the word into Alberich's cantor. In either case, just as class ended, Alberich looked straight at Skiff and said, You will be at my quarters here at the Sal, after the dinner hour. The others in the class completely misconstrued the order, as they were probably intended to. So, as they all left for their next class, they commiserated with him, assuming that something he had done or not done well enough was going to earn him a lecture. I know what it is. It's that you dragged yourself through practice. Whatever you were doing last night to keep you up, you shouldn't have been, Chris said forthrightly. You've got rings like a ferret under your eyes. If you thought he wasn't going to notice that, you're crazed. He'll probably give you a lecture about it is all, opined Korak. I suppose, Skiff said, and sighed heavily. In actuality, he really wasn't that tired, although he expected to be after dinner. That was probably when it would all catch up with him. Whatever it was, it can't have been worth one of Alberich's lectures, Chris said flatly. Skiff just yawned and hung his head, to feign sheepishness that he in no way felt. His next class was no class at all. It was a session in the sewing room where he couldn't stop yawning over his work. The other boys in his classes had twitted him about his self-chosen assignment on the chore roster until he pointed out that he was the only boy in a room full of girls. They'd gotten very quiet then, and thoughtful, and stopped teasing him. Today he was very glad that this was his chore, because the girls were far more sympathetic about his yawns and dark-circled eyes than the boys had been. Not that they let him off any, but they did keep him plied with cold tea to keep him awake, and they did make sure he got the best stool for the purpose, one that was comfortable, but not so comfortable that he was going to fall asleep. A quick wash in cold water while the rest of them were having hot baths woke him up very nicely, and he hurried through his dinner, now as much anxious as eager. Alberich wouldn't like the plan, but would he go along with it anyway? It was probably his duty to forbid Skiff even to think about carrying it out, even though it was the best and fastest way to get the man they were both after. Well, Alberich could forbid him, but that wouldn't stop him. He just wouldn't use that plan. He'd come up with something else. So as he walked quickly across the lawn, with the light of early evening pouring golden across the grass, he steeled himself to the notion that Alberich would not only not like the plan, but would put all the resources of the Collegium behind making sure Skiff didn't try it alone. Well, I won't. I don't know what I'll do, but I can't do that one alone, so there it is. He didn't need Simri warning him against it. The entire plan depended on having someone else, by necessity a herald or trainee, standing by. There was not one single trainee that Skiff would dare even bring down to Exile's Gate Quarter in the daytime, much less at night. So it would have to be a herald, and the only one likely to agree to this would be Alberich, which brought him right around to crux of the matter again. He entered the salle and went to the back of it, where one of the mirrors concealed the door to Alberich's other set of quarters. It was no secret that they were there, 
but it wasn't widely bruited about either. Maybe the concealed door was older than Alberich, who knew? Skiff could think of a lot of reasons why hidden rooms might come in handy. He tapped on the wall beside the mirror, and it swung open as Alberich pushed on the door from within. He stepped inside. Alberich closed the door behind him and brought him through a small room that served him as an office and contained only a desk and a chair. On the other side of the doorway to the left were the private quarters, a suite that began with a rather austere room that contained only two chairs, a ceramic-tiled wood stove, and a large bookcase. Alberich gestured to the nearest chair. The sole aspect of the room that wasn't austere was the huge window along one wall, made up of many small panes of colored glass leaded together, forming a pattern of blues and golds that looked something like a man's face, and something like a sun in glory. It looked as though it faced east, so it wasn't at its best, just glowing softly. Most of the room's illumination came from lanterns Alberich had already lit. Skiff made a note to himself to nip around to the back of the cell sometime after dark. With lanterns behind it, the window must be nearly as impressive as it would be from within the room in early morning. But Alberich didn't give Skiff a chance to contemplate the window, though, since his chair had him facing away from it. A pity. He'd have liked to just sit there and study it for a time. Someone had told him that the palace chapel had several windows like this, as did the major temples in Haven, but this was the first time he'd seen one close up. The weapons master barely waited for him to settle himself. So your little excursion into the city last night bore some fruit? was Alberich's question. Good. He's already gotten everything from Simri and Cantor, and maybe the guard, but the who and maybe the why. That was a bit less explanation he'd have to give. I visited my uncle, Londa Galco, Skiff said, then smiled. Though he didn't know t'was me. Went masked and in over roof. You know. I scared him pretty thorough. Good enough, I figure he told me the truth. As well Alberich should know, since he'd been the one who brought Skiff's things from his old room, and had probably examined every bit. Skiff experienced in that moment a very very odd sensation of comfort. It was a relief to be able to sit here and be able to be himself completely. It was like being with Simri, only a more worldly sort of Simri. That was wise. Alberich leaned forward, resting his elbows on his knees, and looked thoughtful. I would not have thought of Launder Galco as a source of information for our needs. I didn't either. Till I stopped looking for a man what needed a building burnt, and started thinking about what I picked up while I was looking for him, Skiff replied. And put that with what you told me about the slavers. There's some at snatching younglings off the streets. Not many, just the ones that have to sleep there. More of them than you thought, I bet. You don't hear about it, cause they ain't the kind that had be missed. We hear more than you might think, Alberich put in, but also nodded. Although if this is true, we are not hearing of most of them. Go on. Londa ain't the kind to get his fingers where they might get burnt, not after that mess with the holly bush. But if there's something dirty going on, he probably knows summit about it. He likes being on the edge of it. Not so close he gets hurt. Close enough he can kind of gloat over it. So I paid him a visit. Skiff launched into a full explanation frankly describing everything he had done last night, leaving nothing out. He hadn't, after all, done anything that he'd been forbidden. Nobody had put a curfew on the trainees. No one had told him not to leave the Collegium grounds. He hadn't stolen anything. All he'd done was to terrorize one filthy old man who'd been the cause of plenty of misery himself over the past several years. Still, Alberich didn't look disgusted, and he didn't look annoyed, but Skiff got a distinct impression that he was poised between being amused and being angry. You, he said at length, leaning back in his chair and pointing a finger at Skiff, are the sort who would find a way around any order. So I shall not give you one. This information interesting is useful, possibly. But if I was to go out all ragged and kip down on the street where I know they's been snatching, Skiff asked, while you kept a watch. 
It'd be more useful, I'm thinking. We got what we need for the makings of a nice little trap, and it's one you can't set without a youngling for bait. He stabbed a thumb at his chest. Me, you daren't use anyone else. Alberich's face went very, very still. If you did not mind speak with Simri, he said very, very slowly. But I do, and you got Cantor, so tween them we can mind speak each other, and I got some ideas that will keep me from getting coshed, cause I know how they've been working, Skiff replied, and sat back himself. You'll know when I get took, and you can follow. You'll know more when the man himself shows up. We can do more and figure out who he is. We can catch him. It is very dangerous. You could be hurt, Alberich pointed out immediately. You can attempt to protect yourself, but that does not mean you will succeed. Then I'll get hurt, Skiff dismissed, feeling his jaw tense and his own resolve harden. It'll be worth it. Alberich half closed his eyes and laced his fingers together occasionally looking up at Skiff as though testing his mettle. If this long wait was supposed to test his patience as well, it wasn't going to work that way, for the longer Alberich thought, the better Skiff reckoned his odds to be. And when at last Alberich spoke, he knew he'd been right. Very well, the weapons master said. Let me hear the whole of this plan of yours. I believe that you and I... Must do this thing. 19. Skiff widened his eyes pleadingly and held out his bowl to anyone who even glanced at him. He certainly looked the part of a beggar boy. He hadn't worn rags like these since he'd been living at the holly bush. It was a good thing that it was still very warm at night or he'd be freezing in the things. They were more whole than cloth, and he couldn't imagine where Alberich had found them. Couldn't imagine why anyone in the Collegium would have kept them. At least they were clean. His need for authenticity didn't run to dirt and lice, and fortunately neither did Alberich's. A little soot smeared across his forehead, chin, and cheekbones provided the illusion of dirt, and that was all that was required. This time the place where Skiff's transformation had taken place had been supplied by Alberich. Not that Skiff was surprised at the weapons master's resources. Alberich couldn't have walked out of the complex in his sellsword gear, after all. Alberich brought him to an inn, where a herald and a trainee could ride into the stable yard unremarked. No surprises there. The innkeeper greeted him by name, and they took Simri and Cantor to the stable, to special loose boxes without doors. Then came the surprise, in the form of a locked room at the back of the stable to which Alberich had the key, and which contained both a trunk of disguise material and a rear entrance onto an alley. A beggar boy slipped out that entrance into the shadows of dusk somewhat later, and after him a disreputable sellsword whose face would be moderately familiar in the exile's gate quarter. Another purpose for all that soot on Skiff's features was to disguise them. It wouldn't do for him to be recognized. Skiff made his way quietly to Exile's Gate itself. Then, as if he had come in the gate, he wandered the street in his old neighborhood, training his voice into a tremulous piping as he begged from the passers-by. Mostly he got kicks and curses, though once someone gave him an end of a loaf, and two others offered a rind of bacon and a rind of cheese. Beggars here got food more often than coin though there was little enough of the former. Skiff went a little cold when he thought about a child trying to live on such meager fare. He got a drink at a public pump and wandered about some more, as the streets grew darker, and torches and a few lanterns that were put up outside those businesses that were staying open past full dark. There were street lights, but they were very few, and often the oil was stolen, or even the entire lamp. He was ostensibly looking for a place to sleep on the street, out of the way of traffic. Actually, he knew exactly where he was going to go to sleep, but he had to make a show out of it, because the child snatchers were almost certainly watching him. He also kept hunched over, both to look more miserable and to look smaller. The younger the children were, the more timid they were, the better the snatchers liked them. And behind him, going from drink stall to tavern, was Alberich.
There was great comfort in knowing that. Cantor says Albrecht is very surprised at how good you are at this. A thief that gets noticed doesn't stay out of jail long, he replied, though he was secretly flattered. Now, if he'd really been trying to make his way as a beggar, he would never be doing it this way. He'd have bound up his leg to look as if he'd lost it, or done the same with an arm. No sores, though. People around here would stone him into some other quarter for fear of a pox. Then he'd stand as straight as he could and catcall the people passing by, a noisy banter that was impossible to ignore. He'd be cheeky but funny, and not insulting. People liked that. They liked seeing a display of bravado, especially in a cripple. He'd be making a better go of it than this thin, wistful waif he was impersonating. And the child snatchers would avoid him. A child like that would never tame down, and would cause nothing but trouble. In his persona of woeful beggar child, he had a single possession that was going to make this entire ruse work, a wooden begging bowl. Perfectly in character with what he was, no one would even remark on it. And it was going to keep him from being knocked unconscious, because it was much deeper than the usual bowl and fit his head exactly like a helmet. Once he curled himself up in his chosen spot for the night and pulled his ragged hood over his head, he'd slip that bowl over it under the rags. When the snatchers came along and gave him that tap on the head to keep him from waking up when they grabbed him, he'd be protected. He also had weapons on his person. His throwing daggers were concealed up his sleeves. Alberich hadn't needed to tell him to bring them. Having them made him feel a good deal safer although his first choice of weapon wouldn't have been one that you threw at the enemy, or it wouldn't have been if he wasn't so certain of his own accuracy. It was very unlikely that he'd be searched. These beggar children never had anything of value on them. If they once had, it was long snatched by those older and stronger than they were. As he trudged away from the streets, where people were still carrying on the minutiae of their lives and toward the warehouses and closed-up workshops— he felt eyes on him. The back of his neck prickled. The warehouse section of Exile's Gate was where most of the children had vanished from, and he knew now, with heavy certainty, that the Snatchers were somewhere out there watching him, waiting for him to settle. Alberich was out there, too, and had taken to the same covert skulking as Skiff's stalkers. He was hunting the hunters, watching the watchers, to make sure that if anything went wrong— Skiff wouldn't be facing it alone. "'Is seen two of them anyway,' reported Simri. "'He would never ever have attempted this by himself, "'or even with someone who didn't also have a companion. "'The key to this entire plan was that Cantor and Simri "'could mind-speak to each other, "'keeping Skiff and Alberich aware of everything that was going on. "'The buildings here were large, "'with long expanses of blank wall planted directly on the street.' You didn't want or need windows in a warehouse. There weren't a lot of places where a tired child could curl up to sleep. But where there was a doorway that was just big enough to fit a small body or a recessed gate, it was dark and it was quiet, and no one was likely to come along to chivy one off until dawn. Mind, any number of adult beggars knew this, too, so the first few places Skiff poked his nose into were occupied, and the occupants sent him off with poorly aimed blows and liberal curses. He lost his bacon rind to one of them, not that he fought for it. But when he did find a place, it was perfect for the child snatchers, and thus perfect for his purposes. It was a recessed doorway, a black arch in a darkened street with no one in sight in either direction. He sat down on the doorstep and pretended to eat his crust and cheese rind. Then, with a calculatedly pathetic sigh that should be audible to his stalkers, he curled up with his back to the street and his rags pulled up over his head. If that wasn't an invitation, he'd turn priest. As he stirred and fidgeted, trying to get comfortable, he slipped his wooden bowl over his head exactly as he had planned. Once he had, he felt a good deal safer and the back of his neck stopped prickling so much. There had been the possibility that the Snatchers, lured by how harmless he seemed to be and the loneliness of the street, would try for the grab before he curled up for the night. He was glad their caution had overcome their greed. Gradually he stopped moving around, as a child would who was settling into sleep, 
He wouldn't find a tolerable position on this stone doorstep anyway, not after he'd gotten accustomed not only to a bed, but to a comfortable bed. Spoilt, that's what I am. Once asleep, he held himself still as a matter of pride, although the stone under his hip was painfully hard and his arm was getting pins and needles. Eventually he had to shift off of that, but when he moved it was only the formless stirring that a child would make when deeply asleep. He should be asleep. The beggar child he was counterfeiting was in the midst of one of the better moments of its short life. It had a full belly, a quiet place to lie down. It was neither too cold nor too hot. No one was going to chase it away from this shelter until morning, and if rain came it wouldn't even get too wet. Never having known a soft bed, the stone of the doorway would be perfectly acceptable, since countless feet had worn the step down in a hollow in the middle, into which Skiff's body fit perfectly. Well, he hadn't had to sleep on the street, ever. That was partly because he was smart, but there was no telling how much he'd accomplished was because he'd been lucky. Mostly, he liked to think, it was because he'd been smart. Though if Basie hadn't taken him in, his life probably would have been a lot different. Harder, maybe. It depended on what he would have done after Beale warned him away from the holly bush. If he'd gone back to Beale, he'd have had to make a statement against his uncle. That could have gone badly for him. He'd known that even when he'd been that young. It was the reason he'd run off in the first place. Maybe he'd have been safe in Beale's temple. Maybe not. Finding out which could have been bad. If he'd run, though, I think maybe I'd have hidden in the storage room of O'Tholland's wash house. Then what? He didn't know. How long could he have gone on sleeping in hidden places, stealing food from kitchens in the guise of a page? Simri interrupted his speculations. Cantor says they've all gotten together. There are three of them, Simri reported, interrupting his thoughts. She sounded indignant. Three of them, for one little child. Skiff wasn't surprised. A pretty child, or one that was strong, was a valuable commodity. Having two to make the snatch and one to stand guard meant they could grab it with a minimum of damage to the merchandise. That's so one can be a lookout in case their target's gone inside a yard or something, Skiff told her. But I have to agree. Even two seems kind of much for someone my size. It's disgusting. He had to smile at the affronted quality in her words. Not that the whole thing isn't disgusting, but I understand, he told her. And he did. It was disgusting. He could think abstractly about a child as merchandise, but the minute he allowed himself to get outside of those abstractions, he was disgusted. Skiff, be ready. They're moving in. He heard them in the last few paces. If he'd really been asleep, particularly if he was an exhausted child with a full belly, it wouldn't have disturbed him but he heard their soft footfalls on the hard-packed dirt of the street. They were cautious, he gave them that, but waiting for them to finally make their move was enough to drive him mad. He had to grit his teeth and clench his muscles to stay put, when every instinct and most of his training screamed at him to get up and defend himself. Then they were on him, all three of them in a rush. He was enveloped in a smelly blanket— Instinct won over control, and he felt the mere beginnings of a reaction. But before he could even move, much less come up fighting, someone hit him a precise blow to the head. The bowl took most of it, as he'd anticipated, but his head and ears still rang with it. In fact, for just a moment he saw stars. He went limp, partly with intent, partly with the shock of the blow. And when he could move again, he regained control over himself and stayed properly limp. They didn't dally about. They bundled him up, cocoon-like, in the blanket. One of the snatchers threw the bundle over his shoulder with a grunt of effort, and they were off at a lope. Whoever had Skiff must have been a big man, because he carried Skiff as if he was nothing. Simri did not ask, are you all right, because she knew he was, and what she knew, Alberich knew. So there was no point in wasting time with silly questions when Alberich needed to concentrate on following Skiff's captors, and Skiff had immediate concerns of his own to deal with. Skiff concentrated on breathing carefully in that foully smothering blanket, staying limp, and keeping up the ruse that he was as completely unconscious as that blow to the head should have rendered him. This was the hardest part of the plan. 
to literally do nothing while his captor carried him off, and hoped that Alberich could keep up with them. They only had to get to their goal, which might or might not be Launder's warehouse. Alberich had to stay with them while remaining unseen. Not the easiest task in the world. Skiff had shattered enough people in his life to know how hard it really was. He'd have to get the bowl off his head, too, at some point in the near future, or they'd figure out he wasn't what he seemed and he wasn't unconscious. Definitely before he got unwrapped, or he'd be in a far more uncomfortable position than he was now. So as the man jogged along, Skiff worked his hands a little at a time up toward his head. The blanket smelled of so many things, all of them horrid, that he hated to think of what had happened in it and to it. It wasn't so much a blanket as a heavy tarpaulin of something less scratchy than wool. Was it sailcloth? It could be. He wasn't so tightly wrapped up in it that he couldn't move. He'd been sleeping with his arms up against his chest, so he shouldn't have too far to work them to get his hands on that bowl. He was glad he hadn't eaten much since his head and torso were dangling upside down along his captor's back. The stench of the blanket was appalling, and the man's shoulder essentially hit him in the gut with every step. If there was a better recipe for nausea, he didn't know it. He'd have been sick if he hadn't been cautious about not eating much beforehand. Bit by bit, he worked his arms higher, moving them only with the motion of the man who carried him, slowly working his hands up through the canvas towards the bowl. Then, at long last, with the tips of his fingers, he touched it. With a sigh of relief, he pushed with his fingertips and ducked his head at the same time as the man stumbled. The bowl came off his head and fell off into the folds of the blanket. He was rid of it, and now he could not relax, certainly, but wait, be still, try to ignore the reek of the blanket, and remember the next part of the plan. It looks as if your uncle's warehouse really is the goal, Simri said. He wished he could see. Hillfires! I wish I could breathe. But if Launder's warehouse was the goal, it couldn't be very much longer. Alberich was supposed to have scouted the place during the day, so he'd be familiar with the outside at least. Skiff just wished that the weapons master was as good at roof-walking as he was. If only they could have switched parts. Don't worry about your partner. If he says he can do something, and you've got no cause to think otherwise, then let him do his job and concentrate on yours. Well, that was easy to say, and hard to do when it all came down to cases. It seemed forever before the men stopped, and when they did, Skiff was gritting his teeth so hard he thought they might splinter with the tension. They knocked on the door, quite softly, in a pattern of three, two, and five. Got it, Simri said. Albrecht doesn't know if he's going to try going in that way, but if he does, that will make it easier. The door creaked open. Got another one, said a voice in a harsh whisper, with accents of surprise. That's third and tonight. Pickings is good, said the man to Skiff's right, as the one carrying him grunted. Got our eyes on two more primans, so let's get this and settled. Boss'll be right happy, said the doorkeeper, as the men moved forward and closed the door behind them. That's the idea, grunted the man with Skiff. They moved more slowly now, and to Skiff's dismay there was a fair amount of opening and closing of doors and direction changes down passages. This place must be a veritable warren. How was Alberich supposed to find him in all of this if he got inside? Let us worry about that, said Simri, right before there was the sound of another door opening, then the unmistakable feeling that his captor was descending a staircase. Descending a staircase? There's a cellar to this place. There isn't supposed to be a cellar here. Skiff was in something of a panic, because part of the emergency plan figured in the companions coming in as well as Alberich, and the companions were not going to be able to get down a narrow, steep set of stairs into a cellar. He had to remind himself that he was not alone. He was armed, and he was probably smarter than any of these people. No matter what happened here, sooner or later they would have to take him outside this building, and when they did he could escape. Even if he and Alberich couldn't actually catch the head of this gang of slavers right now, so long as Skiff could get a good look at him, they'd have him later. What's the worst that can happen? he asked himself, and set himself to imagining it.
Alberich wouldn't get in. He'd be held for a while, maybe with other children, maybe not. The master of this gang would inspect them. Skiff could make sure he saw enough he would be able to pick him out again. Then, well, the question was how attractive they found him. He had to stop himself from shuddering. Just by virtue of being healthy and in good shape, he was as pretty as most of the street urchins they'd been picking up, which meant there was one place where they'd send him. Now the panic became real. His throat closed with fear, and he had trouble breathing. Oh, no. Oh, no. In all his years on the street, he had never really had to face the possibility that he might end up a child whore. Now he did. For if he couldn't get away from these people, or if they found out what he was doing. His imagination painted far worse things than he had ever seen, cobbled up out of all the horrible stories he had ever heard, and his breath came in short and painful gasps. He went from stifling to icy cold. What if their, the brothel, was here in this building? They wouldn't have to take him outside. They wouldn't have to move him at all. He wouldn't get a chance to escape. They could keep him here as long as they wanted to. They could. They would. Strip him down first and find his knives. What would they do to him then? Drug him, maybe? Kill him? Oh, no, probably not that. Not while they could get some use out of him. Don't panic. Don't panic. How could he not panic? Chosen, we won't let that happen. We'll get to you no matter what. But how would they? How could they? It would take a small army to storm this place, and by then— The man carrying him got to the bottom of the stair and made a turning. This brat's awful quiet, he grunted to his fellow. You sure you didn't hit him too hard? No more than the rest of them, the other snapped. He's breathing, ain't he? I just don't want to have to turn over damaged goods. My lord don't care for damaged goods. The man hefted Skiff a little higher on his shoulder, surprising him into an involuntary groan, caused as much by desperation as by pain. There, you see, the second man said in triumph. Nothing wrong with him. He's waking up right on time. Let's get him locked up, then, said the one from the door. There was the sound of a key turning in a lock, a heavy door swinging open. Then, quite suddenly, Skiff found himself being dumped unceremoniously onto something soft. Well, soft-ish. Landing knocked the breath out of him, though he managed to keep from banging his head when he landed. He heard the door slam and the key turn in the lock again before he got his wits back. He struggled free of the stinking confines of the blanket, only to find himself in the pitch dark, and he was just as blind as he'd been in the blanket. He felt around heard rustling, and felt straw under his questing hands. The something soft he'd been dumped on was a pile of old straw, smelling of mildew and dust, but infinitely preferable to the stench of the blanket. He got untangled from the folds of that foul blanket, wadded it up, and with a convulsive movement flung it as far away from himself as possible. The wooden bowl that had saved his skull from being cracked clattered down out of the folds of it as it flew across the room which wasn't far after all. He heard it hit a wall immediately. His prison was a prison then, and a small one. He got onto his hands and knees and began feeling his way to the nearest wall. Rough brick met his hands, so cheap it was crumbling under his questing fingers, a symptom of the damp getting into it. He got to his feet and followed it until it intersected the next wall and the next and the next, and then came to the door. A few moments more of exploring by touch proved that this wasn't a room. It was a cell. It couldn't have been more than three arms' lengths wide and twice that in length. Not a very well-constructed cell, though. Rough brick made up the walls, and the floor was nothing more than pounded dirt with the straw atop it. And when Skiff got to the door, he finally felt some of his fear ebbing. The lock on this door had never been designed with the idea of confining a thief— he could probably have picked it in the pitch dark with a pry bar. The throwing daggers he wore were fine enough to work through the hole in the back plate and trip the mechanism. I can get out. That was all it took to calm him. These people never intended to have to hold more than a few frightened children down here. As long as they thought that was what he was, he'd be fine. 
If this was their child brothel, he could get out of it. Or you can jam the lock and keep them out until we get in, Simray pointed out, and he nearly laughed aloud at what a simple and elegant solution she had found for him. Yes, he could, he could. Then help could take as long as it needed to reach him. Even if they set fire to the warehouse to cover their tracks, he should be safe down here. He remembered once when one of the taverns had caught fire, how half a dozen of the patrons had hidden in the cellars and come out covered in soot but safe, and drunk out of their minds, for they'd been trapped by falling timbers and had decided they might as well help themselves to the stock. "'Will you be all right now?' Simri asked anxiously. "'Right and tight,' he told her. And he would be. He would. He had to be. Everything depended on him now. He would be. He heard the men enter and leave again twice more, and each time a door creaked open somewhere, and he heard the thump of some small load landing in straw. He winced each time for the sake of the poor, semi-conscious child that it represented. Between the first and the second, Simri told him that Alberich had gotten into the building— but could tell him nothing more than that. It was not long after that the men arrived with the second child, and soon after that when the sellers awoke. There was noise first, voices harsh and quarrelsome, then came heavy footsteps, and then light, so much light that it shone under Skiff's door and through all the cracks between the heavy planks that the door was made up of. Then the door was wrenched open, and a huge man stood silhouetted against the glare. Skiff didn't have to pretend to fear. He shrank back with a start, throwing up his arm to shield his eyes. The man took a pace toward him, and Skiff remembered his knives, remembered that he didn't dare let anyone grab him by the arm lest they be discovered. He scrambled backward until he reached the wall, then, with his back pressed into the brick, got to his feet, huddling his arms around his chest. The man grabbed him by the collar, his arms and hands not being easy to grab in that position and hauled him out into the corridor and down it toward an opening. The corridor wasn't very long, and there were evidently only six of the little brick cells in it, three on each side. It dead-ended to Skiff's rear in a wall of the same rough brick. The man dragged Skiff toward the open end, then threw him unceremoniously into the larger room beyond, a large and echoing chamber that was empty of furnishings, and lit by lanterns hung from hooks depending from the ceiling. Skiff landed beside three more children, all girls, all shivering and speechless with fear, tear-streaked faces, masks of terror. Facing them were five men, four heavily armed, standing in pairs on either side of the fifth. Was this the hoped-for mastermind behind all of this? "'Here's the last on em, my lord,' said the man who'd brought Skiff out. "'The first two you said weren't good for your gentlemen.' This a good enough offering? Skiff looked up from his fellow captives. For a moment he couldn't see the man's face, but he knew the voice right enough. Very nice, purred the man with just an edge of contempt beneath the approval. Prime stock, yes, they'll do. They'll do very nicely. It was the same voice that had spoken with Jass in the tomb in the cemetery, and when my lord came into the light Skiff stared at him not in recognition, but to make sure he knew the face later. If this man was one of those that had attended Lord Ortholan's reception, Skiff didn't recall him. But then he had a very ordinary face, what Basie would have called a face-shaped face with that laugh of his. Neither this nor that, neither round nor oblong nor square, nondescript in every way, brown hair, brown eyes. He could have been anyone. The man was wearing very expensive clothing in quite excellent taste. That was something of a surprise. Skiff would have expected excellent clothing in appalling taste, given the circumstances. My lord, well, the clothing was up to the standards of the highborn, but something about him didn't fit. Since being at the Collegium, Skiff had met a fair number of highborn, and there was an air about them, as if everyone they met would, as a matter of course, assume they were superior. So it was second nature to them, and they didn't have to think about it. This man wore his air of superiority and his pride openly, like a cloak. So what exactly was he? He had money, he had power, 
but he just didn't fit the merchant mold either. Yet he must have influence, and someone must be feeding him information, or he never would have been able to continue to operate as successfully and invisibly as he had until now. The man gestured, and one of the four men with him grabbed the shoulder of the girl he pointed at, hauling her to her feet. She couldn't have been more than eight or nine at most, thin and wan and frightened into paralysis. The man walked around her, surveying her from every angle. He took her chin in his hand, roughly tilting her face up, even prying open her mouth to look at her teeth as tears ran soundlessly down her smudged cheeks, leaving tracks in the dirt. He didn't order her to be stripped, but then, given that she wasn't wearing much more than a tattered feed sack with a string around it, he didn't really need to. Yes, the man said, after contemplating her for long moments, during which she shivered like an aspen in the wind. She was a very pretty little thing under all her dirt, and Skiff's heart ached for her. Hadn't her life been bad enough without this descent into nightmare? How could a tiny little child possibly deserve this? And this was the man who had ordered the deaths of Basie and the two boys, with no more concern than if he had crushed a beetle beneath his foot. This man, with his face-shaped face, this was the face of true evil that concealed itself in blandness. No monster here, just a man who could have hidden himself in any crowd. He would probably pat his friend's children genially on the head, even give them little treats, this man who assessed the market value of a little girl and consigned her to a fearful fate. He was valued by his neighbors, no doubt, this beast in a man's skin. Skiff hated him, hated the look of him, the sound of his voice, hated everything about him, hated most of all that he could smile and smile and look so like any other man. Yes, the man said again, with a bland smile, the same smile a housewife might use when finding a particularly fat goose. Pretty and pliant. This one will be very profitable for us. Oh, it is that I think not, good guildmaster, said a highly accented voice from the doorway. Skiff's heart leaped, and when Alberich himself walked through the door, sword and dagger at the ready, it was all he could do to keep from cheering aloud. Twenty. There was a moment of absolute silence, as even the guildmaster's professional bodyguards were taken by surprise. But that moment ended almost as soon as it began. The man who'd brought Skiff out bolted for the door behind the guildmaster, disappearing into the darkness. All four of the bodyguards charged Alberich, as the guildmaster himself stood back with a smirk that would have maddened Skiff if he hadn't been scrambling to get out of the way. He pushed the three little girls ahead of him into the partial shelter of the wall and stood between them and the fighting. Not that he was going to be able to do anything other than try and push them somewhere else if the fighting rolled over them. Not that he was going to be able to do anything to help Alberich. He knew when he was outweighed, outweaponed, and outclassed. This fight was no place for an undersized and half-trained, at best, adolescent. Besides, Alberich didn't look as if he needed any help, at least not at the moment. The weapons master had been impressive enough in the salle and on the training ground. Here, literally surrounded by four skilled fighters, Skiff could hardly believe what he was seeing. Alberich moved like a demon incarnate, and so quickly that half the time Skiff couldn't see what had happened, only that he'd somehow eluded what should have killed him. Still four to one? Maybe he'd better do something to try and drop the odds. Skiff slipped the catches on his knives, and then hesitated. The combatants were all moving too fast and in unpredictable ways. He'd never practiced against anything but a stationary target. If he threw a knife, he could all too easily hit Alberich, and if he threw a knife, he'd also throw away half of his own defenses. Skiff, get the children out now! Simri's mental shout woke him out of his indecision. With a quick glance to make sure the guildmaster, what guild was he, was too far away to interfere, Skiff grabbed the wrists of two of the three. The third was clinging to the arm of the second, and pulled them onto their feet. Then he got behind them, and slowly, trying not to attract the eye of their chiefest captor, he herded them in front of him along the wall, 
and toward the door that Alberich had entered by. One of the three, at least, woke out of her fear to see what he was trying to do. She seized the wrists of both of the others and dragged them with her as they edged along the wall. Her eyes were fixed on that doorway. Skiffs were on the fight. It was oddly silent compared with the tavern and street fights he was used to. There was no shouting, no cursing, only the clash of metal on metal and the occasional grunt of pain. And it was getting bloody. All of the bodyguards were marked. Not big wounds, but they were bleeding. It looked as if the four bodyguards should bring Alberich down at any moment, and yet he kept sliding out from beneath their blades as Skiff and his charges got closer and closer to their goal. Skiff wanted to run, and knew he didn't dare. He didn't dare distract Alberich, and he didn't dare grab the attention of the guildmaster. Ten paces. Five. There. The girl who was leading the other two paused, hesitating on the very threshold, her face a mask of fear and indecision. She didn't know what lay beyond that door. It could be worse than what was here. Run! Skiff hissed at her, trusting that Alberich had already cleared the way. The girl didn't hesitate a moment longer. She bolted into the half-lit hallway, hauling the other two with her. Skiff started to follow, hesitated, and looked back. There was a body on the floor, and it wasn't Alberich's. While Skiff's back was turned, the weapons master had temporarily reduced the odds against himself by one. But Alberich was bleeding from the shoulder now. Skiff couldn't tell how bad the wound was, and Alberich showed no sign of weakness, but the leather tunic was slashed there, and the bloody flesh showed beneath the dark leather whenever he moved that arm. Skiff's throat closed with fear. Somewhere... Deep inside, he'd been certain that Alberich was invulnerable. But he wasn't. He could be hurt. And if he could be hurt, he could die. At that moment, the guildmaster finally noticed that his prizes had escaped. Stop them! he shouted at his men. Don't let them get away! Skiff froze in the doorway, but he needn't have worried. No one was taking orders now. The fighters were too busy with Alberich to pay any attention to Skiff, although they redoubled their efforts to take the weapons master down. Skiff, run! Get out of there now! Simri cried. No! he said aloud. He couldn't go, not now. He might be able to do something. The lantern flames flickered, and shadows danced on the walls, a demonic echo of the death dance in the center of the room. It was confusing, too confusing. Once again Skiff felt for his knives and hesitated. Alberich was tiring. Oh, it didn't show in how he moved, but there was sweat rolling down his face. He had taken another cut, this time across his scalp, and blood mingled with the drops of sweat that spattered down onto the dirt floor with every movement. Skiff still didn't dare throw the knives, even with one of the opponents down. He edged away from the door and looked frantically for something else he could throw. Alberich's eyes glittered, and his mouth was set in a wild and terrible smile. He looked more than half mad, and Skiff couldn't imagine why his opponents weren't backing away just from his expression alone, much less the single-minded ferocity with which he was fighting. He did not look human, that much was certain. If this was how he always looked when he fought in earnest, no wonder people were afraid of him. No wonder he had never needed to draw a blade in those tavern brawls. Skiff's eye fell on a pile of dirty bowls stacked against the wall on the other side of the doorway, the remains perhaps of a meal the child snatchers had finished. It didn't matter. They were heavy enough to be weapons, and they were within reach. He snatched one up and waited for his opportunity. It came sooner than he'd hoped, as Alberich suddenly rushed one of the three men, making him stumble backward in a hasty retreat. That broke the swirling dance of steel for a moment, broke the pattern long enough for Skiff to fling the bowl at the man's head. It connected with the back of his skull with a sickening crack that made Skiff wince, not hard enough to knock him out, but enough to make him stagger, dazed. And that moment was just enough for Alberich to slash savagely at his neck, cutting halfway through it. The man twisted in agony, dropping to the floor, blood everywhere, as he writhed for a long and horrible moment, then stilled. Skiff froze, watching in fascination, aghast. 
Alberich did not, nor did the two men still fighting. They reacted by coming at Alberich from both directions at once, and in the rain of blows that followed, Alberich was wounded again, a glancing slash across the arm that peeled back leather and a little flesh. But he delivered a worse blow than he had gotten to the head of the third man, who dropped like a stone, at which point the first man who'd been felled stood up, shaking his head to clear it and plunged back into the fray. Skiff shook himself out of his trance and flung two more bowls, neither connected as well as the first. The first man remaining was hit in the shoulder and the second in the back, but the distraction was their undoing, for they lost the initiative and Alberich managed to get out of their trap, nor could they pin him between them again. The fight moved closer to the guildmaster. Alberich got the second man in the leg, leaving his dagger in the man's thigh, and the bodyguard staggered back. Skiff threw his last bowl, which hit the man nearest the guildmaster in the side of his face. Alberich saw his opening and took it, with an all-or-nothing lunge that carried him halfway across the room. Skiff let out a strangled cry of horror. If any fighter Skiff had ever seen before had tried that move, it would have ended differently. But this was Alberich, and he came in under the man's sword and inside his dagger, and the next thing Skiff knew— the point of Alberich's sword was sticking out of the man's back, and the man was gazing down at Alberich with an utterly stupefied expression on his face. Then he toppled over slowly. But he took Alberich's sword with him. And now the guildmaster struck. Because he had done nothing all this time, Skiff had virtually forgotten he was there, and had assumed that he was harmless. Perhaps Alberich had done the same. It was a mistaken assumption on both their parts. The guildmaster moved like a ferret, so fast that he seemed to blur, and too fast for Alberich, exhausted as he was, to react. The guildmaster didn't have a weapon. He didn't need one. Skiff didn't, couldn't see how it happened. One moment, Alberich was still extended in his lunge. The next, the guildmaster had him pinned somehow, trapped. The guildmaster's back was to the wall. His arm was across Alberich's throat, with Alberich's body protecting his. Both of Alberich's hands were free, and he clawed ineffectually at the arm across his throat. The weapons master's face was already turning an unhealthy shade of pale blue. Cash, the guildmaster said in a tight voice. Get the brat! But the last man was in no condition to grab anyone. Can't, he coughed. Legs out! Given the fact that his leg had been opened from thigh to knee, with Alberich's dagger still in the wound, he had a point. The guildmaster's gaze snapped back onto Skiff. Well, he said in that condescending voice he'd used with Jass, I wouldn't have expected the heralds to use bait. It's not like them to put a child in danger. Skiff bristled. Ain't a child, he said flatly. Oh? You're a little young to be a herald, the man countered in a sarcastic tone. Then he punched Alberich's shoulder wound with his free hand, making him gasp and putting a stop to Alberich's attempts to claw himself free. Stop that. You're only making things more difficult for yourself. What has age to do with being a herald? Alberich rasped. Skiff said nothing, and the man's eyes narrowed as his arm tightened a little more on Alberich's throat. Be still, or I will snap your foolish neck for you. A trainee, then. But still, that's quite out of character. Unless... He stared at Skiff, then, with a calculating expression, and Skiff sensed that he was thinking very hard. Very hard, indeed. It was, after all, no secret that the latest trainee was a thief. But what that would mean to this wealthy villain, and whether he'd heard that... Then the guildmaster's eyes widened. Well, he said, and his mouth quirked up at one corner. Who would have thought it? The heralds making common cause with a common thief. Oh, excuse me, you're quite an uncommon thief. Old Basie's boy, aren't you? Skiff, is it? Skiff went cold with shock and stared at the guildmaster, with his mouth dropping open. How do you know? How— the guildmaster smirked. I make it my business to know what goes on in my properties, as any good landlord would, he said pointedly. 
Besides, how do you think that cleverly hidden room got there? Who do you think arranged for the pump and the privy down there? But you killed him! Skiff cried, as Alberich tried to move and turned a little bluer for his trouble. I had no intention of doing so, the guild master pointed out in reasonable tones. That was Jass's fault. If he'd obeyed orders, everyone would have gotten out all right, even Basie. Since Skiff had heard the truth of that with his own ears, there was no debating the question of whether Jass had gone far beyond what his orders had been. But... How would Basie have gotten out in time even so? How? The boys couldn't have carried him. The guildmaster interrupted his thoughts. His expression had gone very bland again. He was planning something. You've been very clever, young man, he said in a voice unctuous with flattery. I don't see nearly enough cleverness in the people I hire. Well, Jass was a case in point. Now at the moment we seem to be at a stalemate. Alberich writhed in a futile attempt to get free. His captor laughed and punched the shoulder wound again, and Alberich went white. If I kill this Harold, he pointed out, I lose my shield against whatever you might pick up and fling at me. You can't go anywhere because cash is between you and the door. Stalemate. Skiff nodded warily. On the other hand, he continued, if you decided to switch allegiances... I could strangle this fool, and we could all escape from here before the help he is almost certainly arranged for arrives. Skiff clenched his jaw. In another time and place. And just what am I supposed to get out of this? He asked, playing for time to think. Simri was oddly silent in his mind. In fact, in fact, he couldn't sense her at all. For the first time in weeks he was alone in his head. What do you get? Oh, Skiff, Skiff, haven't you learned anything about the way life works? The guildmaster laughed. Allow me to enlighten you. No matter what these fools have told you, the only law that counts is the law of the street. What you'll get is to be trained by me in something far more profitable than the lift and lay. Oh, I? Skiff began heatedly. No, you listen to me. This is what is real. These are the rules that the real world runs by. He stared into Skiff's eyes, and Skiff couldn't look away, couldn't stop listening to that voice, so sure of itself, so very, very rational. Grab what you can, because if you don't, someone else will snatch it out from under you. Get all the dirt you can on anyone who might have power over you, and believe me, Everyone has a past, and things they'd rather not have bruited about. Be the cheater, not the cheated, because you'll be one or the other. There's no such thing as truth. Oh, believe me about this. There are shades of meaning and depths of self-interest, but there is no truth. Skiff made an inarticulate sound of protest, but it was weak, because this was all he'd seen at Exile's Gate. This was the way the world as he had always known it worked, not the way it was taught in the Collegium, not the way those sheltered, idealistic heralds explained things. And there is no faith either, the guildmaster continued, in his hard, bright voice. Faith is for those who wish to be deceived for the sake of a comforting but hollow promise. Think about it, boy. Think about it. It's shadow and air, all of it. Cakes in the havens and crumbs in the street. That is all that faith is about. The priests. Oh, the priests. How many of them actually helped anyone in Exile's Gate in the here and now? Behind their cloister walls and their gates, they never went hungry or cold. They never suffered the least privations. Even the brothers at the Priory never went hungry or cold. Skiff's heart contracted into an icy little knot. Alberich's eyes were closed. He seemed to be concentrating on getting what little air the guildmaster allowed him. Throw your lot in with me. I won't deceive you with pretty fictions. You'll obey me because I am strong and smart and powerful. You'll learn from me to be the same. And maybe someday you'll be good enough to take what I've got away from me. Until then, we'll have a deal. 
and it will be because we know where we stand with each other, not because of some artificial conceit that we like each other. He laughed. The smart man guards his own back, boy, the insidious voice went on. The wise man knows there is no one that you can trust. You take and hold whatever you can and share it with no one, because no one will ever share what he has with you. Hate is for the strong. Love is for the weak. No one has friends. Friend is just a pretty name for a leech or a user. What do you think Basie was? A user. He used you boys and lived off of your work, kept you as personal servants, and pretended to love you, so you would be as faithful to him as a pack of whipped puppies. And that was where the guildmaster went too far. Basie, thought Skiff, jarred free of the spell that insidiously logical voice had placed on him. Basie had shared whatever he had, and had trusted to his boys to do the same. Basie had taken him in, with no reason to, and every reason to turn him into the street, knowing that Launder would be looking for him to silence him. And Beale. Beale had protected him. Beale could have reported a hundred times over that Skiff had fulfilled his education, but he didn't. And when Beale could have told his own father where Skiff was, he'd kept his mouth shut. And the heralds. Oh, the heralds. Weak, were they? Foolish? Skiff felt warmth coming back into him, felt his heart uncurling, as he thought back along the past weeks, and all of the little kindnesses, all unasked for, that he'd gotten. Chris and Korak keeping the highborn blues from tormenting him until Skiff had established that he was more amusing if he wasn't taunted. Jerry helping him out with sword work. The teachers taking extra time to explain things he simply had never seen before. Housekeeper Gaitha being so patient with his rough speech that sometimes he couldn't believe she'd spend all this time over one trainee. The girls teasing and laughing with him in the sewing room. The simple way that he had been accepted by every trainee, and with no other recommendation but that he'd been chosen. Simri. Simri, who had filled his heart, who still was there, he sensed her again, now that he wasn't listening to the poison that bastard was pouring into his ears. Simri, who cared enough for him to wait while he listened, to make his own decisions, without any pressure from her. No love, was there? Self-delusion, was it? Then I'll be deluded. Did the guildmaster see his thoughts flicker across his face? Perhaps, cash now, he shouted. The wounded bodyguard lunged, arms outstretched, to grab him. But Skiff was already moving before the bodyguard, clumsy with his wounds and pain, had gotten a single step. He jumped aside, his hands flicking to each side as he evaded those outstretched arms. And between one breath and the next, the bodyguard continued his lunge and sprawled face down on the floor, gurgling in agony, one of Skiff's knives in his throat. The guildmaster made a strangled noise and so did Alberich. The arm around Alberich's throat tightened as the guildmaster slid down the wall. Skiff's other knife was lodged to the hilt in his eye. But Skiff's dodge had been deliberately aimed to take him to Alberich's side. The guildmaster had been a stationary target, and at that range he couldn't miss. In the next heartbeat he had pried the dead arm away from the weapons master's throat, and Alberich was gasping in great, huge gulps of air, his color returning to normal. Skiff helped him to his feet. You all right? he asked awkwardly. Alberich nodded. Talk may be hard, he rasped. Skiff laughed giddily, feeling as if he had drunk two whole bottles of that fabulous wine all by himself. Like that's going to make the trainees unhappy, he taunted. You not being able to lecture them. The wry expression on Alberich's face only made him laugh harder. Come on, he said, draping his teacher's arm over his shoulders. We better get you outside and back to where the good healers are, before your cantor decides he's going to put horseshoe marks on my bum. They got as far as the door when Skiff thought of something else. I don't suppose you did arrange for help, did you? Well, Alberich admitted in a croak, it comes now. Simri? Half the collegium, my love. 
Skiff just shook his head. Figures. Us Heralds, we just keep thinking we got to do everything by ourselves, don't we? We can't do the smart thing and get help fixed up beforehand. Even you. And you should know better. Yes, Alberich agreed. I should. We do. We. It was a lovely word. One that Skiff was coming to enjoy a very great deal. A herald he didn't recognize brought Skiff his knives, meticulously cleaned, as the healer fussed over Alberich right there in the street, which was so full of torches and lanterns it might have been a festival. Well, a very grim sort of festival. It actually looked more like something out of a fever dream, the street full of heralds and guards, more guardsmen swarming in and out of the warehouse, a half-dozen heralds and their companions surrounding Alberich, who flatly refused to lie down on a stretcher as the healer wanted, while the weapons master sat on an upturned barrel and the healer stitched up his wounds. Four bodies were laid out on the street under sheets, one semi-conscious bully boy had been taken off for questioning as soon as he recovered. Not that anyone expected to get much out of him. It wasn't very likely that a mere bodyguard would know the details of his master's operations. No one had sent Skiff back to the Collegium, and he waited beside Alberich, between Cantor and Simri, listening with all his might to the grim-voiced conversations around him. Most of the heralds here he didn't know. That was all right. He didn't have to know who they were to understand that they were important. He did recognize Talamir, though, who seemed considerably less otherworldly at the moment and quite entirely focused on the here and now. This is going to have an interesting effect on the council, he observed, his voice heavy with irony. Alberich snorted. Interesting? Boil up like a nest of ants, when stirred with sticks it will. Sunlord! Guildmaster Vatayan. Suspect him even I did not. Garthazer is going to have a fit of apoplexy, someone else observed. Vatayan was here at his behest in the first place. Hadn't they noticed he was here? This was high political stuff he was listening to. They know, Simri told him. But you're a Harold, even if you aren't in whites yet. You proved yourself tonight. No one is ever going to withhold anything from you that you really want or need to know. Well, interesting. Garthazer will be a pool of stillness compared to Lady Cathal, Talamir observed with a sigh. He was a guildmaster, after all, and she speaks for the guilds. Oh, guildmaster indeed, someone else said dismissively. Becoming a master in the trader's guild. He left the sentence dangling, but everyone, including Skiff, knew that the requirements for mastery in the Trader's Guild mostly depended on entirely how much profit you could make. Provided, of course, that you didn't cheat to make it, or at least that you didn't get caught cheating. He was, Talamir pointed out delicately, and with a deliberate pause between the words, quite prosperous. And now... Know we where the prophets came from, Alberich said harshly. It is thinking I am that Lady Cathal should be looking into prophets and whence from they come. And Lord Garthazer, said Talamir. Since Garthazer wished so sincerely to recommend him to the council. There is that, observed someone else, in a hard, cold voice. And now we know where the leak of guard movements along Evendim came from. It would appear so, Talamir replied thoughtfully. Although it is in my mind that Lord Orthalan was equally, though less blatantly, impressed with the late Guildmaster's talents. But a flurry of protests broke out over that remark. It seemed that the idea of Lord Orthalan having anything to do with all of this was completely out of the question. Except that Skiff saw Talamir and Alberich exchange a private look and perhaps more than that. Looks weren't all that could be exchanged when one was a herald, and far more privately. I wonder what all that's about. And Lord Orthalan had particularly recommended Jass to Vatayan. Well, if he wanted to know... No, he didn't, not at all. He knew quite enough already, 
All of this was going right over his head, and anyway, there wasn't anything one undersized thief could do about it, even if he did know. Or, if there was something one undersized thief could do about it, he had no doubt that Alberich would have a few words with him on the subject, and maybe a job. So, perhaps his roof-walking days weren't over after all. Better get myself another sneaky suit. I believe that Alberich already has that in mind, said Simri. The little group continued to paw over the few facts they had until they were shopworn, and even Talamir, whose patience seemed endless, grew weary of it. Enough, he said, silencing them all. There is nothing more we can do until we know more. The boy and Alberich have told us all they know. Harold Rivial and our picked guardsmen investigators are on their way to Vitaean's home even now, and if there is anything to be found there, rest assured they will find it. Every known associate of Vitaean will be under observation before sunrise, long before word of his death leaks out. Uncle Londa, Skiff interrupted wearily. Now that the excitement was wearing off, he was beginning to feel every bruise, and was just a little sick. And the man Launder Galco will also be observed, Talamir continued smoothly, because he clearly knew a great deal about the child stealing, although he is not connected with Vitaean in any way. Now he looked at Skiff, and put a hand on Skiff's shoulder that felt not at all patronizing. Comradely, yes. Patronizing, no. Trainee Skiff is weary to dropping. Harold Alberich is in pain. And we are fresh and have constructive work ahead of us. I suggest we send them back to their beds while we get about it, brothers. There was a murmured chorus of assent as the healer put the last of the stitches into Alberich's scalp wound, and the heralds magically melted away, leaving Skiff and Alberich alone in a calm center in the midst of the bustle. You won't travel in a stretcher as you should the healer said wearily, as if he had made and lost this same argument far too many times to bother again. So the best I can do is order you to back to the collegium and rest. Teach from a stool, I will. Tomorrow at least, Alberich told him. The healer sighed and packed up his satchel. I suppose that's the most I can get out of you, he said, and looked at Cantor. Do what you can with him, won't you? The companion tossed his head in an emphatic nod, and Skiff added, Jerry and Harold Ilsa can run the sword work for a week, and Korok and Chris can do archery. Cantor nodded even more emphatically. Alberich glared at him sourly, made as if to shrug, thought better of it, and sighed. A conspiracy it is, he grumbled. Damn right, Skiff said boldly. And when Alberich got to his feet and made as if to mount, Cantor stamped his foot and laid himself down so that Alberich could get into the saddle without mounting. When his herald was in place, Cantor rose and shook his head vigorously. You make me an old woman, Alberich complained, as Skiff got stiffly into Simri's saddle, and the two of them headed up the street away from the scene of the activity, riding side by side. No, Skiff denied, very much enjoying having the fearsome weapons master at a temporary disadvantage. Just making you be sensible. You see, he continued, waxing eloquent, there's a difference between a Harold and a thief. You don't have to make a thief be sensible. All thieves are sensible. A thief that won't be sensible. A thief in jail is, yes, please spare me, Alberich growled. But it didn't sound like his heart was in it, and a moment later he glanced over at Skiff. That was one of your mentor, Daisy. That was one of the things he told you, yes? Skiff nodded. And now, revenge you have had. True. Jas was dead. Vatayan was dead. The two men responsible for Basie's horrible death were themselves dead. Skiff's initial bargain with himself, and with the heralds, to work with Alberich because they had a common cause was over. Regrets? Alberich prompted. Skiff shook his head then changed his mind. Sort of. There weren't no justice. But it was your own hand that struck Vitaean down, Alberich said, as if he were surprised. It was Skiff's turn to bestow a sour look. 
Now don't you go trying that sly word twisting on me, he said. I know what you're trying to do, and don't pretend you ain't. No, there weren't no justice. The bastard is dead, dead quick and easy. He didn't have to answer for nothing, and we ain't never going to find out a half of what he was into. I got revenge, and I don't like it. Revenge don't get you nothing. There, you're happy now. But Alberich surprised him. No, little brother, he said gently. I am not happy, because my brother is unhappy. And there it was. The sour taste in Skiff's mouth faded, and although the vengeance he thought he had wanted turned out to be nothing like what he really would have wanted if he'd had the choice, well, I am not happy because my brother is unhappy. That, that was worth everything he'd gone through to get here. Oh, I'll get over it, he sighed. Hey, I'll get to boss you around for a week, eh, Cantor? That's worth something. Once again, Cantor nodded his head with vigor, and Alberich groaned feelingly. This, he complained, but with a suspicious twinkle in his eye, is putting the hen house in the fox's charge. Rrrr, Skiff growled, showing his teeth. Promise, won't have too much chicken. And I suppose you will insist on going into whites, now that a hero you are, Albridge continued, looking pained. Ha, you are out of your head. The healer was right, Skiff countered. What, me run afore I can walk? Not likely. Sides, he continued, contemplating all the potential fun he could have over the next four years in the Collegium. I ain't fleeced a quarter of them high-born blues yet, nor got all I can out of them artificer blues. Alberich regarded him with a jaundiced eye. I foresee, and foresight is my gift, a great deal of trouble with you at its center, and that no trainee in the history of Valdemar will have more demerits against his name before you go into whites. Suits me, Skiff replied saucily. So long as I have fun doing it. Fun for you, yes, Alberich sighed. Fun for the rest of us, however, extracting you from the tangles you make. It'll be worth it, Skiff insisted, once again feeling that giddy elation bubbling up inside him as he felt the warmth of acceptance encircle him and hold him at its heart. And in spite of present pain and future concerns, Harold Alberich gave him a real unalloyed smile. Oh, there is no doubt it will be worth it, he said and Skiff had the sense that he meant more than just the subject of Skiff's future mischief. He meant Skiff's very existence as one of the trainees now and heralds to come, no matter who objected, or how strenuously, to the presence of a thief among them. He confirmed that with his next breath. Welcome, very welcome, to the Collegium Skiff. It seems we were always right to take a thief. This concludes Take a Thief by Mercedes Lackey. Narrated by Paul Woodson, a member of SAG-AFTRA. Copyright 2001 by Mercedes R. Lackey. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Mercedes Lackey, care of Scoville Galen Gauche Literary Agency, Incorporated, and was produced in the year 2019 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.